Gwyn Saga. Guiden Tiu. Stone of Iris. Be not thou, O thou who art a human being, molesting life. It is not the place to be touched with human flesh. Be thou, O mankind, not in vain to fear death. For this is the inescapable condition of all men. From The Book of Dole Rituals, Volume 1. Stone of Iris. Prologue. Marius was dying. He had only drunk water for four whole days now. There were crowds of merchants, messengers, and footmen, who passed by his prostrate figure on the red road. But they did not look at him, who lay prostrate with the black cloak of the Miroku religion over his head. Here, in contrast to the warm-hearted north, the middle plain is already far south, and the people are faithful to Roma's teaching that they should provide their own water for their horses. On account of his countenance, a lady who was too kind to him, or a fat merchant who had no eye for beautiful young men, might have helped him up and carried him into the carriage. It was not always out of the kindness of their hearts that they did so, but they saw him as nothing more than a black, tattered wreck, wrapped in a Miroka cloak. The cloak, which had been given to him by a passing Miroku monk who had been the only one who had tried to be really kind to him, was already white with the dust of the horses and camel's hooves that were passing along the road. The sky was bright and the scenery was beautiful. Although this area was not the purest in the central plains, it was undoubtedly the most beautiful of the three Gorgas, with the city of beauty, Thais, in sight. The air was thick and dense, caressing the red streets. The sun was glistening, the fruit ripening beneath it was irresistibly sweet, and the flowers and the women were gloriously seductive. O oh, Thais, city of beauty, such were the words that went round and round in Marius's fuzzy head. O oh, queen of beauty, crowned with vileness and cruelty, fierce, loud, and slender-waisted Aina, who sucked the last drop of honey from my purse. Marius stretched out his feeble hand and tried to take the last sip from his canteen but it was long gone. Well, whatever. Marius murmured, wriggling his chapped lips and swollen tongue. Both penitence and prayer have nothing to do with the dying poor poet. The water of his last days will soon be drinkable when he crosses the river of Orsini. Orsini, river of gloom, guarded by the skeletal boatman Karen. The inarticulate murmurings were replaced by a faint, broken song. Even in the midst of his great distress and his fading consciousness, Marius tried to find the name of the woman who rhymed with Orsini, and he wriggled his fingers, trying to think of a suitable chord for the verse. Of course, his fingers only scratched the earth. For the kithereth, too, had been taken away by the ambiguity of the ties. The gentle darkness now reaches out its hands and spreads out its long black hair in order to kiss Marius. Who are you? Who has the temerity to stand in the way of the Alina's embrace? Marius was about to say this when he felt a sudden surge of excitement. Let it go. I'm in love with Alina, the daughter of death. In reality, however, he only thought he had said it, and no longer had the slightest voice. Hey! A thick, low, barking voice rang around Marius, like the call of the legendary Gib, who had summoned Lucius as he entered the world of the dead. Hey, what's wrong? Are you sick? Or is it one of Miroka's labors you don't want to be disturbed by? I'd like to ask you some questions. Please wake up. What I can teach you is. Marius tried to sing a jolly song. All I can tell you is your wife's room. And the lovely Lila is mine. Is he crazy? With a gulp Marius was lifted up, and his cloak slipped off. But the sun had already set when his closed eyelids were not flooded with any bright light. Hey! Come on. His voice was thick, and a strong, fiery drink was poured into his chapped lips. Oh. Marius groaned and opened his eyes. Then Marius began to laugh aloud in the deepening twilight. It was not a man, but a huge leopard, with the body and voice of a man, who was holding him up and giving him a drink. A round head of yellow with black spots, ears clinging to the head, and glittering yellowish binoculars lay over Marius in the depths of the indigo darkness. Selinos, what is the matter with you? Marius said, laughing all the while. Why do you think you're coming for me? I'm not going with you to the Temple of Lore, the god of war. I'm going to be embraced by Aino, 
and I'm going to be at the feet of Iris and Thoth. I'm not going to the Temple of Le, the god of war. I'm a miserable poet. As soon as he had said this, he thought he had bravely brushed Silino's hand away. In reality, however, his hands did not even move, and his lips only trembled faintly. He smiled wobbly, and threw back his head. This time the gentle and merciful darkness took him gently in its arms. It smells good. The smell of roasting meat is indescribably intoxicating. Hey! Marius screamed. At first his voice was muffled, but soon it became proper. I also. The clawing hunger in my stomach was awakened again by the sweet smell of the food. Give me some of that. This was a fright. A strange, muffled, but calm and laughing voice said. You've just returned from the banks of the Orsonies, and now you're asking for food. He may look shy, but he's a great man. Whatever. Marius struggled to sit up on his hands. He could see the cheerful flickering of the fire, an almost familiar orange color. Marius was relieved to see that he was not blind. Give it to me, too. I'll die if you don't. Earlier, you were saying, leave me alone and let me die. The man sitting across the fire said in a teasing tone. From the low position in which Marius was lying, we could only see his exceptionally long, muscular legs in their laced-up sandals, and his stout knees protected by knee pads. He is probably sitting on the ground, cloaked, waiting for the meat to be cooked. Then it must have been Alina, the daughter of death, who said that to me, not myself. Marius was not daunted. The good smell was beginning to penetrate his skinny body and to bring him back to life. The man laughed in a barking voice. You talk too much. Well, I'll invite you to dinner, and you can come here and drink as much as you like. It has to come, Marius said, and immediately jumped up and sat down by the fire. But that was all he thought. In fact, his weakened body was only struggling and shaking to get up. The man laughed out loud again. Well, you finally know what you're in for, young man. Then, laughing, his long, strong legs rose up, and, turning round the fire, he came to Marius' side. Then, kneeling down beside him, a strong arm, as strong as a spring, threw a hand round his side and lifted him up with the ease of a kitten. You're a very caring man. A cup made of shells was placed at his mouth. Marius drank like a man. The strong, sweet honey wine burned his throat and sank into his weakened bowels. It's not good for you to eat too much meat. I've cooked up some ground rice porridge for you, so have a little of that and be patient. His savior said. Something like a short, scary hair tickled Marius' neck. Thanks to the wine, Marius regained a little of his energy, not to talk nonsense, but to be a real man. He twisted his neck to look at the kind traveler, and breathed in sharply. Surinos. I groan. There, supporting him and filling his mouth, was the big, strong man with the huge leopard's head that he had thought he had seen in a dream just before he fainted. There was nothing unusual about the man, except that from the neck up he was a leopard. A common leather traveling cloak, dusty sandals and a long sword strapped to his waist. He is dressed as a traveling mercenary or a warrior, but even as a mercenary, his well-developed, reddish-bronze, full-bodied body attracts the eye, as one would expect a man with such muscles to do in a fight. But from the neck up, I thought it was just a dream, you know, Maria said in a disgusted voice. I remember until you picked me up. That's why I said I don't want a welcome from Silenos, I only want a no. Marius rolled his eyes and gazed at this half-beast, half-man monster with utter admiration. That's a beautiful coat. With childish glee he said, and stretched out his hand and patted the round, smooth head of the leopard. This was a fright. In fact, he said, as if he were surprised. You don't ask me why I look like this or whether this leopard's head is real and someone has put a curse on me, or whether this is just a drunken mask. It doesn't matter, you know. Marius laughed. I don't know why, but that's what you are, just like I am. Then it's the right thing to do. And I like you, Selinus. I like beautiful things, and you are as beautiful as the statues in the Crystal Palace. Crystal Palace. There was a faint, piercing crack in the other's voice. Do you know Crystal Palace? 
No, they showed me the inside once, when they opened it up to the town for a celebration. In a panic, Marius refrained from saying anything. I'm only a poor poet, but I have a love of the beautiful. I'm Marius the minstrel, and I'll sing to you if you like, even though my kithra was taken away from me when I lost a game at the false inn in tithe. I am. I know. It's probably Serenos. I hate to break it to you, but I'm not a myth. The leopard-headed warrior's topaz eyes narrowed and he laughed. I'm a flesh and blood windigo. My name is Gwyn. Gwyn. Marius repeated. We're friends then, aren't we, Gwyn? Apparently, yes. Gwyn smiled and agreed, and set about the task of feeding the slender, slender traveling poet a bowl of porridge of ground barley. I've always heard that poets are a bit different from ordinary people. He put his big hand on Marius's shaking hand and put a spoon in his mouth, saying admiringly. I must have never met a poet before today, because I never thought so before. You may be the first poet I've ever met, Marius. You'll have to wait until you've heard me sing to decide that. I, too, however, have never met Silenos before, Marius said as he puffed on his hot porridge. Soon after, Marius, who had regained much of his strength from the milk-boiled ground barley and a little honey wine, wrapped himself in a blanket and sat near the fire, watching Gwyn eat the roasted meat with a peaceful mind. The fire crackled and lit up half of Gwyn, who was sitting on a blanket with his long shins open. Gwyn's round head, scary beard, round ears clinging to his head, eyes like topaz, huge fangs that moved with a squirming motion, and all the rest of his features were reflected in the orange flames, creating an indescribably fantastic and dreamlike scene. Oh. Without thinking, Marius let out a deep sigh. What a lucky man I am. Even the legendary Ophiuchus, king of the poets, could not have dreamed that I could live to see such a scene. I feel as if I've entered a living myth. Why don't I have a kithra? I never wanted to sing an impromptu poem so much as now. You. He licked his greasy fingers and gulped down the honey wine. Don't you think I'm afraid of you? Scared? Are you? Why? Deeply surprised, Marius asked back. When they see me, they scream and run and cut the Janus sign. Some of them throw stones at me. That's why I sleep during the day and only travel the red road at night, when it's taboo, with a big hood over my head. Throwing stones at you. They should be cursed by the doll. I've never seen such a marvelous, beautiful, fantastic creature as you. My dream is to see a unicorn. And I believe now that one day I will. Not now that I've met you. In response to Marius's passionate words, Gwyn gave a little shrug of her strong shoulders and said nothing. Perhaps he was thinking, what could a young man like him possibly know? So, where were you on your way? and what were you doing? Marius said. Oh, no. If you can't tell me something, I'm not going to ask you. But if you don't mind, I'd like to know. Where the hell did you come from? I've come back from the north. I'm looking for someone, was Gwyn's somewhat plausible answer. I guess it's all in the wind where you go. A man. For a Silenian kinsman like you. Or the unicorn's quest for eternal virginity. If that's the case, you'd be crazy to look for it here in the vicinity of Kum. For it would be a miracle to find a virgin over five and under seventy years of age here, even in the whole of Kum, the city of beauty and pleasure. Marius said lightly, but he was startled when he saw Gwyn's eyes light up. I'm sorry. It's a habit of mine to talk too much. Forgive me if I offend you. I am, Gwyn said with a wry smile. It was very difficult to dislike this young man, with his still boyish face and dark, interested eyes. I don't know whether it's a man or a woman I'm looking for. On the contrary, I do not even know whether it is a man or a woman I want. All I have is the word, aura, that's all. With that one word I left my friends, with whom I had passed through many perils, and set out alone on an adventure to walk every inch of the red road. Aura. Marius furrowed his brow. The legendary aura, the dawn witch. Maybe, or maybe not at all. Gwyn's response was blunt. He finishes his huge piece of meat, 
takes the last sip of his drink and wipes his mouth with the back of his hand. Anyway, I started from the south, went to the north and came back to the beginning again, so that tomorrow I was thinking of turning northwest from Sardos and going straight to Chironia. Because it is the only one of the three great countries of the Middle Kingdom that we have not yet set foot in. I think I'd be more at home there than in Gora. Whether it's Mongol, Kumu or Yulania, I don't feel comfortable in Gora. It's not every day that a civilized man appreciates an ambitious Gora. Marius replied absent-mindedly. When I was full, I felt sleepy. Why don't you go to sleep? You, Serinos. I'll sleep one of these days. Hearing Gwyn's still blunt answer, Marius wrapped the blanket around him once more tightly. If only I had a kithara I could sing you whatever song you like to thank you for your kindness here and now. Marius was about to say so. But a very pleasant drowsiness came over him, and his tired eyelids were plastered with smears. The last thought that crossed his mind vaguely was this. How lucky I am, I'm sure no one would believe me if I wrote a song about the night I spent on the road with Silenos. I don't know how long I've been asleep. But when he heard a noise and awoke, Marius' young body had almost recovered its strength. You you. He was about to complain and shout, is it morning already, when he opened his eyes and woke up completely this time. A shadow wrapped in a huge cloak is scurrying about. It's still dark. Surinos. You woke me up. The darkness seemed to be much deeper than before. It was apparently because Gwyn had doused the fire with dirt and taken care of it. The night air was chilly and Marius pulled the blanket closer to him. There's still time for dawn. Go to sleep. Because you. Gwyn was now fully prepared to leave. At his waist he carried a censer of wine, and his pot was in front of the saddle of a horse which was tied to a tree. With his cloak reattached and his hood pulled tightly over his head, the half-breed's face cannot be discerned from a passing glance. The remnants of his flesh are tucked away in a leather bag, which also hangs from the saddle, and Gwyn herself is preparing a single wish that she may carry it in a fire pot. You're going away. I told you I'd travel by night. Gwyn's answer was curt. I was going to leave the fire, but I didn't want it to be found and attract thieves and other night walkers. I decided to leave it as it was. If you are found by the monsters, it will be your fate. What a terrible thing to say. Marius grumbled. But he was more preoccupied with other things. Selinos, where are you going? Go north. I told you. I'm coming with you. Suddenly, Marius's head woke up with a start. In a panic he threw off his blanket, got up and ran towards Gwyn. What are you talking about? Gwyn snubbed him. There's only one horse. You don't have a destination in mind, do you, like me? Then why not have a companion? Don't bother. I don't need a friend. I'm not going to cause you any trouble. I can earn my own living, and I know how to make people like me. It's a lot easier to travel with me, especially you. That's not necessary. We don't want you to be fickle. I'm not saying this on a whim. Do you think that I, this me, who had the good fortune to meet a man like you, would say goodbye to him without a second thought just because he stayed with me under the fire for a night? No, I'm a poet. I sing of heroes and wonders. I'll follow you. Gwyn like Selinus I've made up my mind. I decided it the first time I saw you. Gwyn fell silent, puzzled. Marius was eager to make a move. You know, even if I were with you and we went on some crazy adventure and I lost my life because of it, I wouldn't regret it at all, I don't need to look at the story of Orpheus to know that the poet and death are always on good terms. And I have a feeling that you and I must go together. My premonitions often come true. My, Marius stammered. One of my cousins has a daughter who is said to be the best seer in Nakahara. So I have a bit of psychic power too. I'm sure that the meeting between you and me on this road must have been preordained by Yarn. You and I were meant to go together for a while. And you will have many strange adventures, and I will sing of the adventures of the leopard-headed Gwyn and the Kithra, and make a name for myself as a great poet in the Midlands. I'm sure of it. I must be the poet who was chosen and born to tell the world the truth about you. That's why we both met. 
This is fate. What a talkative little fellow. Gwyn murmured in dismay. There was bewilderment and a humorous glint in his topaz eyes. I don't see any resemblance, but you remind me of a man who was my companion, whom I had just left a month ago in Argos. He, too, was a talkative, selfish, but irresistible man. Was the man also a poet? Marius asked with hostility. Gwyn shook his head. No. He was a young mercenary from Valachia. He said he was going to find the princess who was to make him king, and when he left Argos, he parted left and right. A poet's chat is a business. No one throws money at a mercenary when he talks. Marius said, already acting like Gwyn's friend. Well, come on, let's go out. The night is short, and if you want to chat, I can walk you through it. Any kind. Legends, tales, women's stories, information, gossip, advice, anything. I'll get you a kithra in the next town. Then I'll sing to you. And when you hear me sing, you'll be so comforted that you'll ask me to sing some more. I guarantee you this. I'm the greatest kithra player since Alphiuchus. It's true, with you I never seem to get bored. Gwyn scratched her chin and laughed as she held a horseshoe in her left hand. So I can go with you, Maria said with a look of joy on his face. For now, but I've got things to look for, and I can't be bothered with your circumstances. If you find yourself in trouble because you're with me, don't count on me. If anything, I think you're going to find out more and more that you need me for a lot of things. Marius cheerfully assured him. All right, then, it's decided. We're going with you. Hi-ho. Come on, let's go. Gwyn the Silenian and Marius the poet are coming to get you. Marius whistled a bullshit melody. Gwyn looked at Marius in disgust. But he said nothing more and reined in the horse. In the midst of the dark midfield sleep, a red roadway twists and turns, glowing red like a straight road leading to a dream. Beyond it are the twisted, pale stars and the beautiful moon Iris, queen of the stars. And they set out. This was the beginning of a long journey and a terrible adventure with Gwyn and Marius. Chapter 1 The Road to Cerudia Hey! Gwyn. It was early in the morning, and the streets were still deserted, and they had not taken a good rest, but they were going on towards the town of Sardos. The only people who pass along the road are the camel riders who follow their tranquil steps in a cloud of dust, or else, for reasons similar to Gwyn's, ascetics and myricists who make the pilgrimage to the Holy Land by night and early morning, unobserved. Gwyn, nevertheless, remained completely covered from head to foot by his cloak, which he wore under a thick leather hood. His appearance was even more striking than that of the ascetic, or the Miroku, who were forbidden by law to be seen. There was something terribly mythical about a large, cloaked man holding a horse bridle and Marius, his youthful face bared against the cloak of a Miroku monk, walking side by side through the crisp, smoky countryside in the morning mist. Marius talked incessantly. And now and then he stretched out his hand and plucked up a piece of fruit from the roadside, and bit into it with his teeth as he pleased. In other parts of the country, where the climate is more favorable, it is an unwritten rule that the poor pilgrim or traveler may take and drink of the fruit trees and springs along the red road, and so quench his hunger and fever as he pleases. Marius's voice was buoyant, as if he doubted that this was a man who had been starving for four days. Hey, you've traveled around a lot in your life. No, in the first place, where were you born and where did you grow up? I may look young, but as a poet of knowledge and joy, I am much better informed than most wise men. But I have never heard of such a man as you before. It's impossible for me not to hear of someone as conspicuous as you, walking about the red streets with a self-satisfied look on his face, no matter how much he covers himself with his hood. You've got a lot of confidence, don't you? Yes, of course. Marius the Helliard, that's my nickname. That's why I'm so curious. I wonder where you've been and how you've been. Where the hell is your country? I don't want a companion who asks too many questions. Gwyn said sardonically. And that's a question I can't answer either. I'm your biographer. I'm your biographer. P. 
People tell their biographers everything, no matter who they don't tell it to, only to their biographers. Gwyn. Who made you a biographer? Bokusa. Marius replied coyly. Then he turned into a distant, enraptured look. Hey! Think about it, you're never going to meet the fate of an ordinary, or even an ordinary hero or great man. I already know that. Because you were born in such a strange, mythical shape. I'm sure that the fate that awaits you will be one in ten million, one in a hundred million, or something like that. Perhaps you'll do something extraordinary, something so extraordinary that you'll leave your mark on the history of mankind. And right now, no one knows who you are. That's great. I, Marius the poet, am the only one in the whole world who knows that you, such a tremendous being, are walking here, on this corner of the red road. And I will follow you, I will sing about you, where you were born, what you look like, what adventures you've won, all in my kithra, in taverns, in poets' houses, in the square on festival days, in the temple of the goddess of poetry Carl A. E. A., where poets fight for their crowns. How they will open their mouths and listen in utter amazement. You will be famous, very famous, as the only real mythical hero of our time, living in reality. People will always listen to your story in disbelief. The leopard headed hero. They'll say, There's no such thing as a real man. But you are. And when they see you, they'll be amazed and they'll tell others and they'll tell others. Marius says that Gwyn is real. Do you have any idea what this means? That's great. You won't have to keep your beautiful leopard head covered with a thick hood and travel only by night and early morning to be seen. You can wear a warrior's cloak and ride through the streets in broad daylight with a horse. And instead of people pointing at you and shouting, what is that monster, and that's Dole's nightmare, they'll look at you with open mouths and go home excited to tell their wives and children. Today, I saw Gwyn, the leopard-headed hero, the best leopard-headed warrior I ever saw. And he will talk of the day he passed you for the rest of his life. And soon he will be a minor hero of the neighborhood just because he saw you for real. People would come to the man puffing on his pipe in a rocking chair on the terrace outside his door with gifts to tell him the story of how they saw you. At the festival, the man will be led to the next table by the chief, saying, whoever has seen Gwyn. What a man who talks a lot. Finally, finding an opening to speak, Gwyn shouted in disgust. It had only been a night since he had spoken to Marius, but this was the second time he had shouted this in that time. The poet is very close to the seer and the mage. They say that the poet's imagination has the light blue wings of Kaura. Marius smiled shyly. Gwyn nodded his head. Yours must have wings on its tongue. Marius was so eloquent that even Gwyn, who was very talkative, was somewhat taken aback. It seems that I was mistaken in thinking you were like Ishtvan. Ishtvan talked a lot too, but not like that, like rolling in oil. It seems to me that a poet, with a single tongue, can make more noise than ten other men can make. But there are rich people who will throw a hundred run gold coin into my lap just to listen to my happy, light-hearted chatter. Marius laughed, bit into a piece of vacha fruit and spat out the skin. But you're my hero, I'm not going to take your money. So tell me about your birth and what you've done. First of all, it doesn't make any sense to me that you just appeared out of nowhere one day. Let them fret. Because that's all I really know. And one day, out of nowhere, a leopard appeared with a bite on its head. That's it then. You're really a Silenian. You just don't know it. Marius whistled a whistle. What a good day. To be able to walk next to the real Serenos. I'm not a Serenus or anything like that. Gwyn said angrily, but just then she noticed that a horse rider, who seemed to be a fast walker, had slowed his horse's pace and was looking at them, and she pulled down her hood even more deeply. And when the man had gone away, he looked about him quickly, and saw that the sun had risen by the time he had walked on, and that he could at last see the distant figures of the travelers on the road, and of the farmers and peasants in their orchards. The farmer and the farmer's wife. It's about time. Gwyn muttered in resignation as he peered over the top of the horse, which had run off again. 
Oh, dear, thank God. Marius could not help speaking his mind. He had pretended to be full of energy, and had talked and walked on, only because he did not want Gwyn to refuse to go with him, but the truth was that until last night he had fallen ill and had not eaten or drunk. My body was weak, and afterwards I ate and felt somewhat better, but now it seemed to me that my body was clamoring for rest and a good night's sleep. His patience was almost exhausted. Sleep till nightfall. Marius said happily as he followed Gwyn, who was quickly leaving the street and turning into a branch road. Gwyn doesn't even look back. Yes. Until the end of the day. But first, I want some food. Let's go to the nearest farmhouse and have a meal. Do what you want. I can't do it. Do you think I'm going to miss you, me? Of course I'm going to go out and get it for you. Sure, you've got a bit of food for the journey, but you'll save that for when you get to the colder, less populated parts of the country, and in a place like this, where it's plentiful, it's better to eat what you can get. Gwyn found a meadow at the back of the wood and prepared to spend the day there. It was very easy, however, for there was no need to build a fire at noon. All they had to do was to unroll their cloaks and use them as blankets, tie the horse to a tree, give him water and water, cover him with a blanket and lie down. I'm off then, Marius said, but I don't want you to disappear while I'm gone. If you do, I'll write and sing a song that will make you unhappy wherever you go. Gwyn gave a low, rumbling snort and made no reply. Marius turned his head several times, fearing that Gwyn would leave him, but when he saw that Gwyn had turned his back on him and was not moving. I'll be back soon. I reminded him, and we walked quickly through the woods to the roof of a farmhouse that we had spotted on the way in. He was very confident that he could get whatever he wanted with just a few words. By the time Marius returned, nearly two hours had passed. Marius was almost convinced that Gwyn had disappeared into thin air. But he peeped cautiously through the tangled branches of the trees and smiled happily. Gwyn is still in the same position he was in when he went out, apparently well rested. Hello, you're here. You're here, Selinus. I really think now that you and I were meant to be together, Marius murmured softly. It was nearly noon, and the sunlight was staining Marius's slender, beautiful face with a hint of softness that would have made a man look soft. There was something strange about this talkative poet, a man of the world, who attracted the eye of the beholder, and made him think that he was not a mere man, but had an innate dignity. He had a slender waist and limbs, a fair complexion, and good looks, so that one might have thought that he was a male concubine. For this reason, in spite of his chattering and his gregarious manner, no one can think of him as a man who would like to be in the best of company. Marius put down the large bag on his shoulder and stepped next to Gwyn. Immediately he jumped in fright. For there was a gleam between Gwyn's arms under the blanket. Oh, oh, my God. He gasped and laughed. Gwyn slowly raised himself and sheathed his long sword. Oh, do you always sleep with your sword in your hand? I knew it was you, but... Gwyn didn't look surprised at all. I still didn't believe you were friend or foe, so I listened for your return and watched you. I don't think I heard any footsteps. Marius said disapprovingly. You must be one hell of a fighter. I don't know who you're talking about. Gwyn wrinkled her nose and laughed. What? What are you talking about? For a poet with a kithra in his hand, who does not know how to hold a sword, the way he approached without making a sound, and the way he jumped out of the way just now, was quite impressive. Oh, no, Marius said meekly. But he did not seem to make any particular effort to get through to him, and was more occupied in spreading out the food he had got on the grass. Indeed, Marius's hands were so skillful that he boasted of them all the time. In his sack, he took out and laid out an endless supply of delicious food, as if he were about to start a great feast. Tender, roasted grass rabbit, smoked rock deer thighs, cheese made from goat's milk, large steamed buns made of ground flour called gaudy, kneaded with milk, stuffed and steamed well, jam smeared on the outside instead of stuffed, fried, large whole roasted fish, nuts, dried fruits of vacha, dried and stewed meat for traveling, pies made of minced meat and dipped in hot and spicy camloo fruit, honey wine poured into a large wooden jar and covered with a lid. To his dismay, 
what he finally took out of this magic bag was a sieve of kithra. Thanks, I can't do without it. Maria said, rubbing his cheek against the round body, as if he were very happy, and then, taking him back on his knees, he played a few beautiful chords in the forest with a familiar and expert gesture. Come, let's eat, and I'll play you a kithra later. To get all this, I had to sing five love songs, tell one legend, and sleep with two girls. Marius gave a toothy smile. Gwyn rose and looked at the feast spread out before him, as if it were the table of a prince, but once more Marius urged him on, and he went on eating without seeming to pay the least attention to it. It soon became evident that Marius, though slender in appearance, was almost as great a gourmand as Gwyn, the great man. For a while they were busy, without saying a word, biting the flesh with their gleaming teeth, swallowing the buns, and devouring the juicy fruit. In one hand a large jar of honey wine was passed from hand to hand, which was quickly drunk. When they had filled their stomachs with an astonishing quantity of food, and when, with sighs of satisfaction, neither of them reached for it any more, there was still a good deal of food left on the rug. The two girls must have liked Marius's singing and his technique very much. They say where I'm from, what I'm like. With a full belly, Gwyn said, as if it were nothing. You're nothing but a minstrel, you say, but you're not. Who the hell are you? Where is your country? What is your father's rank? Who? Country. Marius scowled at Gwyn with drunken eyes. There is no country. My father. I don't even know my father. I was born a miserable fatherless child. And early on I learned all the ways of being too much. In a blinding flash, Gwyn's hand reached out, and before he knew it, her strong, tough fingers were clasping Marius' slender chin. Marius struggled and tried to tear it off with his hand, but it was as if a vice had clamped down on him and he could not get it off. A pair of eyes with a disturbing glint peered closely into his face. You look like someone else. You, your face reminds me of a girl. Gwyn's voice was awful. Say it. You're Linda's what? Linda. I don't give a shit about that girl. Marius gasped. Gwyn stared at Marius with glaring eyes. Marius tried hard not to look away. After some time had passed, Gwyn suddenly left Marius and seemed to have lost all interest in him. Well, good. He said softly, pulled the blanket over him and lay down. Get some sleep while you still can. We'll be ready to go as soon as the sun goes down. I don't know who you are, but that's not important. I don't even know who I am. Hey, wait a minute. It was Gwyn who first made the snarling noises. What? How many days have we been traveling only by night and early morning? How many nights and early mornings have we traveled, and it is not yet ten days? Where the hell am I? Ha! Huh? Traveling through the night is hard. Moreover, if one continues on the monotonous journey, walking endlessly along the red roads, the traveler's mind gradually becomes a hazy, dull, mechanical creature that can only go on and on. Where, somewhere between Cum and Chironia. We passed the town of Sardos on the border, let's see, five or six days ago and we've been walking northwest ever since. I wonder if there is a mountain range like this between Cum and Chironia. Gwyn's voice was muffled and strangely strained. Yes. But if not there, where the hell would I be? Finally, Marius came out of his thirsty half-awake state and looked up at the sky. They were already well into the highlands. The air was chirpy and clear, with deep black forests on either side, and a starry sky above them like a jewel scattered with jewels. Every now and then a bird would flutter through the forest, making a strange noise. Hum. Gwyn had now stopped altogether, and only the light of the torches round the necks of the horses made a little fountain of light around them, but unlike the plain of the cum, through which they had passed, and which was so closely wooded on either side, there was not the slightest chance of the foolhardy traveller travelling by night along the road. There is no place for the foolhardy traveller who travels by night along the road. What's the matter, Gwyn? Marius looked up at him curiously. Still a head taller than he was, this warrior of a different aspect raised his hand and flung back his hood, exposing his leopard head. His mustache bristled and his eyes blazed green, just like the predator that gazes from the bushes at night. 
Marius, too, was a bold and fearless man, but he suddenly shuddered, for there was something in Gwyn's eyes that gave him the illusion of being left alone with a wild beast in the middle of a forest whose name he did not even know, just after dark. Gwyn saw that Marius was shaking, but she did not try to reassure him, but said, with an even greater gleam in her glittering eyes. According to what I have heard, a few days after leaving Sardos and crossing the border of Kumu, you come to the fort of Kylas, which is practically a barrier. One of the red roads passes through it, and one detours around it to reach Salonia. Of course, if war broke out, both roads would be manned. Then, bypassing Kylas and passing all the way through the Eilane region, the second largest producer of Vasha trees after Audain, they finally entered the grazing country of San Gala, from where they entered the territory of Chironia. If there is no doubt about it, we must have seen the fort of Kylas at least yesterday or the day before. You might have missed it because it was night. Or maybe you only travel at night because you can't make it, Marius said. Gwyn thought about it for a moment and then shrugged it off. The fort is lit by torchlight even at night and has a sentinel who can see us from a distance. Besides, we are not very lame, though only at night. This distance should be based on the weakest of us, women and the elderly. So we can only go at night, and that would be enough to meet the standard. And one more thing. Another one. Whether we have missed the fort and passed it by, or whether we have not yet reached it, there is something which cannot be explained by that alone. We were told that Kylas and I Lane are both on flat ground. We should not have gone into the mountains. Where did I take the wrong turn? Marius, who did not seem very bewildered, said that suddenly there was a strange cry and a huge bird flew overhead, and he shrugged his head and said, Hiya. Oh, a very big Baltic bird. If I've got it wrong, it's not like it's yesterday or today. Gwyn shrugged. The road seemed to be going up a bit tonight. I always thought it was strange, but I didn't say anything because I thought it was a straight road and it would go down soon. I didn't notice anything at all. Marius said admiringly. It must have been near the Sardos, he said, that I made the mistake. There, because it was not good to pass through the town, I would have waited until nightfall, turned off into a narrow side street, then, after winding through some kind of forest, I would have turned off again to the northwest. He must have forgot to count one turn or counted many, and turned off a little to the northwest. I must have been going the wrong way ever since. Well, but what does it matter? It's not a journey with a definite destination and a definite time to get there. On the contrary, it's not for nothing that you won't find what you're looking for wherever and however you happen to be. Or do you still want to get to Chironia as soon as possible, as you said at the beginning? What do you have in mind for Chironia? There is no such thing. Gwyn reluctantly agreed. The fact that he did so reluctantly caught Marius' eye. What do you mean? He peers curiously. Gwyn shakes his head. I don't have to go to Chironia, I can go to the steppes, I can go to Hainam, I don't care, but I don't like it. This. And a leopard's head to the side. It's the air in these mountains. Air. Marius sniffed. No, I think it's nice and cold, with the smell of the forest in the air. That's not what I meant. I'm saying that I have a strange feeling about this. Ha. Without irony, Marius whistled. Are you a seer, too? I don't think so, but my instincts seem to be better than most. Me too. But at the moment I don't feel the hairs on the nape of my neck stand up, nor do I feel that someone is walking over my grave. Gwyn made no reply. So, what are you going to do? Turn back. This time the silence was much longer. When Marius was about to ask again, Gwyn opened her mouth gravely. No, there's nothing you can do about it. There's no rule about which way you have to go. Besides, maybe the very fact that you've taken a wrong turn is the work of Yarn, the god of fate, just as it was when you and I met. He wanted you to be on the right path for you. First of all, I have a feeling that you will make it through whatever you have to go through. I wish I could be as optimistic about things as you are. Gwyn said without hesitation, took the reins of the horse and started to walk again. He walked with a great stride, as if he were somehow angry. Marius rushed after him. 
They silently hoped that the road would soon turn downhill and that they would soon be back on the plain of Gora. But they were wrong. The road went up and up, and the slope became steeper and steeper. The forest had become so deep and silent that, as far as the eye could see, there was not even a single house lighted up through the branches. The red road huddled in the middle of the forest, but it was clear that we had not entered the mountainous region to the north or west, as we could not see any mountain ranges blocking our view when we looked up. If so, please contact. Both Marius and Gwyn became silent, partly because of the difficulty of the ascent, but also because they were trying to guess where they were by drawing a map in their minds of Nakahara and its surroundings, as far as they knew. At this time, there was practically no map that covered all the geography of the world. The people of the three kingdoms of Gura did not even know the full size of the frontier region of Nosferis, which stretched across a single river, and even those who made a career of traveling around the world, such as sailors and merchants, did not know how many countries there were in the whole world. They did not even know how many countries there were in the whole world. On top of that, for the people of Central Plains, the far south, the far north, the far east and the frontier were all unknown gaps, each full of strange mysteries. At this time, all that was known to them of the world was a very small part of it and a great deal of mystery that lay beyond it. And between each of the strong and great powers in the Central Plains, there is a considerable area of neutral territory, which is sometimes also the mysterious territory of nomadic tribes and special ethnic groups. This is a natural consequence of the fact that, when two powerful countries border each other, trouble will inevitably arise, and both countries will be involved in wars, and one of them will be swallowed up by the other. The number of inhabitants and the ownership of these neutral areas were very fluid. Therefore, it is almost impossible to draw an accurate and precise map even only in the central plains at this time. Such was the understanding of these two silent travelers, who did not say a word to each other. Both of them knew themselves and the world well enough to embark on such a dangerous and uncharted journey alone, without any guarantee that, once they had set foot on it, they would ever set foot on the same spot again. However, it is when the danger is more real that these abilities come into play. When they are lost and do not know where they stand or whose territory they are in, they can do only two things, turn back or keep going until these questions are answered. And they had already decided to keep going. So they kept going. The road was monotonous and hard, not so steep as to be a mountain climb, but not so gentle as to be a continuous ascent. Fortunately, the climate in this part of the Zhongyuan is more favorable than in the remote areas, and even when we entered the forest, there were not many dangerous wild animals such as desert wolves or bears. Slowly but surely the slope increased, the air became cooler and the green of the trees became brighter. It was clear that the summit was not far away. If so, this mountain is a little low to be called a mountain, but quite high to be called a hill. Anyway, I don't know what's wrong with this mountain, but it's here. Marius, who had been panting and talking less and less as the road became steeper, said, breathing heavily, as if he could not keep silent. One thing's for sure. It is a great fortune for us that it is here. Because if we had not taken such a mountainous road, but a flat road that often passed through the town, our journey would have been much more difficult. In the middle of the forest, where it is so quiet that only birds and squirrels pass by, whether you are a leopard head or a ghost, no one will scream in surprise or follow you. This is the best thing for us now, isn't it, Gwyn? If you talk too much, you'll get tired fast. Was Gwyn's brusque answer. It was true that Marius was right, and they were able to walk through the day without being seen. The forest became deeper and deeper, and every so often a snake slipped through the thick undergrowth with a swift movement, or a Baltic bird swooped down from the treetops, grabbed a mouse in the bushes in its claws, and flew up again. It is clear that this area is not a place where people come and go on a regular basis. Every now and then, a shower would fall on the travelers, and in less than ten tarzans, it would go up as quickly as it had come. After the rain had passed, the emerald grass, the ruby berries, the little white flowers, and the trees, all held glittering glass beads, and when the birds flew from their branches, they scattered their drops as if the rain had come again. 
When it rained, they wore their traveling leather cloaks and hoods, and did not stop to go into the shelter of the trees to shelter from the rain. When the rain had ceased, they would shake themselves like animals out of the water to sift the drops of water from their bodies, then pull off their hoods and wipe their bare, soaked hands and feet with a cloth. Marius turned his poet's eyes to the beauty of the forest after the rain. Through the dark green forest, like a ribbon that clings to the mountain, the contrast with the red road, which is also wet with rain and has puddles that glisten in places, is wonderful. In the past, there had been many kingdoms in the central plains, but even the most noble and peace-loving, the most belligerent, the most self-interested, and the most invasive, had all agreed on one project, and had invested a great deal of money and manpower in the construction of several projects. The only thing they agreed on was the construction of the Red Road, a red ribbon around the entire central plains. Of course, some of them did so out of their own interest, while others made many sacrifices for the noble motive of facilitating traffic in the central plains and promoting mutual exchange. Some of them were attacked by neighboring countries and perished in vain because of the establishment of the Red Road. However, in spite of all these, the Red Road was a symbol of the civilization of Zhongyuan and even a symbol of Zhongyuan itself. The area where the red roads were spread out like a network was the central plains, and the central plains were the regions where the red roads were spread out. Such were Marius's vague thoughts and his enraptured eyes. He had chosen to be a poet and a storyteller, and the red road was a symbol of the romance of history itself. The red sandstone path is slippery with rain. His dubious companion, who walked beside him on the reins of a horse, seemed to be thinking about nothing else but to make sure that his leather sandals did not slip. The steeper the mountain path became, the more silent he seemed to become. But the proof that he was not walking mechanically, preoccupied with some thought, was that his eyes were always shining, and he seemed to be looking in all directions, waiting for something. Marius would have liked to ask him what he was feeling, but there was something about his huge figure that prevented him from doing so and even Marius was unable to speak. Eventually, the forest opened up somewhat and was replaced by huge black rocks. The rocks were soft and seemed to be volcanic rocks. It was already the top of a mountain. There was not much of a view from the top. At any rate, they wanted to have some idea of where they were, so they found a flat lookout and, after a long pause, decided to take a look around. However, the view in all directions was nothing more than a series of deep forests, and we could see nothing at all. In the distance, rivers like shimmering ribbons of blue and the silvery glow of cities seemed like an unseen dream. And yet they seemed so far away and so unconnected. I can see the spire. Marius held up his hand, his eyes narrowed, and he tried to make out where the town was. Surely that thin shiny thing must be the tip of a spire. Maybe it's the fort of Kalas, but I don't think so. It's too white and slender to be a fortress, more like a temple. Besides, we are too far to the southeast for Kailas. If we go so far to the southeast, we will have already left Kums territory and entered the free borderlands. Southeast. Marius was disappointed. If you're in Chironia, you're going northwest, Gwyn. Because this road goes up and around this side of the mountain slope. Gwyn said bluntly. Now, which side of the mountain we will end up on when we get to the end of the descent? It seems to me that only Yarn can tell us. Do it. Maria said, without seeming to care much. The climb was over. The descent runs at a very steep angle between the rocks, between the gentle ascent and the descent that surrounds the south side of the mountain. The slope is so steep that a horse can barely descend it. Marius looked back at Gwyn as if to ask her what she was going to do, but Gwyn remained silent and started to descend faster and faster, so he followed her. The descent was much more difficult than the ascent. And there was one more thing that frightened them, after a while, the red road was cut off. Originally, from the time of the descent, the road was not a neat and tidy cobblestone pavement, but rather a messy construction of all kinds of red stones, which made their foothold even worse. But it was as if the foreman and the slaves who had been working on the construction had suddenly caught the bug of disgust and had left the construction site one day, 
only to find that it had ceased to exist and that there was only a bare earth road ahead, the sight of such a bare earth road, with only the red road to guide the traveler, was quite upsetting. Marius hesitated again and looked at Gwyn's face. But there is still no expression on Gwyn's leopard head. As if he had expected this, he stepped into the muddy path. I don't know if he's got any human feelings. Marius murmured to himself, and, with a muffled curse, set off down the steep, slippery slope. Gwyn was guiding the horses with a clever touch of the reins, but their pace was slowing down. On top of that, Marius thought, they had been going downhill for a long time now, and the gradient showed no sign of slowing down as they approached the bottom. This was closer to the north side of the mountain, so it might not be as hot as the south side, but Marius thought it would be nice if the temperature had risen a little more after such a long descent. After all, the air was cool, the sky was dark and shadowy, and the forest trees on either side of them were straight, dark, and tall as if they were from farther north. It's a strange mountain. The faces on the other side of the mountain are completely different from those on this side. He's like an old man in a tavern who's friendly to his guests but shouts at his neighbors. Marius said. But. That's right. There is something strangely unnatural about this mountain, something that suggests the petty, diminutive wisdom of man. I was rather surprised when Gwyn answered immediately. They fell silent again and continued on their way. There was something in the heavy, gloomy air that made one's heart uneasy. Even the sky seemed somehow to have become cloudy and hazy. Besides, Marius thinks. Besides, this descent is much steeper and straighter than the ascent, and we must reach the foot of the hill much sooner than the ascent, no matter what. However, even though we have been walking silently for several zangs now, there is no sign of it. In other words, there is a valley on this side of the mountain. And it seems to be a very deep valley. On both sides of the way down, the forest was closing in, and there was hardly a cheerful Baltic bird or singing squirrel to be heard. If we had only looked at this side of the mountain, we might have thought that we were in some mysterious deep mountain valley. Before long, the forest broke up and the path was cut through a high wall on both sides. Putting his hand to the soil, Gwyn called Marius' attention to it. I hear these cliffs were hewn by man. What? Then this valley is not a natural formation. It's probably man-made, using these hills. Gwyn's voice trailed off. Marius jumped and went to Gwyn's side and saw what she was looking at. At the side of the road stands a small grey stone signpost pointing down the slope. In the middle of a stone pillar with a strange pattern, I could make out the almost worn-out letters. Zerudia, one tad. And there is. The two men looked at each other. Hey. Gwyn. Even now, when the dark hues of the town beyond the valley were becoming clearer and clearer, Marius still did not stop to hesitate. Are you sure you want to go to, um... Zerudia. Oh. Gwyn replies absently and does not even rest his feet. Is that what your gut is telling you, that you should go there? Are you sure you know about Zlordia, the city of the dead? Maybe. No, then I'm sure you know only the most commonly held and extremely vague knowledge. If only I had heard of Zerudia. Then, even from the entrance to the town, you must turn around and run back the way you came. Then, Gwyn said, showing no sign of annoyance. Why don't you do that? No one's saying you can't. Oh, no, 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 no. Marius laughed in annoyance. If I could have done that, I would have done it when I saw the signpost. Do you think I could leave you now, when I don't even know if I'll ever see you alive again, somewhere on the red road? I was born to be a storyteller, to tell people about your adventures. Then put this on the first line of it. Gwyn said it without expression, but inwardly his eyes glittered as if he were somewhat amused. Whether it was death, the devil, or the idea of Nosphorus that awaited him, he did not change course to avoid it. Rather, he would walk straight into it and fight his way through it without hesitation. Ugh. Marius was silent for a moment, his face troubled, but then he shook his head and smiled. All right, Gwyn. That's a good one. I'll use it in my saga, by all means. The first section of the long saga, Marius the poet meets the leopard-headed warrior. 
So the first section will be called Adventures in the City of Selling Death. Then, at least, before I go into Zerudia, I'll fill you in on a few things about it. That way, you'll understand why I didn't want to go there. Listen. Zerudia is a free city with its own rule, not belonging to any kingdom, duchy, or principalities, just like the free trade city of Rigor or the Miroku city of Yaga. I think there is a king or a mayor who controls Zerudia. It is a city that no greedy kingdom dares to touch, not because other nations fear its military and financial power, as in the case of Rigor, nor for fear of incurring the wrath of the Miroku of the whole Middle Kingdom, as in the case of Yaga. No country wants Zerudia, because it is a very horrible and secret city whose main industry is death. Zerudia is a mummification guild. All its inhabitants are undertakers, tomb builders, mummies, and bone pickers. When a king or nobleman dies, every country sends a messenger to Zerudia to send mummies and tomb makers. Otherwise, the corpse is sent to Zerudia to be mummified and sent back. Some of them are not sent back, but are laid to rest in Zerudia. This is because many superstitious people, such as wicked men and criminals, are afraid that if they are left there, they will come back to life and cause fever or spread evil fever. The remains of all such people are sent to Zlordia. Zerudia is always rich in fees for the taking of corpses, mummification and funerals. But instead, the city is abhorred by ordinary people as death itself. Those who have followed the funeral procession that brings the dead to Zerudia, when they return, say that they are disfigured, wash their bodies, and retire to the temple. It is thought to be the entrance to Hades in this world. And it is said that the people who live there praise Dor, the king of Hades, and Miguel, his firstborn son, the god of darkness and fire, as their chief gods, and do not speak the name of Janus. There is a legend that says that if you go through it again and again, you will finally reach Hades, the kingdom of Dole. The poet Ophius asked the king of Zerudia for his dead lover, Amia, and went down the pit and never came back. That's what Zlordia is. It's called the city that sells death. The country's main industry is death. Do you understand, Selinos, that I didn't want to go there because I was a coward? Gwyn just shrugged his strong shoulders and showed no sign of being particularly impressed by the story. While they were talking, they had finally descended the valley and were standing at the top of a narrow slope overlooking the city of selling death. It was a more than a little gloomy scene. And there was a town under their eyes, built of dark grey stone. It must have been originally a modest hill in the midst of the plain, but when the town was built, it was cut through, and an artificial valley carved out of it, creating an artificial basin cut off from the surrounding plain. The four sides of the town are divided by high cliffs, like the inside of a basin, within which the streets are set like a grey box garden. In the center there is a large building with several towers, and on either side of it, one by one, there is a huge square building with no windows, which gives an ominous feeling, like a tombstone. More striking, however, are the thousands of shrines that are built into the surrounding cliffs. Some of them are so deep that, from a distance, they give the impression that the whole cliff is a giant beehive. And from the bottom of the cliff, circling around the town, like a town of dwarfs huddled around a town of giants, there were many small structures that must have been the communal cemetery of Zerudia. Perhaps it was just my imagination, but on this sunny day, the sky above the basin seemed to hang in a dark, smoky hue. There is no such thing as a sunny day in Zerudia, Marius explained. Because every day incense is burned around all the shrines and tombs there, and the three crematoria around the town are constantly cremating the dead who are brought in. The crematoriums offer water, bird, wind, cremation and earthen burial services for all religions and all kinds of funerals, as you wish. The sky of Zerudia is clouded with the smoke of the burning of the dead, the smoke of the mummification and the smoke of the funeral. After saying this, Marius suddenly shuddered, as if he had been struck by a chill. Dozens of jet-black birds fluttered gently over the town. They were large, so-called shorebirds. They chirped in a weird voice and slowly swooped down and up on the tall grey cedar, the only plant that grows here and there in the town. From here, the land of the dead, the land of the living. 
Marius read aloud the words on a stone pillar by the roadside. If I could, I wouldn't want to go in there either. With my appearance, I'd cause a stir if I went into town. Gwyn says, suddenly remembering. Marius shook his head. Why, why? Here, besides the funeral people, come the old, the young, and all sorts of people who are sick, desperate, and just waiting for death. Like giant elephants, they come to Sarudia to help the mummies to be made, so that they can go to the other side on better terms, so that they can become mummies with more money. That's why some of them have mangled faces and some of them are skeletons. Maybe you can say here that you're wearing a mask because you're sick and your face is damaged. I'll leave that to my tongue. Well, I suppose so. Traveling with you seems to be very convenient. I know everything, Gwyn said thoughtfully. But the trouble is, if you say one thing to them, they come back with a hundred things. Because I'm in the business of wielding tongues, just as you're in the business of wielding swords. I can't help it. But I don't wield a sword while I walk, I keep it in its scabbard for the war. Gwyn pointed out. Marius licked his lips as if to say something back, but was silenced by the sudden appearance of a strange figure in front of him. They had at last reached the great gate of the city of Zerudia. From both sides of the great gate, which was made of grey stone, came out the guards, and who were they? The guards were of a very strange and sinister appearance. They wore thick, jet-black cloaks that covered them from head to foot. Their mouths were glued shut, and their eyes gleamed out of their shadowy faces. The hand that emerges from the cloak is holding a long, black handle, like a spear. On the breast of their black cloaks there was a pattern of skulls, so white that it made their gloomy figures look like the messengers of hell itself. They appeared from both sides, and crossed their long-handled lances in front of them, as if to interrupt their progress. Where are we going? Who are you? What can I do for you, Zerudia? A voice that sounded like it came from the depths of the earth said. There was no sign of surprise at Gwyn's strange appearance. Marius steps forward. This man is a warrior from Chironia. As you can see, he was stricken with a deadly disease and was unable to stay in his country, so he came to die in Zerudia and be resurrected as a mummy. His face has melted away so he wears this mask to hide it. Please don't take it off. My name is Marius, and I am a traveling minstrel, and I have undertaken to take him to Zerudia, so that later I may report to my family in Chironia what has happened. Such a crude fiction would probably have been too much for the pride of the Marian poet, but in Zerudia it was the most reasonable and familiar story. The two gatekeepers did not even ask to see the bill, but quickly raised their gazes. Rather, they showed a certain respect for Gwyn. May you reach Hades in peace. One of them cut a strange mark with his skinny hand and said, I'm sorry, and the other added, I'm sorry. May you find a good tomb and a good mummy maker. Blessed are the dead, for they shall die. Marius replied with a flourish. Apparently, this is a common greeting in Zerudia. They entered the city of selling death without difficulty. That smells strange. As soon as he stepped into the great gate, Gwyn said with a twitch of his nose. It was true that the city was covered with a grey and dank atmosphere, filled with a strange, heavy, unpleasant, yet not strangely pleasant, sweet, stale and pungent odour. It smells of gunpowder, smoke, sickness and death. Marius said casually, What's that voice? Gwyn says. Somewhere in the street there is a strange voice, like a cry of a creature which goes on and on. There's a funeral, and the weeping woman is weeping. Marius explained. I can hear you all day long here. Gwyn shook his head and shrugged his shoulders. As he listened, his voice rang out high and low with sorrow, and was joined by voices from elsewhere, which echoed together, drawing the listener into an indescribably melancholy mood. I don't like this town. Gwyn decided easily. Marius laughed. Well, it's not like that. Besides, this place is easy enough to get into, but very difficult to get out of. Well, before we talk about it, there's something I need to do. Buy that cloak and put it on both of you. I've heard it's a Zerudian custom. Then we'll take lodgings, eat our food and think about the future. 
You know everything as if you were royalty with an imperial education, Gwyn said. Marius narrowed his eyes at his companion, but seeing that he was not being sarcastic, he turned to inspect the street. Indeed, Marius is right, even Gwyn's apparition does not attract people's attention here. In the grey streets, people walked about very quietly. Most of them are fully clothed in the long black cloaks of the gatekeepers, with only their eyes showing. But the patterns on their chests are slightly different, some with skulls, some with the hideous figure of a dole, and some with strange hieroglyphic symbols meaning death. Sometimes they walked around without cloaks, wearing short coats and short trousers, but on the whole, the people's movements lacked vitality, and they seemed to move at a sluggish pace, like people in a dream. It was understandable. In the buildings, in the sky, in the flying civets, there was something about the cold fingers that touched the bodies of the living and drained them of their energy. The houses are made of grey stone and are low and flat. The houses are made of grey stone, low and flat, with square openings facing the street. The inside of the houses, which can be seen through the doorless entrances, is dark and there is a feeling that some mummies are hidden inside every house. In front of the houses and at the roots of the cedar trees, there were many merchants who had small shops with dark rugs. They sold liquor or water with liquor in many pots, or many black cloaks and sandals, or, more bluntly, white powdered sweets in the shape of skulls. The most striking feature was that none of the cloaked merchants who sat behind them would call out to their customers or exchange a word with them. This was quite different from the bustle of the market that could be seen in any town. The traders seemed to have no passion or interest in selling their wares. If a child had grabbed the goods and run away in front of them, they might not have bothered to chase him, and they didn't have to worry about it. Gradually they began to realize why the streets had such a sluggish, somber feel to them. Nowhere in these stone-built streets were there any of the children and infants who were supposed to be running around and making cheerful noises, bringing life and joy to the city. And in return, there were many dogs. They roamed the streets without barking and with big faces, as if they were the rightful heirs of this town. Look at them, Gwyn. They're all fat. I'm telling you, they're full of meat and bones, for crying out loud. Marius raises his eyebrows in horror and whispers. At that moment, also in a grim silence, a group of people came around the corner. It's a funeral. Marius whispers. You don't need to hear it to know it at a glance. They are all clothed in black, and in the middle of the procession is a coffin on a large cart, which is being led by two black horses. All the people were looking down with their right hands on their chests, and their steps were slow and limping. Then suddenly, as they came to a halt in front of them, the funeral people put up their hands to the sky and began to utter a cry of grief. Put your head down, Gwyn don't look at them. Marius pulls Gwyn's hand. They both hang their heads and wait with their right hands on their chests. Then the voice ceased, and the slow march began again. When it reached the next corner, it stopped again, and a voice cried out. If you stay here for a few days, you don't think it's a very good thing to be alive, and death doesn't seem so horrible, just an everyday occurrence. Marius whispered. The people who come here to die, he said, do so every day from morning till night, at someone's funeral. Sooner or later, their own turn will come. As I watched, I saw that the black-clad townspeople who were about to pass in front of me often turned around and joined the funeral procession that I had just seen. The funeral procession, like a thin stream of water gathering more and more water to form a thicker stream, gradually formed into a large crowd, and turned down the street like a huge black wish-fulfillment moving through the grey city. At least there's one overwhelmingly beautiful thing about this town. Gwyn murmurs meditatively. It means that all men are equal in death. I don't know. I don't know about that. Marius shouted loudly, and the merchants and the dogs, who were huddled on the rugs on either side of him, gave him a sullen look, as if to reproach him for his impudence in disturbing the silence of the eternal city. It was a sullen gaze that reminded me of the sign in front of the great gate that said, from here on, the land of the dead, the living must not enter. Marius shrugged his head and lowered his voice. You'll find out soon enough. There is no true equality, not even in death. 
Here, death is a commodity to be traded for money. So, of course, there are expensive and luxurious deaths, just as there are women and food and art in other countries, and there are cheap and degrading deaths. This is not a metaphor. What do you mean? This is another story that I can't say out loud, but there's another secret rumor about the town of Zerudia. That is to say, the town does not merely trade in deaths that have already taken place, or deaths as a ritual. There is also a rumor, which cannot be put out of circulation, that the town trades in something more real, more dangerous, death, the product that ends life, as a shadowy, more lucrative commodity. You mean to tell me that in Zerudia there is not only a guild of mummies, but also a guild of assassins? Shoo! Marius has one. That's not the sort of thing you want to talk about here. If you like, I'll tell you in secret at the inn tonight, but in the meantime, I'll buy two of those cloaks and slip into town as soon as I can, just like I planned. You'll be very conspicuous, though no one will notice you. Marius was looking around for a while, and then he came up to a merchant who was lying on a rug. How much? He points to the two cloaks and asks, and shakes his head in answer. Too expensive. The merchant said something back in a sluggish tone, and the two men began a sluggish exchange of words that lacked the vigor of a bargaining match. Gwyn looked on in disgust. It seemed to him that this companion of his, Marius, was doing all sorts of things that he had never expected. He is a man of strange dignity, but he is also a man of vulgarity, a man of humor, a man of sentimentality, and a man of practicality. When Gwyn shook his head and stepped back as if to say, suit yourself, he suddenly jumped with a lightning movement. Suddenly cold thin fingers touched his arm. He put his hand to his sword and stared at the man who had frightened him. Then he heard a soft chuckle. Did you get the iris stone? That's what the voice said. Chapter 2 The Palace of the Dead Are you? Gwyn said slowly and carefully. The stone of iris? Yes. She put her hands on her hips and said arrogantly. After negotiating with the merchant, Marius, who had two cloaks in his hand, turned around and opened his mouth with a pout. Suddenly, Gwyn was approached by a beautiful girl. Very beautiful, I might even say. She has slender, graceful limbs, a cloak flung over the back of her head, her long, bushy, almost white silver hair is braided and wrapped around her head in the manner of a kumu, and she is frighteningly pale and without makeup. She had large eyes, a vaguely eastern face, and seemed to have a strong temperament. But it was not so much her beauty and charm that made Marius roll his eyes, but something else. There is something inexpressibly haunting about her whole body. Her silver eyes, wide open and gazing fearlessly at Gwyn, held a strange, sinister, dusky cloak. It was clear that she was the daughter of Zerudia. Even if one had seen her in another land, it would have been clear. Instead of life and sunshine she was covered with death and cold earth and the sleep of Hades, and within her body it was as if the waters of the blue river of Chiron flowed instead of blood. No one was more worthy of Zerudia than she, and no one was more worthy of her than Zerudia. She smiled, her laugh was like the soft sunshine on the grave, and her soft chuckle was the wind through the treetops of the cypress. Her hair was silver, parted in the middle of her forehead, and between her eyes, fastened with a thin silver band, was a ruby the color of blood. Oh, no. I don't want to sleep with a dead man in my arms, however beautiful he may be. She must be Tanya, a beautiful woman who was mummified by the legendary mummy maker Alcather, so that she didn't know she was dead and spent her nights making love to many men and sending them to their deaths. Marius's daughter heard what he said. I am Tanya. Laughing, she looked alternately at Gwyn and Marius and said, But I'm not Tanya, the beautiful woman who was mummified by Alcather. I'm Tanya, I'm Tanya, the famous daughter of death, of Zerudia, so if you've got the stone of Iris, I have the right to know about it first. I don't know what you're talking about. Gwyn still chooses his words carefully. Daughter of death, so you're the princess of Zerudia. Princess. Tanya's voice was full of contempt. Am I the daughter of Alroth the pig? Ha! Don't make me laugh. I'm far more sacred and inviolable than Alroth. 
If Alroth goes around saying I'm his daughter, he'll go to the hundredth hell, never to rise again. I am Tanya, the daughter of death. I am Sarudia herself. What did you say about the iris stone? Gwyn stopped Marius, who was looking at him blankly, and started to gather information. Yes. Tanya, at least, did not seem to have any reason to keep the matter a secret. I knew from a town away that you were not one of these blighters who come to Zoldia, dying, to seek the eternal resurrection. Then you must be a mercenary, one of those greedy bastards who came to hear of the Stone of Iris. And I know that if anyone can get the Stone of Iris better than any other person, it's you. Please, please. Did you get the Iris Stone? I hate to say it. Gwyn shrugged. We are travelers who have wandered into Zerudia on our way to Chironia in the north, and we have not come here to get the Stone of Iris, or to find it, for that matter. I'm sorry, but you'll have to look elsewhere. Tanya, daughter of death. As soon as Gwyn had said this, Tanya's expression changed. Her beautiful face was filled with the rage and icy dignity of a demoness, and her eyes shone with a poisonous light. Originally, her cold, deathly beauty was so cold that her transformation was astonishing. Why do you lie to me? Suddenly, with a shuffle of her feet, Tanya cried out, her fingers pointing straight at Gwyn's chest. We already know that you have the stone. Who else has the stone but you? Take off your mask. You don't know what you're talking about. Gwyn doesn't seem to be angry. Yes. It's the first time we've heard of the stone of Iris. We don't know anything about it. Marius also shouted. Tanya continued to glare at Gwyn, refusing to give Marius the benefit of the doubt that the beautiful young poet had been wronged. No matter how well you say it, you can't pull the wool over the eyes of the daughter of death. The first smile was a complete lie. The Ouija board in my room showed me your image this morning, so I told the gatekeeper to inform me at once if anyone in that shape passed through the gate and the scepter with which you sought out the Stone of Iris began to glow pale the moment you entered the gate. It is a sign that the Stone of Iris is within a radius of one tad of the staff, that is why I have come. Now, give it to me quickly. Of course, as the decree says, the reward will be as you wish. I don't understand you. Gwyn was not happy. If you're so suspicious, we can do a physical examination here, but there's not much there. I don't doubt it, it's rude. I know. Tanya stomped her foot again. Very well. Then come to the Temple of the Daughter of Death. I will examine you there. Wait a minute. That's not fair, that's not fair, that's not fair. Marius was on the point of saying, I'm sorry. Suddenly Gwyn drew herself up, and Marius leaped to his feet. At the next moment, as if rising from the depths of the earth, a group of soldiers in black cloaks with skulls plastered on them and masks with skulls on their faces surrounded the three of them with their lamps. What? You guys. Tanya says sternly. Wait for me. Daughter of Death. The captain, a man in a black cloak, said in a crusty voice. Alroth is longing to welcome you to the underworld. Even the daughters of death will not disobey the ruler of Zerudia. The ruler of Zerudia. Tanya's tone was harsh. You've forgotten who made that pig the ruler of Zlordia. I am Zlordia itself. I am the daughter of death, the one who stands over Alroth. It is Alroth who is looking for the stone of Iris, not the daughter of death. The captain was stubborn. The stone of Iris is of no use to that pig. It's for me. Oh, daughter of death, do not be afraid. In a firm voice the captain said and motioned for Gwyn and Marius to follow him. These two are coming to the Temple of the Daughter of Death. Tanya shouts violently. If you insist, I will give you the kiss of death. Suddenly there was a visible disturbance among the black-cloaked guards. Marius looked at Tanya's face and was startled. The silver and white face of the snow doll like girl had undergone a monstrous transformation. Her lips were raised in a half-moon shape and her eyes were glistening with a fierce glow. As if in a fever, her eyes took on a strange, wet glow, and an aura of obscenity emanated from them. Geez, Marius muttered again. This girl is a veritable monster. However good Marius was with women, this was not the girl he wanted. Tanya took a slow step forward. 
The guards fell back in panic, and the captain shouted, O oh, daughter of death, have mercy. You have come to Sarudia, I suppose, for the love of death. Tanya said, her lips lifting in a wild smile. But you're afraid of my kiss. There are no two forms of death. O oh, daughter of death, have mercy. The guards threw themselves down like grass in the wind, and cried aloud for mercy. Tanya chuckled. Gwyn slowly raised herself and stepped forward. I know not what the stone of Iris is, nor why the kiss of the daughter of death is so dear to me, but I fear it. Let it pass. He said this with the grace of one who has a right to give orders. They're just doing what they're told. I will not allow you to stand up to me. Tanya said, but her expression had returned to normal. The specter had faded. You speak like a man, masked warrior. Your name is... Gwyn. So, Gwyn, will you come with me to the Temple of the Daughter of Death? Or will you go to the Palace of Alroth? Please, sir. One of the guards held up his hands. If you don't take us, Alroth will kill us. Then you should die. For those who live in Zerudia, death is the best hope, rest and happiness. Daughter of Death. Enough. Gwyn said. Let us go to the Temple of Alroth. Death may be a hope sometimes but it does not come to us for such trifles. If Tanya needs us, we can tell Alroth and return there, or Tanya can come with us. You don't seem to know anything about Zlordia, Tanya said, but cocked her head and thought for a moment before nodding. Very well. I'll go to the underworld. I'll see how Alroth interrogates them in my presence. I know Alroth is afraid of my kiss. He calls himself the King of the Dead. It's strange, Marius thought. Every moment this Tanya, from a monster to an ordinary, beautiful, haughty girl, seemed to have a different face, like a rainbow changing, like the color of the sky changing on ice. The guards seemed to think it over, but they did not want to be frightened by Tanya again. They had no choice but to accept. They began to move slowly. Their black cloaks fluttered in the wind at once, creating sinister silhouettes. On a cedar tree a white-throated crow cawed. Tanya walked with slippery, noiseless steps outside the guards. In Zerudia, it seemed, they rarely used horses, except to pull coffins. Marius looked back somehow. Then he realized what had happened and was horrified. All this commotion has just been enacted before our eyes, and the feet of the guards have kicked off the cloaks of merchandise. And yet the merchants, seated on the rug, do not mend what has been kicked about, nor do they even turn their heads towards us, but remain huddled together like mud puppets, motionless. All curiosity, all vitality, was gone, and he was the very image of the living dead. Marius gently cut the sign of Janus. Then, as he halted to catch up with the black-robed group and Gwyn, he put his hand gently to his breast, as if to make sure that his skin was still warm. The palace of the underworld of Alroth, King of Zerudia, was a great grey palace with many towers, which the travellers saw when they looked down from the top of the valley and saw that it was situated solidly in the centre of the city. To the left and right of the building, a huge, windowless, tombstone-like square structure stood in a cluster, which gave a strange impression of ugliness. The palace itself was built in the style of the Middle Ages, in an opulent and orderly manner, but as they approached it, and as they were led into it by the soldiers, a gloomy and somber impression filled their minds, probably because the whole palace was built on the basis of grey, white and black, and the servants, the women, and the guards, who moved about noiselessly in the midst of it, were all clad in black, white, or grey. Only in the emblems and inlays on the doors, and in the women's accoutrements, was there the slightest glimmer of gold or silver, but no other colour was used at all. It is clear that this was done with the impression of a city selling death in mind. The regularly spaced columns which frame the corridors are carved with strange and unpleasant designs, and the floor on which they step is a mosaic of white and grey, white and black. The men of the palace, bowing their heads as they passed them, were sluggish and lifeless in their movements. The skulls and symbols of death on the breast of their cloaks made them look like a crowd of wanderers, longing for the eternal and unfulfilled salvation of Hades. The horse which Gwyn and his men had brought with them was tied up at the gate, and the soldiers led them round and round in a long, long corridor. 
As they passed them, they dodged noiselessly to either side, and when they saw Tanya following them, they stood still as if startled. The daughter of death seems to know the geography of the palace well. No one makes a sound of footsteps, which adds a great heaviness to this gloomy palace. Every man in the country wears soft leather sandals, and walks noiselessly, like a shadow, with dragging feet. Eventually they were shown into a spacious, comfortable, white and gray room. You can rest here for a while, the captain of the soldiers said in a ridiculously polite manner. I'll bring you some food and drink. If at all possible, I'd like something that's not dead man's food. Marius was about to make a remark, but Gwyn gave him a look and silenced him. Please come with us, daughter of death, to the audience chamber of Alroth, the captain says in a dreadful tone. At last Gwyn and Marius were alone, as Tanya went out with a mocking shrug of her chin, and the blue-faced peasant in the grey toga shut the door, which was inlaid in black and white, from the outside without making a sound. Ah, 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 ah. Immediately, Marius threw up his hands, stretched out and fell on the white couch to Vian. He shouts with a terrible frown in the direction of the closed door. No kidding. I felt as if I were a new dead man being taken into the underworld. I'm not afraid of death, but it's death as the kiss of the Aino, not death as this damnable, sluggish, rotten earth. That's enough. Let's get out of here as fast as we can, Gwyn. I'm choking. I'm going crazy. It's like I can't even speak at will. Aha! God of joy, Seria, goddess of beauty, Thoth, bringer of love, Akai, merry drunkard and singer, wake me up and revive my eternal dreams. I'll not have it, Gwyn, nor Zerudia, nor her king Alroth, nor that ice-clad beauty, daughter of death or whatever she is. Do not speak too loudly. Gwyn said softly. When you're as loud as you are, even the mummy in the next room won't be able to keep her eyes off you. Ha! Marius jumped down from the divan with his feet together and cut off the dragonfly with a brilliant turn. Because I'm alive. Look, my heart's beating, my blood's hot, my passion's burning, I love, I sing, I want to burn. Hey, I'm alive. This is a land of the dead. It's not for me. And for proof, there's the smell of the dead all over this town. It was just as Marius had said. The strange odor, a mixture of myrrh and putrid, perfumed and dusty, which had begun to assail their nostrils since they had entered Zerudia, was now pervading the air, and was beginning once more to irritate their noses, which had become accustomed to it. Well, don't make a fuss. Gwyn waved his hand noisily. But there's something I don't understand. No, there's too much I don't understand. There's something about this town. What is it? What is it? No, I'm talking about the Irish stone, for example. I don't know what it is or how it came to be, but it seems to have caught the attention of the rulers of Zerudia. Marius, do you have any idea what it might be? A lot, too. Just like you. Marius, with a gesture that made him sound more like a prodigal than a poet, flew backwards and landed in the divan. Maybe it's a piece of the moon iris, and whoever gets it will be able to raise all the dead in their graves. Perhaps Alroth has finally had enough of being king of Zerudia and has ambitions to take over the world with his army of zombie. Marius was just saying what he thought. That's probably about it. I was surprised when Gwyn unexpectedly nodded. That's pretty cool. I'm intrigued. I don't know why the daughter of death and the king of Zerudia are interested in us, but I'd like to meet the king, Alroth, if possible. And I'd like to get some more information about the Stone of Iris. Drunken. But that's not all. There are still too many things in Zerudia that were strange and incomprehensible, besides the Stone of Iris. For example, he was about to say something when Gwyn stopped him. Marius frowned, but was all the more surprised when, at the next moment, the door opened noiselessly and two maidservants entered, offering trays. Neither of them spoke a word until the farmer had silently placed the tray on the marble table, bowed, and left. On the tray was a jar of wine and a plate with slices of meat and stew for two people. It's got myrrh in it. That's what you find in the pyramids of Arcandros. 
Marius murmurs as he takes a sip. The liquor had a strange smell and a stinging, metallic taste. I hope this meat is not that of a freshly caught dead man. Marius picked up a slice of spiced meat and ate it. Even Tanya, the daughter of death herself, has her own misgivings. Gwyn continued to boil grain dumplings in the stew. That's it. She's definitely not the kind of girl you want to get close to. She never let me feel her approaching behind me. I've never let anyone, not even a master of martial arts, come near my back without first feeling it. It must be a ghost. Moreover, Gwyn seemed unconcerned by Marius's quips and was absorbed in her own thoughts. And I shall never forget the shudder that came over me when her hand suddenly touched my arm. It was like... I don't know how to describe it, like a dead man. She was cold as ice, limp and disgustingly dirty. I'd never seen anything like her. I've never been afraid of a woman in my life. Anyway, the only thing I know for sure is that I don't want to be here anymore. Isn't that right? Marius said and drank. I can't wait to get out of here and say, I don't give a shit about the iris stone, dot. If you'll let me. Gwyn murmured to him. Marius looked at him with a frown, and again the door opened noiselessly, and the captain came out with five or six men. Alroth is waiting for you, a crusty voice tells us. Gwyn and Marius stood silent and followed their lead. Marius looked at the long sword swinging at Gwyn's waist with reassurance. At any rate, there was no sign that he was going to take up his sword, so there was no risk of going straight to the torture chamber or the execution chamber. Again they passed through the same long, gloomy corridors as before. But the corridor was much more elaborately decorated than before, as if they were nearer the inner sanctum. Between the pillars were niches of black marble, in which were placed, one by one, curious statues. One by one they writhed in different poses, their mouths open in the agony of death. Their shining black heads gaze at them reproachfully. At the end of the corridor there was a large door. The meek man in front of the door rang a gong. The door opened and they were ushered into a large room with a high ceiling. The room was a beautiful contrast of black and white. Dozens of mummies lined the walls, looking down at the guests. Some of the mummies seemed to be alive, while others were brownish-black and exhausted. Beneath one of them stood Tanya in a white toga, which she had apparently worn under her black cloak with her arms folded across her chest and a look of mockery on her face. At the back of the room was a pillared room, raised one level. Gwyn and Marius stepped forward and stood facing the throne. What lay there was a horrible, hideous, limp, octopus-like thing. It was an unpleasant and horrible sight to behold. The figure of Alroth, ruler of Zerudia. At first sight, Marius turned his face away, so as not to show his silent disapproval. Gwyn stood there with a blank expression on her face and showed no expression whatsoever. But it would have required a great deal of courage and illusion even for a more tolerant critic than Marius to have looked upon the king of Zerudia, the ruler of the city of death, with such sympathy that he must have some merit, or to have thought that he had the air of a desirable and admirable champion. It would have required a great deal of courage and illusion. Alroth was undoubtedly a very unpleasant man. His stout, fat figure, no doubt too indulgent in its own indulgence in drink and debauchery, was too weak to even move freely, and he was a huge octopus, with layers and layers of flesh all over his body, supported by a large, bulky white cushion. It is lying as if it had been shot up. I don't know about the black, short toga-wearing torso, but at least the part of the body protruding from it is incessantly covered with greasy sweat, which the two slaves behind him take turns wiping off with a languid gesture. His head was bald and without a hair on it, so that his neck and the tears of flesh at the back of his head looked even more horrible and vexing. In front of him was a large table with a cup of myrrh and trays of soft food, which he ate and drank from incessantly, even while he was sweating and staring at us with his pig-like eyes. For a while the wretched king of Zerudia, the traveling warrior and the poet stood facing each other in silence, as if they were trying to guess each other's reaction. Then Alroth opened his mouth. Oh, stone warrior of Iris. We can't talk there. Come here and sit down. As well as his appearance, his voice was greasy and extremely offensive. 
but the men of his household immediately reacted. Several black-robed men led Gwyn and Marius to the throne, where they brought two divans. This appeared to be a very foolish ceremony, but perhaps it was a necessary procedure for Alrotha's audience. For, of the dozens of people in this large audience room, not one was seated except Alroth, and there was not a single chair or cushion to be found. It seemed to be the essence of the ritual of this audience, whether Alroth would offer a chair or not, and whether the guests would accept it or not, and when Gwyn and Marius accepted, and Divan took his place respectively, the atmosphere in the room visibly eased. Sake. Alroth commanded, and at once a table was set up at the armband of the divan, on which were placed a cup and a tray, for Zerudia and the King of Death doll. Alroth says in a gloomy voice, I'll give you a cup. The guests have no choice but to join in the chanting. The wine is as bitter as ever and stings the tongue. Well, now that we've made our acquaintance. By the way, stone warrior of Iris. Alroth still stretched out his limbs like an octopus, and looked at them with the sullen glint of a pig. At last, said he, someone has come into possession of the Stone of Iris, and all the ministers are in a great state of excitement. Now, what is that stone, and where can I find it, and what can I do with it? What is it that you want me to do, and what is it that I want you to do, and what is it that I want you to do? I want you to answer me. I've told you many times. Marius was about to speak, but Gwyn quickly stopped him. The stone of Iris is not here, said in an expressionless, precise tone. What it is and what it looks like is best known to Alroth. I am. A look of dismay flashed across Alroth's face. He was about to open his mouth to say something when. Ha! A sharp female voice interrupted it. It was Tanya. How should I know? You don't even know why you need the Stone of Iris. It's no use giving you the Stone of Iris, Pig of Zerudia. Tanya folded her arms across her chest, her mouth twisted arrogantly in a scowl. Daughter of Death, you seem to have forgotten that I am the ruler of Zerudia. Alroth is called a bastard. Don't forget. For it is nothing but the most terrible curse of the Daughter of Death. But you, Alroth, who do not know how to handle the Stone of Iris, will only bring misfortune to you. Zerudia if you give it to me. Withdraw your hand, Alroth, and praise the warrior of the Stone of Iris that the Daughter of Death invites you to her temple. It's not going to happen, Alroth replied in a pretentious manner. Marius noticed that, whether this was normal for the inhabitants of the strange city of Zerudia, or whether it was out of consideration for the two strangers, the exchange between Alroth and Tanya seemed to be one of fierce words, but in fact it did not even touch each other, but, in fact, they did not seem to have touched each other at all. They were somehow theatrical and dull. Their shouting at each other for power was like a scripted speech. Not only them, but all the inhabitants of the city, were somehow unreal and fake. The only thing that seemed even remotely real, Marius thought, was the horror of the guards when Tanya tried to give them the kiss of the daughter of death. O oh, daughter of death, mother goddess of Zerudia. More deliberately than before, Alroth fluttered the tips of his hands. I am the king of death and you are the daughter of death. We're like two opponents before the dole, so let's keep our little quarrels to ourselves. And don't you think it would be best if we joined hands to solve the mystery of the Stone of Iris? That's a nice thing to say. If you're so eager to hold hands, why don't you just kiss me right here and now? Tanya mocked him. Alrotha's skin, which was a sickly color from the alcohol, had turned pale to the top of his head. The daughter of death seems to be talking nonsense. He murmurs in his mouth. His voice has lost some of the deliberate dignity of before. Anyway, he sipped his drink and continued on his way. There is no doubt but that the Stone of Iris has now arrived here in Zerudia. We must, therefore, put aside our own affairs and make a feast of joy at this long-awaited day. Right Honorable Minister, have the greatest banquet in all of Zerudia prepared immediately in the other room. The man in black, who was standing under the mummy on the right of Alroth, bows his head and leaves in a hurry. It seems that in this room, apart from Tanya, no one other than Alroth is allowed to speak. You make a feast. 
I'll take the stone warrior of Iris to the temple, Tanya said, still refusing to give up. Alroth shakes his head slightly. Let the warriors look around this pride of Zerudia, the palace of death, until the banquet is ready, and then rest in the other room. At the banquet, at the height of the feast, the warriors will have the honor of bringing the stone of Iris to Zerudia in the presence of all the important men of Zerudia. Marius looked at Gwyn as if he wanted to say something. Marius looked at Gwyn as if he wanted to say something, but Gwyn's face remained stony and impassive, so he kept his mouth shut and looked around warily. As if he thought he had said all he needed to say, Alroth raised one hand slightly in a sign. Immediately, a dozen or so slaves rushed towards the divan in which Alroth was sitting, and lifted it up with their hands. When the curtain that had been covering the area was raised, it became clear that he was not sitting on a mere divan, but on a coffin-shaped palanquin. Alroth could neither move nor walk by himself. They stared at him as he disappeared through the open door, supported by his waddling slaves. I'll get the iris stone anyway, Tanya chuckled. But be warned, masked warrior, the true ruler of Zerudia is neither that pig nor me. And I know it, but that unsightly pig doesn't know it either. When he shows you the palace of death, be careful not to bring any thing there that has a life of its own in it. Otherwise, you will become like him. Alroth and Tanya held up her hand vaguely, pointing to the people standing around her, vaguely mummified, just like these pariahs. After resting for some time in a separate room, they were led by two black-robed peasants to the rear of the palace. Hey! Gwyn. But he could not refuse the offer, and Marius whispered to him as he walked, in a low voice, so that the peasants would not hear him. What did you think, that? Hmm. Gwyn replied as he strolled along, refusing to say what he thought. Thanks, but I think the best thing to do is to get out of here right now, by any means necessary. Hmm. Gwyn's answer is the same. Marius is somewhat impatient. Hey, you really ought to. It's not too late. I really don't think so. Was Gwyn's surprising reply. Marius looks at him in astonishment. There's probably no escaping it now. For some reason or other, we're already head over heels in the turmoil over Zerudia and the mysterious Iris Stone. Things are probably already in motion, unseen by us. It is better, therefore, to wait and see what happens, and to wait for the time to use the sword and cunning, than to make any sudden moves. I told you when we left the road that we would regret it. Marius said in desperation and walked briskly as if he were angry. Gwyn laughed at him. You'll have no regrets. You get to see rare things, eat good food, drink good wine. What else do you need? A poet is a complacent man. Marius was about to open his mouth to say something else. But then the peasants opened the cold black door and invited them into the palace of death, of Zerudia, and as soon as they saw the strange sight that lay before them, they forgot what they were going to say. It was, perhaps, a horrible and horrible spectacle that no poet could fail to be fascinated by. They were standing at the entrance to a huge, dark, square building. To be precise, it was the entrance to a balcony that ran around the middle of the building. The balcony ran along the four sides of the large square building, and was then crossed by a bridge from side to side in a figure of ten in the middle of the building. Under the bridge, I saw people working hard. The strange, peculiar Zerudian odor was suffocatingly strong as soon as I entered the building. It was a sweet, unbearable pungent odor, like a mixture of myrrh and death. As my eyes became accustomed to the darkness, I began to discern what the many people standing below were doing. The building was divided into several compartments, and at each compartment people were working in pairs, carrying something, winding something, or looking into a tank. We'll show you around. One of the men said in a husky voice, and led them down the stairs by the balcony to the workroom below. The Palace of Death is the proudest mummification center of the people of Zerudia. Only worldly princes, noblemen, famous warriors and heroes, and the richest men with the greatest fortunes have the honor of being mummified by the masters of the Palace of Death. Marius frowned as he listened to the guide's explanation. The Mummy Factory. Oh dear, I knew you'd probably say that. 
They were standing at what seemed to be the very first stage of the mummification process. There were a number of corpses, as if they had been dead for a short time, lying on the table and piled up, as if they were a mockery of the dignity of the dead. Among them were young women and old men of high moral character, but all of them, even the women, were bareheaded and without any underclothes, and I saw that several assistants were picking up the dead bodies one after another, removing their clothes and ornaments. There was an old man with a balding head, who seemed to be in a dour mood, and he was pacing between the tables like a demon from hell, and touching the belly of the corpse with his hand. At length he gave a command in a sharp voice, and having sent his assistants to pick out one of the corpses and carry it away, he began, with a cry like that of a monstrous bird, to cut into the side of the corpse with a large sword. Next to the old man, another assistant was silently washing the entrails of the disposed corpse with water containing myrrh. This way, nudged on, the two travelers turned away from the disgusting scene and went on. But soon they stopped in dismay. There was a huge water tank, so big that it reached the corridor over the head. In it, dozens of gutted corpses were gently floating in and out, enjoying a brief respite before their eternal sleep. The hair of women and men had turned white from the water, and their skin was as white as wax. The dead, their eyes wide open, looked through the water tank at the intruders and seemed to be pointing at them. Oh my God! Marius murmurs. When I see so many corpses, which have turned into objects, I feel that everything is useless and dull, that the line between life and death has lost its severity, and I feel as if I wanted to throw everything away and give up. Two craftsmen with shaved heads and only one underclothes, who had climbed up a ladder to the top of the tank, caught one of the corpses with a long hooked pole as if they were catching a fish in a cage, pulled it in and lifted it into the net. As soon as they saw the body, they threw it down with great vigor. Another assistant was already waiting below with a net to catch the body and carry it away. It was the corpse of a young girl who must have been very beautiful when she was alive. The two men at the top of the ladder carelessly poured the myrrh from a large gold jar into the tank and stirred it with a hooked pole as if it were wine. The corpses swayed and there was a cloud of smoke. They were pushed onwards. The partition next to them was engaged in a more gruesome task. There were dismembered heads and limbs strewn about. They were gluing feet to legless bodies, gluing heads to decapitated bodies, and gluing back together the cavity in the side of the body from which the head had been cut, after the removal of the entrails. Next to him, an assistant was wrapping a cloth around the body, which was white as if it had been washed. There were two kinds of mummies. One was covered with cloth and smeared with glue or rubber, and then smoked to finish it. The other was not covered with cloth, but dipped again in liquid, and then inscribed as it had been when it was alive. This probably depended on the price, the wishes of the deceased, or the desire of the people to preserve the image of the beauty or the king forever. Gradually the process of mummification seemed to come to an end. Around this time, the craftsmen began to work with more and more artistic hands. Some were dressing the naked mummies with glittering clothes and fastening ornaments around them. Others would paint the skin of female mummies with red and pink paint, add red to the lips, and green to the eyelids, so that the mummies would not have that strange sallow whiteness, and so that they would look as if they were alive. He would then step back and inspect the result. Countless coffins with their lids still open were hung up on the walls. The finished mummies were carried into them, those that could be carried out were carried out, and those that could not were laid out on the walls. A number of languid mummies, which looked as if they had been frozen from raw heads, gazed at them with downcast eyes. It was a sight that sent a chill down one's spine. Perhaps the saying is still true here. I'm sure that not only here, but all over the town there are mummies being made by the townspeople, where the dead are treated much more roughly and poorly. Marius tweets. This building must be one of those windowless buildings that stood on either side of the underworld palace. Gwyn was checking with his family. Yes. This is the death palace of the left wing, no windows, no entrance. Once the mummies enter, they live here, never to see the outside world again, except in special cases. Is the right wing death palace a similar mummification site? Gwyn asked casually. 
Suddenly he turned pale and began to shake and shake. It's. So all you were told to show me was the palace of death on the left. I see. Gwyn let him go easily. His eyes flashed for a moment, but they were quickly hidden, and Marius took no notice. That's all you've got here. In the basement, where the craftsmen live. That's when the farmer tried to tell him. To die is to live underground. Suddenly there came a lulling voice. The people looked up in dismay, and saw Tanya, fluttering her white toga above the corridor, looking down on them with her arms folded across her chest, like a strange queen in a dark and silent grave. To be alive is to be dead on earth. There is not so much of a gap between life and death as one might think, for they are twin brothers and sisters. I want to make it known to all those who fear death and hate it. That death is not a maggot or carrion, but a sweetness, a comfort that comes like love. This is where people are born for the second time. This is not a tomb, but a palace of birth. The mummies continue to work in silence. Marius looks up at them and wants to say something back, but he keeps his mouth shut. I love death. The dead talk to me. I would rather die than live. That's why you need the Stone of Iris. Gwyn's voice was deep and loud. Suddenly, the mummies stopped their work and turned their attention to Gwyn for the first time. But Tanya waved her hand and went straight back to her work. Tanya looks down at Gwyn with a cryptic smile. I'll tell you about it some other time, when I have to tell you about it by all means, maybe just the two of us, with a kiss on your lips and a hand around your neck. By the way, the party is ready. Alroth is waiting for you. For the glory of Zerudia. Alroth shouted from his mobile throne, his silver cup glittering in the torchlight as he held it in his sore, sallow hand. For the sake of Zerudia. The people chant in muffled voices. The feast is crowded with huge bonfires, slaves serving in between them, and noblemen in black togas on couches and dogs at their feet, waiting to be fed. But, Marius noticed, there was no real enthusiasm, no real pleasure, no real joy in the party. The people who filled the great hall with its huge columns looked more like those at a wake than at a welcome party, and they laughed and drank at Alrotha's command, as if they were puppets made of wax or mummies that had been breathed into. I don't like it. It was no wonder that the shy Marius murmured to himself. I don't like it at all. Nevertheless, from the outside, the banquet must have appeared to be impeccable, opulent and sumptuous. The slaves constantly passed around the cups of their guests, pouring strong liquor laced with myrrh. The other slaves took advantage of the intervals to bring in their delicacies, one after the other. There was a whole roasted black pig stuffed with stuffing, which was placed on an astonishingly huge tray and could only be lifted by five men. There is a fish deep-fried in a comb, and hundreds of them stuck in a mountain-like gaudy. Stuffed intestines, eggs of all kinds, mushrooms, pastries of various shapes and sizes, huge pies of deer meat in the shape of the Temple of Death, thick noodles cooked in hot, spicy and thick soup, fried breads of flour, mushy breads, soups, steamed food in the shape of huge Baltic birds, and all kinds of fruits. They sat on their couches with glazed eyes, and chewed, slurped and swallowed in silence the food on the plates which the slaves took for them, no matter how many times they were asked to do so, and never refused. Here and there their shining teeth chewed the flesh from the bones, tore the bread, and slurped up the juice. They ate and drank and ate and drank and ate and drank, as if they had no interest in talking to each other. There was something strange and unpleasant in their bestial greed. It was as if, like a sick man who is about to die and who has an unusual appetite, he has an appetite that makes the spectators turn their noses up at him, as if to say that he is somehow wanton, horrible, almost vile. Of course, Alroth sat on top of the people, serving them alone with his four slaves, eating and drinking with a devilish tastelessness that, even when discounted by his formidable size, was still too much. His shaved head and face were glistening, and the maidservant behind him was constantly wiping away his greasy sweat and blowing air with a fan. Alroth talked and laughed by himself, and seemed to be in a perfectly good mood. On the other side of him, in the second upper seat, sat Tanya, who, in contrast to Alroth, 
did not speak a word, but crossed her legs and sipped from a white bone cup, which had been specially made for her, the color of blood. She did not try to eat at all. Sometimes Alroth would tell a bad joke and the people would laugh out loud as if he had said, laugh. And then, as if he had been ordered, the people would laugh out loud at the same time. As if he had been told to laugh, and then, as if he had been told to stop, they all shut their mouths. Everything was theatrical. It was all very theatrical, all very nauseatingly bad clowning. Everything about this act was deliberate, and seemed to be done only to cover up the truth that lay beneath the skin of the real, hideous, maggoty corpse beneath the tombstone. But Marius, who was a little more sensitive, could not help noticing the stench of putrefaction which pervaded the whole affair, the incomprehensible and indescribably uncomfortable monkey business, and the stench of torpor and weariness. Marius, who was a little more nervous, chewed on a piece of vachaca fruit, irritated by the stench of putrefaction that pervaded the whole party, a stench that made people uncomfortable and unintelligibly uncomfortable. The only one who was excited, or so it seemed, was Alroth. He was drinking incessantly. Well, congratulations. Today is a special day when the stone of Iris comes to Slordia. Drink, drink, drink till your bellies burst. And again and again he said, I will show you my newest favorite, and sent for his servant to bring him a cart with a box of cloth on it. He took away the cloth and the box, and revealed the mummy of a young and beautiful girl, with black hair, dark eyes, and breasts full of jewels, smiling. The people erupted in laughter, as if the king had played some great joke on them. The new queen. Marius murmured, his chest heaving with anger. Indeed. That octopus king can't bear to share his mummified court with any living woman, no matter how old or ugly, who has red blood in her veins. He must have no choice but to make mummies and corpses his queens and mistresses and rub them in the night. This was an irresistibly disgusting thought to Marius. At last Marius gave up his patience and sprang from the couch, jumped up on the table and took off his back the old kithra, which he had never touched before, and held it in his arms. O oh, Alroth, I am a poet by profession. To thank you for your hospitality, I will give you a song to soothe your weariness. In his most elegant and aristocratic gesture, he shouted in a cheerful voice, I want to break the dense and theatrical odor that covers the banquet. He wanted at all costs to break the dense and theatrical odor which covered the banquet. Alroth screamed, and the people looked up at Marius with dazed eyes and blank expressions. Marius was good at that. At least, he thought, he had surprised them, and he did not notice the alarmed glances of Gwyn, who was looking up at his feet. A Hymn of Life A song to Janus, ruler of all life and love who always divides the darkness with his light and illuminates every inch of it. Marius shouted. Suddenly there was a hurried silence, but he paid no heed to it, and, striking the first beautiful chords, began to sing in a sonorous voice. He had much to boast of, and he was a fine singer. He used the Japanese strings with great skill, and his beautiful, taut voice seemed to awaken even the lover beneath the tombstone who had slept so long. He sang with a gentle, wet emotion, a lively passion, and even a touch of melancholy. His joyful voice penetrated to the very depths of the stone-built halls of the underworld palace, reverberating on the black and white mosaic walls, creating a strange echo. He was indeed a natural singer and player. Finally, with three refrains of the ode to Janus and the blessings he brings, the hall was silent as he struck the final chord. It was not, by any means, the silence of being moved by the mastery of Marius. When the reverberations of Marius's final voice died away, the people sat motionless, stiff and pale, as if they themselves had been transformed into statues, or into the hundreds of mummies that decorated the hall as well as the audience chamber and the corridors. There was something startling in the silence, a mixture of stern, snide menace and fear. The slaves stood still their eyes wide and white with fright, their hands over their mouths. The people stood motionless, and among them Marius, with an insolent smile on his face, with his feet on the table as if to challenge, and his kithera in his arms, stood like a beautiful, young incarnation of Orpheus, 
the legendary poet of genius who had moved even the kings of Hades. Suddenly, Tanya's high-pitched laughter rang out, shattering people's nerves. No. Alroth raised his hand. Then he began to clang, clang, clang the huge bracelet in his left hand against the cup in his right. Nay, it was well done. You've made me wish I was all Fiukus. Splendid. He again made a loud clanging noise, and the people suddenly relaxed, and as if he had given them a command, they raised their hands in unison and began to beat the tables with shouts of applause and praise. Marius walked down from the table, feeling rather uncomfortable, and poured a large cup of wine over the divan and drank it. What a bunch of bastards! In a loud, boisterous, vulgar shouting and ranting, murmuring as if spitting. They must all be zombies pretending to be alive, if they can't stop singing the hymns of life. We must give him something in return for his fine singing. Alroth was smiling and laughing like an idiot. I can't hear a thing. Silence. And then, all at once, the noise ceases. The slaves of the Black Clan may now show the guests the black spiders dance on the doll. Prepare yourselves at once. In the waxen silence the king continued. Soon afterwards a maidservant came to inform them that everything was ready. The stage was set up between the bonfires, right in the middle of the circle of hundreds of people in attendance. A large black-bodied drum was brought in, and before it a black-robed dwarf with unusually long arms and legs entered and sat down. The girls came in. There were less than twenty of them, all of them with their black hair tied up in a loose knot, their black underclothes tied around their necks, their breasts covered with silver breastplates, and wearing only ornaments. The girls posed at regular intervals, very slowly changing their poses and the positions of their arms and legs to the sound of the drummer's slow, monotonous beating of the drums. It was a strange and fantastic spectacle. There was no strenuous movement whatsoever, just a very slow movement, but it was strangely full of lasciviousness, decadence and a languid invitation that sent shivers down the spine. The black cloths of the maiden's garments fluttered about them with every flick of their arms and legs. When the dance is over and the girls are standing on their heads, Marius deliberately pressures the audience, who are applauding enthusiastically. Horror! Bravo! Horror! I shouted! Excellent! Awesome! Horror! This is a traditional dance that is supposed to be performed at the Festival of the Dolls in Arzurudia. Alroth was boastful in his explanation, but suddenly he thought of something and turned round, clapping his hands in amusement. Oh, yes. I'll show you another good show. Which of the girls do you think was the most beautiful and the best dancer? So you're going to let her sleep with the guests? That's not a bad idea, Marius murmured. His dark eyes shone with a lively, mischievous light. That's the boy, that's the third one from the left. Without hesitating, Marius shouted and pointed. The dull-eyed girl, slender but somehow more lively than the others, paled, put her hand to her mouth and stood still. You're the first dancer our guest has ever seen. What is his name? Alroth asked her, his eyes licking over her lithe frame. Me 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 Mina, Alroth. Very well. Then leave Mina, and all the other dancers go down. The girls fled from the place like a wave of ripples. The drummer, too, withdrew with his drum, leaving only Mina, pale and frightened, clutching her breast with both hands. Marius, looking at her with a secretly expectant and examining eye, finally realized why she had caught his eyes so much. In this city of dolls, gloomy, fake, with all the shades of unpleasant death, only this girl, Mina, has not yet been affected by the laziness and the smell of death that afflicts all other human beings. Her dull eyes were full of life and expression, and her breasts showed that her blood was hot and flowing. Mina was not particularly beautiful or noble, she looked more like a pretty girl, but compared with Tanya's beauty, which was drenched with the poison of her foul death and curse, she was as pleasing and innocent as a viper with a sickle on its neck and a pretty wild flower in front of it. So you've won the honor of being the first dancer of the night. He was satisfied with his daughter, but he wanted to make her happy, so he licked his lips. Very well. Then I'll give you your reward. You're going to die. Ha! Huh? Mina put her hands on her chest and staggered, but it was Marius who shouted. What a joke, that one. 
I've never made a joke in my life. Al Roth continues with a smug look on his face. This is the land of the dead, and those who dwell there are not Janus, the guardian of the living, but those who have sworn allegiance to Dole, the king of the dead. So what is it but the greatest joy and honor for all the people of Zerudia to be given death in the name of Dole? Death is my life, my joy, my bed of pleasure. Those who die in Zerudia will enjoy eternal joy in the kingdom of the dolls. All the people at the feast chanted in muffled tones. To die in the name of Dole, at any time, is the greatest mercy and virtue of Alroth. You have been chosen by the queen of this night to leave this life of impurity and be reborn in the joy of eternity. Alroth pointed his finger at his daughter. You may die here. Immediately your corpse will be entrusted here to the hands of Al Kane, the master mummy maker, who will perform the first aid in just a few moments. Then you will lie down on the floor of your guest and soothe his heart. Then, after I have given you the proper treatment so that you may live in death forever, I will add you to the ranks of my mistresses and make you stand in the hall. As you stand there in your dancing pose, you will add a breath of fresh youth to this display of my pride. Executioner, out. While the reverberations of Alrotha's cry were still lingering, a tall man, his whole body wrapped in a long black cloak, from head to foot, appeared, shimmering. This executioner's cloak was unpainted, and the car in which he drove carried a huge scorpion, a sword, and many other instruments of death. The executioner was about to put his hand on the sword. Alroth shook his head. No, don't do that. You mustn't hurt her skin. Stab her in the neck with a needle, choke her, or poison her. I give you the right to choose. Now choose. The executioner steps forward slowly. Only then did Mina's thin body seem to break free from its bonds. She looked about her with mad eyes, and wiped her hair with such force as to cover her paper-white face, and destroy the beautiful form of her hair. Oh, have mercy. Lord Alroth. In a muffled, terrified voice she cried out, wringing her hands and holding them out. Marius grinned. At least, he thought, there was one sane person in the city who did not want to die. Which death will you choose? A painful death, an instant death, or an unsightly death? Alroth grinned with delight. She looked round madly for help. Every face had a dirty, twisted smile on it. It was only when the feast began that the people were truly intrigued and moved. All the faces were filled with the expectation of pleasure with a thick fervor, and were turned towards the frightened figure of the girl. I don't want to die yet. You're breaking a Zerudian taboo. A sharp voice interrupted Mina's whispering. Mina threw herself on the floor, shaking. No, no, never. But I didn't do anything. I don't deserve to die. What a foolish girl, then, not to regard the gift of death as a special privilege. Another voice, but this one of a haughty woman, is thrown at Mina. Tanya is on her feet. Her lips are raised in a half-moon shape in a familiar, horrible smile. Then I'll give you the kiss of Tanya. What a lucky man you are to die with the kiss of the daughter of death. Oh, that's good. Alroth clapped his hands, and the others followed suit. Because, because, Mina screamed. She was half-crazed. Everyone who lives in Zerudia knows that the kiss of the daughter of death brings a man not to death, but to a horrible state in which he is neither alive nor dead. The daughter of death, the daughter of death, feeds on people's souls to maintain eternal longevity, and those who are kissed by her must be cursed forever, unable to die or live. No, 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 no. Please don't give me such a horrible fate. You don't know her. Well, daughter of death, you may kiss her. It's a sight to behold. The frenzy of his daughter seemed to make Alroth even more happy. He put his hand out to his daughter, who was pleading with him, and he decided. Seize her, O oh executioner, and bring her before the kiss of Tanya. The executioner bows his head in silence and stretches out his hand to his daughter. She screamed and fell to the ground. Then, with a mighty spring of his black hand, Marius sprang to his feet, with the body of his daughter firmly behind him. That's enough, you crazy bastards. A dignified voice cries out. 
Even if Slordia were a land of the dead, we would not drag to such a cruel fate one who still wants to live. First of all, if you're going to treat us, I'd much rather have the hot body of a living girl than the cold skin of a mummy. Now, get away from me, you monster. These last words were unintentionally hurled at Tanya, who was coming towards him with a silvery gleam in her eye. Tanya stopped dead in her tracks. There was an uncomfortable and oppressive silence. It was a silence darker, darker, darker and more malevolent than the one that had preceded Marius's singing of Janus's hymn a silence that seemed to want to come down on Marius, to hound him. Alrotha's pig-like little eyes lit up. Somebody get this man. This is the moment when I was about to say, O oh, merciful Alroth, ruler of Zerudia. The voice of Gwyn, calm and thick, rang out. Gwyn stood up slowly, stepped forward soothingly, patted Marius on the shoulder and pushed him backwards. His yellow eyes sparkled. Earlier, Alroth said, I brought the Stone of Iris to Zerudia. And I seem to remember that whoever brought the Stone of Iris to Zerudia would be rewarded with whatever he wished. Alroth, King of the Dead. If I were to ask you to make her wait a little longer for the joy of death, which she despises, I do not think it would be too much to ask. Oh, Gwyn. Marius shouted and was so moved that he almost hugged the leopard-headed warrior's shapely legs. Em, that's, that's true, but... Alroth was puzzled. The Stone of Iris. Tanya suddenly remembers and shouts. Of course I don't care about the life of this little girl, but, masked warrior, are you sure you want to make such a deal? You will regret it. Tanya's eyes twinkled and she pointed her finger at Gwyn. I don't care. Mm, -hmm, of course, if that's the case with the Daughter of Death, in exchange for the Iris Stone, of course, then where is the Iris Stone? Suddenly. Alroth coughs. Marius shrinks back with a start. It's not here. I couldn't carry it around with me. Calm down, Gwyn says. Anyway, I think I'll go and get it. Hmm. Alroth pondered. If you like, Alroth and the Daughter of Death themselves can come with a company. We're not far from the Great Gate of Zerudia. I see. This is when Alroth was about to say something. To Alroth, I say. A make-believe. Faintly evil voice came unexpectedly from the mouth of the cloaked executioner. What, executioner? I'm afraid you can't let these men out of the gate. Because. Because. They wish they could, but they cannot. They don't know where the stone of Iris is, or what it is. Maria's cries were drowned out by the following outbursts of ranting, cursing and uncontrollable clamor. So, so, is it true? Is it true, warrior? Alroth jumped up and down. It can't be. Because this morning Iris's wand. Tanya screamed. But it was. Yes. I don't know anything about the stone of Iris. As soon as Gwyn's words had been uttered, he was swept up in an uproar that grew more and more out of control. Gwyn. Gwyn, why? I was just going to say that I'm going to make a speech. Marius shouts in defense of Mina. These people, they're the ones who've got you down. Alroth is ranting. In the midst of all this talk of a day when the unruly zombies would wake up at once and rise up in their graves, Gwyn, however, not speaking a word, her topaz eyes gleaming bluntly, and not daring to draw her sword, was led away by the guards. Marius, shouting and mawing like a cat, and Mina, sobbing and half-fainting, followed. No one knew that Gwyn was working madly to solve a single mystery, not caring that he was being poked and prodded with a spear. The voice of heaven that accused him falsely, and made a mess of his plans. The owner of the voice, he knew well. And it was the voice of something that shouldn't be here. Why on earth? Why on earth did you do that, Gwyn? Even after the heavy doors had slammed behind them and the locks had been pulled down, and the guards had left, Marius's rage did not abate, but only increased. I was confident that I could have rounded up any of those guys with just a few words, if only you hadn't admitted it so openly, you still don't trust my abilities as a companion at all, do you? Isn't that right? Isn't that right, Gwyn? Gwyn made no reply, but sat down, leaning back against the wall and resting her body comfortably. Oh no. They'll kill me. 
I'm going to be mummified, and those nasty little bastards will have their way with me. Mina screamed with grief and ruffled her hair. The soldiers threw the three of them, Mina and the others, into the dungeon. The dungeon was hollowed out of the rock, and only the grease from the hollows in the rock provided a faint, gloomy light. Don't worry. As long as I'm with you, I won't let them kill and mummify a girl like you. Marius was well received. When he faced a girl, he changed his attitude. Mina, too, when Marius put his hand on her shoulder and soothed her, stopped sobbing and ruffling her hair, and looked up at this beautiful, gentle young man with adoring eyes. Will you help me? Twisting his hands together, he says appealingly. Will you help me, even if I am a wretched girl? It's a sin to mummify a pretty girl like you, Mina. I am Marius, the poet, and this man with the leopard mask. Gwyn the stone warrior of Iris. I know who you are. The whole town knows about you too. They're the strongest pair under the sun. So as long as we're with you, you'll never be able to touch us. Oh, my God, Marius. Mina clasped her hands together and, shaking and shouting, took Marius' hand and kissed it. Marius accepted it without embarrassment. But it's you who got us into this mess, Gwyn. Of course you've already got a way out of this prison and this damn country. There is no such thing. Marius was a little distracted by Gwyn's brusque admission. But I quickly changed my mind. Well, I guess I'll leave that one to you. By the way, he was so preoccupied with Mina that he forgot all about his earlier indignation. You're the first decent girl I've met here in Zlordia. You're nothing like that nasty Tanya. At least you know the power of life and you don't pretend that you're going to die happy and that death is joy. Were you born in Zerudia? No, not at all. Mina's lips pursed in disapproval. I hate it here. I was born in Rylos, a country town in Combe. My father was a wealthy merchant and a nobleman of the town. When my mother died and my younger brothers and sisters died in succession of a vanishing disease, my father was seized with a sickness of futility, folded up his shop, turned his wealth into gold, and took me with him on a pilgrimage to Zerudia. Having lost his mother, his sister and his only brother, he was so depressed that his only hope was to find happiness in the afterlife. Once in Zerudia, my father gave all his wealth to the underworld palace, and in return he was guaranteed happiness after death. A great many of the nobles and citizens of Zerudia, and those who were present at the feast, were pilgrims who were thinking only of death. He was allowed to visit the underworld palace, and for a while he devoted himself to learning about the afterlife, looking around at mummies, tombs and funerals, and thinking about death in a more familiar way. The fact that the only other people he met and talked to were people who, like me, had lost hope in life and were longing for death, made him even more anxious. One morning, less than a year after our arrival in Zerudia, I woke up to find that my father had quietly died during the night. Ha! Marius murmured, and only hastened to add that he did not know whether it had been brought about by the merciful hand of Alroth or by the natural death of a man who had begged for death. My father died and was mummified, to rest in the palace of death forever. I was not yet ready to die, and I wanted to leave Zlordia and make a life for myself, but an official of. Zlordia told me that I was already a citizen of Zlordia, and that, on the contrary on the contrary, he told me that my father had given him a pledge to let me die in Zlordia. I don't know whether this is true or not. I wrote many letters to Kumu, but they went unanswered, and I did not know whether they reached him or not. In the meantime, the money that was left for me was seized, and I was conscripted to the court as a slave and made to work as a dancer. This life was not so hard, and it was easy for me, because I was only training to dance, and all the people of Zerudia were so resigned to everything. But I hate Zerudia. I hate the people, I hate Alroth, I hate the daughter of death, I hate the palace of the dead, I hate the underworld, I hate everything. Because they're not alive. Living ghosts, wandering wraiths. They just linger like snakes, waiting their turn to die. There is no joy here, no real pleasure, no peace of mind. There are only horrors, paralyzed and dead hearts. 
how can people live in such a place with impunity? On the contrary, they long for this place, and they're wrong. That's why we don't want to lose the mummy wishers who come on pilgrimage to Zerudia, so we don't let them out. If you run, the Assassin's Guild will follow you. They're madmen. Sir Marius, I'll do anything. Just get me out of Zlordia. Of course I do. Marius made a bargain. Now that you've said that, we can't just leave you here. And anyway, we don't want to stay here any longer either. Glad to hear it, Sir Marius. Mina looks at him with longing eyes and puts her hand on Marius' chest. She grasps Marius' hand in an elongated grip, preventing him from pulling her away. I've got a few questions for you, Gwyn said sharply. Ha, huh, yes. Tell me all you know about the Stone of Iris. What? You haven't given up yet, the only thing left to do is to run away, that's all. Marius said disapprovingly. Gwyn asks again. Mina was frightened. Well, I don't know. It's really something that only the High and Mighty of the Underworld Palace and the Daughter of Death know about, but for a long time now, Zerudia has been sending people out and putting bounties on people for it, and it's said that Zerudia gets a lot of power when she gets it. I know nothing about it. So it's a closely guarded secret. Gwyn tweets. Now, tell me about the relationship between Alroth and Tanya. Tanya, the daughter of death, is neither the daughter nor the bloodline of Alroth, is she? Yes. It is rumored that Tanya, the daughter of death, is a mysterious witch who has lived much longer than Alroth, since the time of al Kathir, the legendary mummy maker. Alroth fears her and hates her, but he cannot touch Tanya or turn her against him. Because Tanya is, in a way, the symbol of Zerudia itself. Twice a year, Tanya plays a major role in the Festival of the Dolls. Usually she lives in the Palace of the Daughter of Death, roaming around Zerudia as she pleases, unbounded and unrestricted. No one dares to touch her, and all are terribly afraid of her uncanny power and her horrible kisses. Alroth will be king only as long as Tanya permits him to be. And it is Tanya, not Alroth, who chooses the next king. But Tanya herself is not a queen, nor is she a ruler. She has been given a special title and lives with a large number of female slaves. Is she a witch? Is she a priestess of Dole? Well, they say that in the palace of the daughter of death all sorts of foul magic is practiced, but no one has ever been able to see it. No one knows for sure why her kisses suck our souls or what happens to them. But everyone is terribly afraid. Everyone would rather have the executioner of Alroth than the kiss of Tanya. At least it's just death itself, simple as that. Just think of the humiliation that would follow. And the executioner. It's always different. There are probably dozens of enforcers, and they seem to take turns. They probably form the Assassin's Guild that is rumored to exist. Apart from the Assassin's Guild of Khotan and the poisonous woman of Katai, they are the best assassins in the world. I see. For a while, Gwyn seemed to be thinking about something. A little while later, I heard it again. The Palace of the Dead, the one on the left, is the home, the workshop and the exhibition hall of the mummies. Then what is the Death Palace on the right? Are there thousands and thousands of mummies lined up? Or, ah, oh. his daughter gave a low cry, which startled Marius, who looked into the darkness and tried to see her face. She clasps her shoulders with both hands, as if frightened, and backs away. She backs up against the wall, escaping Marius's touch, and lets out a mosquito-like cry. I don't know. I don't know anything. They say all sorts of horrible things about it, but I really don't know anything. The Palace of Death on the right is the secret palace of Zerudia. No one but Alroth and his entourage, and perhaps Tanya, the daughter of death, knows what goes on there and what horrible secrets are kept. Some say that there is a horrible experiment going on there, to raise mummies and turn them into the army of Zerudia, others say that it is not so, but that there is an ancient mummification in which a mage, al Kader, the first king of Zerudia, mummified himself. When al Kather, the first king of Zerudia, mummified himself, 
His skill was so great that he was almost divine, and he could not realize that he had died, and he wandered about without dying or living, and the people of Zerudia locked him up for fear of retribution. At any rate, the right palace of death is a sealed palace, and it is said that when it is opened, all the misfortunes and curses will fall upon Zerudia, and even upon the world itself, and the people of Zerudia fear the right palace of death as much as Tanya, the daughter of death. The people of Zerudia fear the right palace of death as much as Tanya the daughter of death. Even those who live in the palace of the underworld seldom approach it, and the townspeople rarely even mention its name. Tanya, the daughter of death, herself, her temple, and the enigmatic temple of the right death are as much an object of horror and awe to the people of Zerudia, who have forgotten the legitimate fear of death, as death itself is to the rest of the world. I see. Gwyn said, still lost in thought. That was a very interesting story, Mina. But I'm afraid it doesn't give us much of a clue as to what happened. Hey, Gwyn. Marius, in desperation, pulled on Gwyn's arm and tried to get her attention. At any rate, I must make this clear. All that Mina and I want at any rate is to get away from this Cerudia, from which life is a species. Neither I nor Mina have the slightest intention of uncovering the secrets of Zerudia, of releasing the plague of the Palace of Death, of finding out what the iris stone is and why it is needed. Don't forget this. If you've thought of a way to get out of this damn cell, tell me what it is and tell me what to do. I have no other hope. I've had enough of Zerudia, its rulers, and its symbols. He wavers like a woman. That's what they say about poets. Gwyn's voice had an ironic ring to it. Listen, Marius. Remember this. We can no longer afford to choose between the two. I don't know how you feel about that. There's only one way, only one way for me to get Mina out of Zlydia in one piece. That is, to reveal all the mysteries and secrets, the plots and machinations of Zerudia, to fight it, and to overcome it so as to escape its yoke. I have no other means, nor do I intend to have any other means. And I know that if we do not do so. That is to say, if we want to escape without any further involvement with Zerudia, Zerudia will no longer let us go, we will never be able to escape from Zerudia. That's what I'm saying. Listen, Marius, it was you who told me about the Guild of Assassins that has its roots in Zerudia. Are you now willing to flee this country and live in fear of the shadows and the sound of the wind, pursued by their black hands for the rest of your life? Zerudia is hiding a secret, and that secret is the Stone of Iris. And we've already been involved in the deepest part of Zerudia. You remember the way Tanya spoke to me when I first approached her. She assumed from the start that I had brought the Stone of Iris to Zerudia. And I gave her the reason. This morning, she said, the Ouija board revealed itself to me and the Staff of Iris glowed pale and bright. Perhaps it will give you some clue to my birth, to my lost memories. No, Marius, I have no intention of leaving Zlordia. On the contrary, I'm going to stay in Zlordia. And I'll reveal the secret of the Stone of Iris. I'll even grab that horrid Alroth by the neck if I have to. It was you who chose to be my companion, Marius. Then you no longer have the right to choose your path. All you have left to do is to fight with me, to fight and cut your way through, and hope to live. Do you understand me, Marius? Okay, okay, Marius shouted. His earlier eagerness was gone, and now a strange, exciting feeling of war was shining in his eyes. But he couldn't help but be mildly amused. I understand you very well. I understand all too well, so from now on I'm giving up the position of orator of the line to you. I've been under the impression that you're a wild beast with nothing but snarls and roars, but it seems to me that you're capable of eloquence that would rouse even a dead man. Henceforth I shall confine myself to entertaining people with my beautiful looks instead of my tongue. It's ridiculous, Gwyn said softly. Marius chuckled. At that moment, Mina, who had been listening silently and blindingly, interrupted. Um, what is it? Say it. At once Marius becomes cat-like. I don't know if this will help you, 
but I was trying to remember all the things I've seen and heard since I've been here. In the hope that it will give me a clue to the secret of Zerudia, and then I remembered something. I remembered something. It was when I went to the left death palace for ten days to watch my father die and his remains become mummies. That I heard a strange story, whispered to each other by the mummy makers. It was. Shoo. Suddenly, Gwyn gave a sharp warning, which startled Mina and she stopped talking. Someone's coming. Ha. Huh? But I don't hear anything, Marius was about to say. From outside, he could hear the quiet sound of a key being gently turned in the keyhole. The three men looked at each other and Mina was startled and grabbed Marius. A heavy iron door opens. There stood a sullen figure, holding a grease candle in a shell dish in his right hand. Black, with a long cloak that hung down to his feet, and a hood that covered his face. This was the figure of the executioner of the underworld palace. There was a prisoner suffering from rickets, who looked like a cowering spider, with a key in his hand. The executioner took the key from the ricket's hand, waved him back, and slowly, like a shadow, walked into the cell, closed the door behind him, and put the light on the floor. Mina cowered in fear as she leaned towards Marius. She must have thought that she was about to be taken to the torture chamber and mummified. Marius took Mina in his arms and glared at her, trying his best to be brave. But when he looked at Gwyn, Marius was astonished and turned his eyes away. Gwyn's eyes gleamed with mischief. He stood up and walked up to the tall executioner and took his hand carelessly and without fear. And he said, What's the matter with the wind? What kind of a joke is this, Isvan of Valachia, that you, who left me in Argos, should be here as an executioner? Chapter 3 The Maze of Darkness As soon as Gwyn called his name, the executioner fell back as if he were trying to escape from Gwyn's grasp. And then, to Marius and Mina's horror, a cheerful, mean-spirited chuckle begins to escape from under the hood. Then he raised his hand and, as if the languid, shadowy movements of earlier had been a lie, he flung back his hood with ease. There appeared the face of a young man with dark hair, dark eyes, sallow, drawn, somewhat long, but very youthful and full of life, like a naughty boy. His dark eyes shine with a twinkling and somehow unsteady light. His handsome face, however, is so happy and conceited that one cannot help being attracted by his roguish charm. I'd like to hear it from you, Gwyn, you filthy pig's arse of Alroth, you who are supposed to be going to Chironia, and here you are, pretending to be a stone warrior of Iris, playing a trick. This is Ishvan of Valachia, the red mercenary, whom I left behind when I left Argos to go to Salonia. Gwyn explained to Marius and Mina, who were rolling their eyes. This is Marius, the traveling poet. This one, you know, is Mina, the dancer. Hmm. Ishvan looked at Marius with an impassive stare. As a result, he decides that although he is almost his age and size, he is less muscular than he is and probably wouldn't be much use to him if he took up a sword, so he easily loses interest and turns to Gwyn, giving Mina only a glance. Marius immediately sensed this and snorted in annoyance. However, he was so intrigued by the outcome that he did not make such a loud noise as to provoke Istvan. How in the world did you end up in this shithole, Gwyn? I have a very simple story to tell. Istvan threw off his cloak, sat down and winked slyly at me. Since I was only four years old, I have eaten and survived by doing all sorts of work, some of it not so glorious, such as piracy in Corsair and smuggling stolen goods in Katai. These I did not do for a very long time, but they gave me a full knowledge of the affairs of the world behind the scenes. After we had parted ways in Argos, I pondered for a while what I should do now. It would be a long time before Paro would be at peace again, and besides, I did not feel that I belonged in such a noble court. Still, I went to Paro once, but for various reasons I ran away from there, and for the time being I thought I would do the old-fashioned pirate work. However, if I was going to be a pirate, it would be boring to be a plain sailor like I used to be. I thought I'd like to be the captain of a pirate ship. So, to get my own ship and make a quick buck, I went to my old mate and told him to find me the best and cheapest job with a sword. So it was the Assassin's Guild of Zerudia and the Executioners of Alroth. Scoundrel. 
Marius murmured in his mouth. Ishvan stared at the poet. You would think. But that's not the case. I don't think it'll do any harm to tell you everything you've been told through the secret hole, but the truth is, my friends are after the same thing as that wicked dead girl. The Stone of Iris. What is the Stone of Iris? It's a jewel. It's a jewel of immeasurable value, the greatest jewel in the world. No, maybe the Zerudians have a more sinister reason for looking for it. Bring the dead back to life or something. But for us, such foolish black magic is not important. What matters to us is that there's a foolish customer who'd pay as much for one of these stones as he would for a whole country. And so, having learned that Zerudia was offering a bounty for the Stone of Iris, and that word was getting out that it would soon be available, we turned ourselves into assassins and would-be mummies, and entered this ridiculous land of the dead. There must be a great many of them by now, Gwyn. Well, that's a new one for me, Gwyn said without expression. So Alroth has an axe to grind which, unbeknownst to him, could start chopping off its own head at any moment. I don't think they care about that. Because for them, dying is the joy, the happiness they've been waiting for. But let me tell you, Gwyn, when I put on this cloak and crept into the bedchamber of the noblemen who were waiting to die, and by the order of Alroth I was going to bring about the death for which they were waiting, nine out of ten of them would not have the pride of the inhabitants of the city of death, they clasped their hands and begged for life. And when I said to them, didn't you come to this city to die, they said. Yes, we did, but we didn't want to do it now. Well, it didn't make any difference to them that they had to die after all. Ishvin gave a nasty laugh. When they are dead, they will be standing in the mummy's room, looking like they have just died, and it will be a laugh. Marius noticed a small trembling in Mina, who was leaning towards him. I'm sorry, but I don't have time to waste with such talk. If you're an old friend of Gwyn's, I suggest you stop your chatter and get us out of Zerudia. Ishvan made no reply, but slowly turned his eyes on Marius as if he were a fool. But his eyes were wide as if frightened by something, and suddenly he put his mouth to Gwyn's ear. Hey, I don't care who you are, but this little guy reminds me of someone, don't you think he looks like those twins? I wish Linda and Remus were here, you know. Their eyes are different, their hair is different, but there's something about them. So you think so, too? Then it seems I'm not mistaken. Gwyn mutters to himself. Marius, holding Mina close, is listening. As if to distract him, Gwyn abruptly dropped the subject and told him briefly how she and Marius had come to be together. So, thanks to your kind help, we have been pulled out of the feast and put in here. I was waiting for him to finish his story. A kind offer of help. I don't know what kind of a joke that is, but anyway, now that you've condemned us to this rocky prison, your friend is going to help us. Marius ranted. Be quiet. Gwyn was quiet. I don't know how you feel about it, but Ishvan has undoubtedly rescued us from that banquet. As it happens, I mentioned the Stone of Iris in order to save Mina, but of course there is no such thing, and it would have been madness, as I have already told you, for us to have escaped and left Zerudia without it, as you say. Thanks to Ishvan's testimony that we were thieves, we were only thought to be common thieves looking for a prize. Otherwise we would have been tortured. It's you rather than me who should be tortured into confessing, Marius. What, what, on what basis? Marius is mortified. Mina hangs on to him, and pretend that you have lost all interest in him. By the way, Gwyn, Ishvan said. Anyway, it would look suspicious if we stayed here and talked. I'm supposed to be interrogating you now. Besides, we executioners are on duty every few days. It's a good thing I'm on duty tonight, but if an executioner shows up who isn't me or one of mine, I won't be able to help you much or take your side. So, Gwyn, I think the best thing for you to do is to get out of this prison as soon as possible. You'll hide me, Ishvin. No. Ishvin looked a little unwell. Understand, Gwyn. Anyway, I'm working with my people now. I assume the girl lives in Zlordia. Then she's got a friend or two. Marius looked back at Mina. 
Mina bit her lip and shook her head. We'll figure it out. Gwyn, you can do it. Ishvin said it very irresponsibly. Anyway, I'll show you the way out of this prison and the way through the palace that will allow you to get out as unobserved as possible. So you'll have to do the rest yourself. And, actually, after that, I'd like to ask you a favor, Gwyn. Maybe you don't need to look for any hiding places. I don't know why, but the girl of death is very attached to you. I told her you were a cheat, but she doesn't believe it. And she argued with Alroth and went back to her temple in a rage. So if you were to leave here and come and stay with her, I'm sure she'd be happy to welcome you. The Temple of Tanya. You mean you're going to walk into the hands of that monster who tried to kill Mina? No way, if you think we're going to do that. Marius' voice was hushed by Gwyn. What is it you want, Ishvin? Ishvin looked at him with shining eyes and said, Ishvin said briskly, her treasure house. This is not my idea. In fact, there is a hint that there is more than one iris stone, and that some of them may already be in Tanya's possession, Gwyn. I think it's Tanya who needs the iris stone, not Alroth. Maybe she's using it for some mysterious black magic. And since they say that they will buy any number of prizes offered to the whole world of Zerudia, at least some of them may already be in their possession. At first we guessed so, and went into Alroth's palace, but it turned out that Alroth had none in his possession, and that perhaps he did not even know what they really were. But the Temple of Tanya is guarded by the powerful Maidens of Death, who are under her command, and no one of Alroth's hands can get near it. This was our miscalculation. But you, you want me to get the Stone of Iris out of Tanya? I'm not saying that. I just need you to help me. But if you're going to do this I know your sword better than anyone. And don't be afraid of the Zerudian Assassin's Guild, Gwyn. Because although our group is not as big as the dreaded Brothers of the Mountain and Sisters of the Sea, we are still powerful enough to take on the Assassination Guilds of Zerudia, and on top of that, half of those guilds now have our people in their midst, boning them. And now half of the guilds have our people in them and we're boning them. Be careful, Ishtvin. Gwyn said in a meditative voice. You've been inside too many things, you know too much about too many dark things. It's all well and good to be a simple mercenary, but there will come a time when it will be the death of you. As for the matter at hand, I'll take care of it. You can hide me in the Temple of Tanya and find out what's really going on. Thank you. For the cold milk of a dead girl, you're still my partner, Gwyn. Ishvin looked sideways at Marius and shouted, Gwyn, Gwyn. Marius tries to complain about something. But. It's not like there's anything else we can do about it. Leave Gwyn alone. So, now, how did you get out of this cell? And where is the Temple of Tanya? And give me a sword and this poet the dagger. Of course, that's what I thought, and that's why I brought it here. Ishvin took the great sword from under his black cloak and handed it to Gwyn. But what use is a sword to this young Ophiuchus or his pupil? From the looks of it, the poet can only use his own sword, a sword made for women. What the? Gwyn stopped Marius from jumping up and down in a fit of rage, and with a teasing smile accepted the dagger which Ishvin had taken from his sword case and held out to him. Now, here's the key to this cell. I just gave the jailer a nasal spray and had him take a mold. And now, how do we get out of here? Ishvin bent down, lowered the lamp to the floor, and with it made a rough drawing on the stone floor with the point of his sword. This prison is in the building in the middle of the palace of the underworld, that is to say, in the lowest part of the basement of the main building between the right and left palaces of death. In the basement of the left palace, Along with the sleeping quarters of the mummies, there is a place for assassins, and from there a network of dark and disgusting underground passages has been laid out so that assassins can pass underground to any place in the palace except Alrotha's sleeping quarters. This is not confined to the palace, there are passages all over Zerudia, and Alroth lodges his guests who wish to die quickly in such houses. But this does not lead to the Temple of Tanya. It may be that some of them do, but no one knows. In the first place, we are only given a map to the room where we are to go tonight, 
at the last minute. Because Alroth is terribly afraid that the assassin will betray him. It seems that you have no choice but to go through this underground passage, Gwyn. It's impossible to get out of the palace without meeting someone on the way up. I'll bring you a black cloak later and when you're outside you can wear it and you won't be seen. But everyone in the palace is supposed to keep his face to himself, except assassins and those on such duties. I also don't know where you can finally get to the surface through this underground passage. At any rate, there is probably no one but Tanya who knows everything about this web of underground passages. There is a rumor that somewhere in these passages is a passage to Hades, the same passage that Ophius followed. Well, let's be careful not to slip. Ishvin looked sideways at Marius again. But at any rate, once we are on the ground, out in the open, we are on our own. The Temple of Tanya stands halfway across the city, across the street from the Underworld Palace, in the middle of the northern group of tombs. It's a disgusting structure, you'll recognize it because it's surrounded by tombs. Wherever you go above ground, in short, you must go to the northern edge. Then, to enter the underground passage, there must be entrances to it here and there in the basement of the main building where this prison is located. But unfortunately, I haven't done many missions using them, so the closest entrance I know of from here is the passage between the main hall and the left palace of the dead, where there is a lift-up lid on the floor between the third and fourth pillars from the front of the passage. So go there and then go into the tunnel. The way to get there is... Ishvin also drew a map. You got it, Gwyn. Oh. You'll figure it out. Good. Well, we can't drag this out any longer. We've already gone on dangerously long. I'll have three black cloaks and a candle brought to you at once. That's the signal for you to get out with the key. I'll tell my friends to keep the non-jailers at bay. How do we contact Tanya once we've entered her palace? Once a day a maid from the court goes to Tanya's to deliver this and that. When he does, he puts a note in a basket of boxwoods, you must do the same. Tanya regards boxwood as a sacred fruit and never eats it. She gives her blessing to the boxwood and sends it back. Then it's given to the assassins as a sacrament, one a day. It's a silly tradition. Boxwood is a fruit that is said to taste like human flesh. Gwyn muttered. But soon. Then go. Doesn't this subway lead to the right dead palace? Some of them may be. But I don't know. Even I, an assassin, have been warned to stay away from the right death palace. Ishvin stood up. Be careful, if you see a light in the tunnel, blow out the candle immediately. It's probably an assassin who's trying to pick off tonight's victims. It's tricky to bump into him, if he's not an assassin. I wouldn't want to think too much about that one, either. He smiled in an unpleasant way. Then he heard the sound of faint footsteps outside and quickly walked out through the gap in the door. The sound of the key in the lock sounded even louder than before. For a while, an alarming silence prevailed. After all the hushed chatter had ceased, the darkness and the silence seemed to deepen. Then Marius came to his senses and looked at Gwyn with a suspicious eye. Is he your friend, Gwyn? And even if he is, He's certainly not the kind of friend who makes you want to roast a black pig for Toto to thank him for being there. Because the story he brings, if you're stupid enough to take it seriously, will surely send us to hell a lot faster than Alrotha's executioner. Dear Marius. Mina gently takes Marius' hand. He said, he said that he went to bring it to the noblemen who were waiting for death by the order of Alroth. Oh, my father, my father. I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if he was your father's very own death. Dot. Marius said hatefully. He continued, pleasantly aware that Mina's trembling body was rubbing against him more and more. As soon as I saw him, I knew at once that he had come to bring us nothing but misery and trouble. A poet's intuition, if you will. He's a scoundrel to the bone, a cunning bastard, a bastard without a shred of integrity. He's cold blooded, brutal and he's willing to put his friends to death to get what he wants. To get close to him brings only misfortune, betrayal and death, and to give him your heart. Suddenly, 
Gwyn grabbed him hard by the arm and Marius shut his mouth. I remained silent and watched for any sign of life, and then I heard a noise outside the thick rock door, as if someone was shuffling about. Then the little looking glass, through which the food was brought into the prison, was crept open, and a sound was made, and through the little opening something like a piece of cloth was thrown to them, and immediately the looking glass was closed again in a rush. Quickly Gwyn slipped towards him and picked up what had been thrown to him and examined it. It contained three cloaks, some soft tallow candles wrapped in them, and a tinder stone. Gwyn handed the cloaks to his companions one by one. Both Marius and Mina were still somewhat uneasy, but they decided that it would be better for them to get out and think what they should do with themselves than to stay in this cell and talk about it, which would increase their chances of survival, without saying a word, he tied the cord of his cloak around his neck and squeezed it under his chin so that his face was covered. If at all possible, we should light the candles after entering the subway. It will last longer, Gwyn said, and put the candle and the tinderstone firmly into his belt. He looked at the door for a while, but when he heard no noise, he quickly inserted a duplicate key into the keyhole. With a heavy creak, the prison door slowly opened. Gwyn stood close to the door and looked cautiously from side to side. No one is here. Seeing this, Gwyn raises his hand to signal. In a panic, Marius and Mina, cloaked, crept out of the cell. Gwyn calmed down and closed the door, but after some thought he drew his great sword and smashed the keyhole with its hilt. He did not want to put Ishvin and his fellow jailers in a bad position if they found out that he had used a duplicate key. After tightening the door, which had been broken on the inside so that the lock could not be seen at first glance, Gwyn passed Marius and Mina, who were standing there with a worried look on their faces, and stood at the head of this small group. First to the left, go up the stairs at the end, then to the right. Then left again, Gwyn said in a low voice and walked on, paying close attention to his surroundings. It was an empty, dimly lit corridor, completely covered with stone walls, from which gilded candlesticks in the shape of arms protruded, casting a dim light. In the dark area in the middle of the light between the candlesticks, there were a number of filthy animals that scurried away at the sound of human footsteps. Gwyn walked unhurriedly, looking from side to side. Marius felt Mina's body tremble as she clung to his arm, and he put his hand on her shoulder. And so Gwyn, Marius and Mina set off on their adventure in the depths of Alrotha's palace. The three of them went along without making a sound, keeping themselves close to the dark wall, so that at any moment, if anyone appeared, they could retire into the darkness at once. It was extremely difficult. The floor of the corridor was cut out of the rock, and the heels of their sandals made a dull thud if they put their feet down carelessly, even for a moment. But Gwyn, like a leopard itself, stood at the head of the line without making a sound. Mina crouched behind Marius, and at the slightest sound of footsteps, she jumped and clung to him. Fortunately, there was no sign of life in the neighborhood, and they walked along a long corridor, through several rock doors, until they came to the end, sheltering from the light by the black cloak which they had wrapped around them. We could see a staircase leading up from a haphazardly opened entrance. It was even darker at the top. Wait! The hairs on the back of Gwyn's neck stood on end as he tried to step gently up the stairs. He quickly restrained them, hid himself against the wall and looked up at the top of the stairs, hiding himself in his cloak. To the astonishment of his unusually acute sense of smell and hearing, the Lord crossed the stairway at the top and disappeared without a trace, despite his nervousness as to whether he would come down. It was a peasant in a grey toga, with a small cantera in his hand, from which a little blue light flickered like a devil's fire as he led the way. For a moment, as he passed, Gwyn saw on the thin neck of the grey toga a face like a dead man's, with a face of earthy color, and eyes like fishes, thick and expressionless. They're the living dead, Gwyn murmured in his mouth. Then, seeing that he had gone, and that there was no sign of his following, he signaled quietly behind him, and went slowly and carefully up the stairs. At the top of the stairs, the walls were no longer bare of stone, but were covered with brocaded cloth and the floor was covered with fabric. But all the doors in the corridors were tightly shut, and there was no sign of human presence, nor of the bustle of activity that characterizes a palace. 
This is the second basement of the Underworld Palace. I wonder what it's used for. When Maria said this, his voice, which was only a whisper, rang out into the empty corridor, and the three fell silent in panic. Gwyn wrinkled his nose and thought for a moment, then leaned against the door of a nearby cocoon, looked inside for a moment, then pulled it open and peered in. But as soon as he had put them back together, he urged them on. What's the matter? Is someone there? Gwyn shook his head when Marius asked him, unable to contain his curiosity. It's better not to look. Mina, for one thing. What the? Inside was a mummy yard. There were about ten mummies laid out inside, covered in cobwebs, as if they were having a ball. Ugh. Marius had a terrible frown on his face. But by nature he is more curious than a cat. When he heard that, he gently pulled open the other door. And then I rushed to close it. Gwyn was right. There were two mummies playing baka in this room. They're sitting across the board from each other and there's a lot of mummies around them. Damn, what a bad taste. All the rooms on this floor are for mummies. Marius shuddered. It is also a very old mummy. Probably, in the beginning, when they mummified the corpse, they let it stand or sit in this room as it did in life. In the meantime, the number of mummies grew so large that it became impossible to keep them all, and everywhere, from the audience chamber to the left palace of the dead, there were mummies. Gwyn said softly, We don't want to stay here too long. Let's hurry. Not at all. Marius agreed wholeheartedly. Their steps quickened. In any case, with the carpet underneath, there was no need to worry about the sound of their footsteps. The corridor was long and narrow. On either side of it, there were regular doors of cochin inlaid with gold. But once they had seen what was in it, it seemed to them that from beyond the door came the voiceless cries for help of innumerable mummies, cobweb-covered, smiling with the hem of their dresses, picking up their baka pieces, and forever wandering with their fingers on the board, coagulated into lifelessness and eternity. It seemed to me that the screams for salvation of the countless mummies, who were forever wandering with their fingers on the board, picking up the pieces of the baka, were rising up in the air. That silent cry was hell itself. Oh Janice! The sensitive Marius couldn't help but groan. What kind of a fool would want to die like that? Even after death, instead of resting in peace, I should be covered with cobwebs and gloating. I'd much rather have my body reduced to ashes after my life is over. Zerudia is a scary place. Mina, still holding on to Marius, groaned. The feet of the three grew faster and faster, as if they were being chased by a horde of mummies that remained silent. At last, as if on a spree, they turned to the right and then to the left. The endless line of silent cocoon doors gave me a chilling shiver. As I ran along the labyrinthine corridors, where there was no sign of anyone alive, I felt like ranting and raving, as if I had wandered into a horrible land of death after all the living had died, and would never get out. But, Gwyn's raspy voice suddenly stopped our sweaty progress, which seemed to go on forever. Here it is. Indeed, if Istvan's map is correct, this is the door. At last they had come to the end of the corridor. Gwyn raised her hand and pointed to a small door at the end of the corridor. It was somewhat different from the other cochin doors that lined the corridor on either side. It was surrounded by strange runes and was not made of cocoon but of painted iron. Behind this door there must be a passage from the main hall to the left death palace. Gwyn said and pushed the door cautiously but without hesitation. The door creaked open heavily. Gwyn again stuck her nose out of the narrow opening in the door and watched him, but when he motioned to her to come behind him with a finger, she pulled down her black hood and slipped noiselessly out of the opening. To delay even a moment from this trusty leader was here to lead directly to death, or to something more terrible. Neither Marius nor Mina waited for his signal again, and without pausing they followed Gwyn's cloaked figure through the door. The door seemed to have a self-locking spring, which let them through and then closed noiselessly behind them. With their backs to the door, they looked around at the grim, silent corridor. It seems to me that we are moving in a direction that is increasingly unpleasant, Marius says in a throaty voice. There was not a soul in this corridor. 
Unlike the building beyond the door, this corridor was surrounded by bare rock, which was hollowed out and dripped with water that looked black. The candlesticks were far away, and the light was blocked and shadowed by thick columns of rock every few tad, which made the place look even darker and more ghastly. The air was chilled and stale, and the only sound that broke the silence was the dripping of the water. Gwyn began to walk cautiously down the corridor. He counted the thick columns on either side of him, one, two, and then stopped and knelt between the third and fourth rows. He told me there was a lift that led to a loophole here. He's good, but he's groping. There it is. He let out a roar and pulled on the thick iron ring that touched his hand. It was heavy, as if it were rusting. It's terribly heavy. Gwyn murmured, flung off his cloak, put his hands firmly on the ring, and stretched out his legs with all his might. Gradually, even in the dim light, I could see the tremendous twisting muscles of the rope building up all over his strong body. Gwyn, can't you get it? I'll help you. He doesn't even look at Marius when he calls out to him. Gwyn, no. Keep your mouth shut. Gwyn said, squeezing it out from between his clenched teeth, and he continued to wield the vidra. His upper body turned red and beads of sweat began to float down. Mina grasped Marius' arm as he watched. Trying to get rid of it, Marius also realized what Mina had seen. Gwyn. Gwyn, hurry up. Someone's coming, he whispered through his teeth. Out of the corner of his eye, Gwyn saw a dim light approaching from the far end of the row of columns in the aisle, but without saying a word, he continued with all his might. The rusty eyelids creaked slowly, but they were still coming up little by little. Gwyn drew in a horrible breath, and with a final effort, it finally slipped into his hand. In, Gwyn said, seeing out of the corner of his eye that the light was coming closer and closer, like a wandering devil's fire. By the time he thought of this, his body had already slipped easily into the hole. Mina and Marius looked at each other. In a panic Marius crawled in, stretched out his body and took Mina's hand and led her away. There was a ladder leading down to the bottom of the pit. Gwyn's great hand thrusts them downwards, and, switching places, quickly pulls the lids back down from the inside. As soon as the few lights coming in from the aisles had disappeared, they found themselves in the midst of a true darkness that seemed to have covered all their sight and hearing with black velvet, as if the words, night, and ball had been swept away. Stay, don't move. Gwyn didn't have to give the order. They held on tightly to the ladder, and even as they fumbled to cheer each other up, they stiffened in a panic that threatened to send them plummeting to the bottom of the earth. After what seemed like an eternity, there was a faint click, 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 and then the flame burst into flame. Gwyn held up the candle which he had taken such pains to light, and surveyed the scene. This is terrible. It's pitch black as far as the eye can see, murmuring. They put the candle at the bottom of the ladder and went down again, replacing Mina and the others, but soon. Oh, here's the end of the ladder. It's only twenty steps from there. Come down with care. I called out to him, holding up a light to brighten his feet a little. Marius and Mina went down step by step, groping with their feet towards the light, and when at last their feet touched the firm earth, they were filled with the thought of resurrection. They were now snuggled together under the candlelight of Gwyn's hand, and the little light shone boldly like the only hope in the world, against the darkness of the black candle which was about to overtake them. Apart from the light, it was a world of such blackness that one could literally pinch one's nose to see it. The range of the candlelight was so narrow that even the walls and ceilings on either side sank into black shadows, and all they could see was that the hard floor beneath their feet seemed to continue without any bumps or sinkholes for the next few tads. There is no sound when I listen. However, sometimes a cold damp wind brushes my face, so I know that the air is coming from somewhere. And the cool, watery air throughout suggested that, like the walls of the passage above the upper lid, the walls on either side were probably bare rock, into which groundwater was trickling. But even the curious Marius did not feel like touching the walls to examine them. The rocky walls, so cold and still, were covered with leeches and slugs, and seemed to be infested with them without any visitors. The idea of walking out into the darkness in any direction at all seemed to Marius to be absurd, 
horrible, and something he would rather avoid if possible. And this was deep beneath the black underworld in the magical city of Zludia, where mummification and burial were the professions. But if he lifted up his eyelids again and retraced his steps, he would only end up in a rocky dungeon. While Marius was hesitating, the leopard-headed warrior, who seemed to have no interest in the darkness, which reminded him of the ancient times, was very carelessly holding up a lamp to Mina, and doing something under it. Marius looked in. Then. You're to be the guardian. I'd like to light another candle for you to hold, but I don't know how long it will be, and then we'll have to use the candle as sparingly as possible. Well, let your minds I be at work. Gwyn said softly and lifted the object in her hand. It was a long piece of cord made by cutting the lower part of his cloak into thin strips and tying them together. He first tied it tightly round his own waist, and then tied the end of it round Mina's narrow waist and tied it again. At the other end he tried to tie Marius. Marius shouted out involuntarily, Hey! But the voice was not echoed or drowned out in the darkness, but rather muffled in a weird way, as if it had been sucked out of the room, so I panicked and whispered and mumbled. What a mess. The doll's sleep has been disturbed and she's turned over in anger. I just felt a terrible chill. Hey, Gwyn, are you sure you want to go out there in the dark with only a candle in your hand, not knowing what's out there or where it's gone? If you do, you're mad, Gwyn. Then what will you do? No, what were you going to do? Calmly, rather surprisingly, Gwyn asked him back. In the meantime he had not stopped, and now he went to the ladder and tied and pulled at it. We came here as Ishvan said, and we went out here as he said, so we can assume that there will be another way out as he said. We can't stay here forever, but of course we can take a few precautions. I will tie the end of this spool, which was also among the things Ishvan gave me, to this ladder. As long as this thread holds, at least we will always be able to come back here. In the legend, it was used by Ophius when he went to Hades. Marius muttered. But what happens when the string comes to an end, Gwyn? He's a hard man to get along with. Just like a woman. This was Gwyn's answer. Gwyn finished his preparations for the adventure, and once more he gave a light tug on the cord which bound them together, and on the thin thread which was their lifeline. Then he gave Mina the dagger. As soon as I shout that, cut this cord with this and run back here by the thread. You too, Marius. Good. It's too late for that. Marius grumbled. By this time Gwyn had already carefully stepped out, holding the candle high in one hand, threading it through his belt like a spool of thread as he walked, and leaving the other hand open so that it could be drawn over his sword at any moment. There is nothing to fear unnecessarily. You have heard what Ishvan said, the executioner of Alroth visits all of Zoldia at will along this slope. Therefore, this road has a proper exit and is not a nest of monsters. The executioners of Zludia are like demons or monsters themselves. I don't want to be in the company of them. Marius murmured, but after that he had to concentrate on keeping up without saying a word, for the cord was pulling at his body so hard. He realized that if by some mistake the cord were to come undone and he were left alone in the darkness, it would be a serious matter. Not only were their bodies tied tightly together with cords, but each of the three walked with his or her body pressed tightly against the other's hand or the edge of his or her garment. The fear of being separated had always been there, but more than that, the warmth of the body and the throbbing of the blood, pressed against the body of a living human being, eased the primitive instinctive fear and awe of this darkness, which was like the womb before birth. There was still no sound in the area. Only Gwyn's unusually acute sense of hearing could detect the occasional disturbing sound that broke the silence, a distant drip of water, the faint cry of a creature, the rustle of a bird's wings, or the dragging of a soft, heavy object. But he made no attempt to tell them, lest he should frighten his companions unnecessarily, but concentrated on drawing out his thread and securing his footing. Ishvin could scarcely tell him the geography of the passages, but Gwyn thought that from the map he had drawn of the palace and the streets of Zlodia, it would be best to take the road northwards. Several times they came to a fork or two, and each time Gwyn, with his characteristic, 
animal sense of direction, instantly decided which way to go. Whether he was right or not, only the yarn could tell, the spools were spooling, there was no one to talk to, and a long, terrible time seemed to pass just walking in this unborn darkness, which was the same everywhere. They wondered how much time had actually elapsed. Suddenly, a low but loud whisper from Mina stopped them in their tracks. That's it. I can see the lights. Reflexively Gwyn blew out the candle which he was holding, and at once the place was covered with darkness. After a while, Gwyn said in a muffled voice, I'm sorry, but I'm not sure what to do. Where are you? I don't see anything, but I'm sure. Hold on. In the darkness, Gwyn seemed to be searching urgently for something, and then he whispered. I thought I was feeling a little slow, but I wanted to make sure that the thread was cut. Marius and Mina caught their breath. It's coming on and on. Wait, let's turn on the light. There was a hint of Gwyn crouching down, a click, a click of the flint, and a spark. The next thing you know, you're in the middle of the night. The cord that bound Mina and Marius together was pulled violently. In the darkness there came a short, hot roar of the beast. Their ears were filled with the wild, terrific gasps of flesh against flesh. Something had crept in under the cover of darkness and was suddenly on Gwyn's doorstep. Kahea! Mina's mad scream pierced the darkness. Gwyn's short roar is heard. The bodies of Mina and Marius are pulled to the right and then to the left, like small boats in a mad wind. Ah! No, no! Cut the cord, cut the cord! Mina screams. Marius tries to reach for his sword but before he can do so his hand is twisted and he is dragged by the waist. In the darkness, the unseen assailant and Gwyn seem to be fighting furiously, jostling and grappling. The marauder does not utter a single word. There is not a ray of light in this underground passage, so you cannot see what it is, or even what kind of battle is being waged. The only sounds were the wheezing, the gnashing of bones, the tearing of cloth, and the sparks and metallic clang of Gwyn's sword against his opponents, which seemed to have finally come loose, conveying to the suddenly blinded pair the intensity and ferocity of the struggle. Marius groaned. He wanted to draw his sword and cut the cord, but with all these fighters at his mercy, he feared he might hurt himself or Mina if he dared. Of course, there was no way to help Gwyn in the dark. The short, ha 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 breaths became more and more ragged, and at first they were distinctly interlaced, Gwyn's and the Marauders, but gradually only one of them became louder and more urgent. It seemed that one of them was gaining the upper hand. Marius took Mina in his arms and, putting his fingers into the cord to loosen it as much as possible, he stood against the wall and watched for signs. If Gwyn had been defeated, it was they who would be next in the Marauders' clutches. They were at a loss for words. At length their ears were filled with the sound of a violent thud, the sound of steel cutting into flesh and digging into bone, and a short but horrible moan of despair, and the horrible sound of blood bubbling in the air. One or the other was put to death. There was a click, a click, a few pale sparks, and then, with a bang, the candle was lighted, while Marius and the others watched breathlessly. It was Gwyn's leopard head who took up the candle on the floor and sheathed the bloody sword. Gu Gwyn. Marius shouts in a muffled voice. Gwyn, no longer breathing, flicks the candle to the attacker he has just killed. At first, it seemed as if the darkness itself had come to life and was threatening people. For it was jet black and had no arms or legs, and lay on the dark ground like a huge mass of darkness. But it soon became apparent that it was black, like Gwyn and the others, and wore a long, black, hooded cloak that covered its entire body. Gwyn pulled off the hood and held a candle to his exposed face. What emerged was the face of a sturdy, stubborn-looking man, a fighter. He had dark hair, sallow skin and short, stiff hair held up with a copper band. You are the executioner of Alroth. You've just been ordered to carry out your duties. Was it this man who lit the lamp earlier, or the one who came up the passage? Gwyn muttered and searched the dead man's bosom. Gwyn's sword had pierced the man's left breast with great precision. A piece of parchment emerged from the chest of the bodyguard, still covered in blood. It had some kind of pattern on it, like a scrawl. 
Marius, his fears gone, turned his head to look at it. A map. Perhaps it shows the maze of paths that this man must follow to reach his destination. Shime, Marius said. Then follow the map. No, it is too early to think so. I don't know where this man was going, and I don't know where we are now, because of the fight we just had. Perhaps it was the assassin who cut the lifeline to the ladder. I don't know where he is, you say. Mina clapped her hands together and screamed. Oh, no. Then we'd have to wander round in circles in the dark and fall down with all our strength, or wander half madly in search of a way out until we found the one who wanted us to be in the dark. No one has said that it is the only way. If you are distraught and ranting, you may lure something else, another assassin or, as you call it, a wishful thinking in the dark. Gwyn said softly. Anyway, it's not good to be doing this. We have to go in one direction or the other. Marius, groping on the ground nearby, find the thread. Find out which way the thread goes, and if you go in the opposite direction, then at least you're going in the same direction as before. It's not here. Maybe it got lost in the rocks, or maybe it got kicked around in the fight. Why don't you try your spool, Gwyn? That's not how it happened. During the fight, the spool slipped off the belt. So, in short, from now on we have no choice but to walk somewhere and find a way out, without a spool and without any guarantee that we will be able to return to the lid in case of emergency. It would have been better if the assassin had not been killed and had been brought to justice. Gwyn shrugged his shoulders. In the flickering candlelight, his yellowish eyes glittered with some kind of admiring light. I would have done so if I could have, but the man's skill was so great, and he took me by surprise and in the darkness without light, that I had no time to take it easy or to try to catch him alive. I used to think that all the people of Zoldia were dying mummies, but it seems that Zoldia has its fair share of warriors, if only that man wasn't one of Ishvan's assassins. But in any case, it is very bold of him to wander about in the darkness alone, with only a map to guide him, and when he sees our lights, to turn them off and creep towards us. At least, whatever Alroth is, if there are still such warriors in the world, Zerudia, the land of the dead, is safe. They had to go out. At last the road became very difficult. It was not so difficult to follow in the dark, for if they had a candle and had overcome their inner fears, their footing was not so rough, and they could not see the approaching light. But now they had lost all sense of direction, and they did not know where in Zludia they were going, or whether they would be able to find their way to the surface, which they knew must be there at some time, or whether they would be able to get out of the maze successfully, their main task was to combat the fear that they would not be able to find their way out of the maze of darkness. They thought it would be better if monsters and unborn things came out of the darkness at intervals, and they had to fight them without a moment's rest, so that they would not have to think. They walked in silence, unable to speak. Their imaginations began to whirl and roar in the darkness, and they could not help picturing the horrible spectacle of a being more terrifying than any monster that ever existed in the world, creeping noiselessly from behind them, and about to put its horrible claws into their very bodies. He was about to put a horrible lock on their bodies. Several times they turned to the right, and many times they turned to the left, and many times they took the way of the three-way street, and they returned to it when they knew that it was a dead end. Whichever path they took, the other path they did not choose seemed to lead to life, hope and light, and the one they took seemed to be a roundabout path that would lead them forever to this darkness, and they knew that if they took the other path, it would lead them to regret. Gwyn, therefore, when he came to a crossroads, chose one side without a moment's hesitation, and gave the other two no time to hesitate. He knew very well that if he showed even the slightest sign of hesitation, the other two, who were of weaker mental capacity, would be immediately stirred up by their fraught nerves and would be in a state of panic. Everything rested on his shoulders. He was not even allowed the time to think and act carefully. Therefore, Gwyn did not say a word, and never let them know of his growing anxiety and impatience, but continued to walk on, and on, and on. He had a secret, urgent anxiety and suspicion that he could not tell them, he did not know how long he would be walking in this maze. But the long, 
thick tallow candle in his hand, which should have lasted at least three or four zangs or more, had somehow become so small that even his fist, clenching the silver paper-wrapped handle at the bottom of it, was beginning to feel the pressure of the flame. There were still two or three of the same candles in the case, but long before they exhausted them and became stranded in the darkness, they, especially Mina, would have exhausted all their strength and would be too weak to walk Gwyn dreaded the moment when someone would say to her, even in a whisper, that it was no longer possible, the moment when the tension in her heart, which she had managed to maintain as long as she had walked and moved her feet, grasping mechanically the hand of the one before her, would break with a snap and she would lose control. It is the moment when the tension of the mind, which is somehow maintained as long as he continues to walk and move his feet, breaks with a snap and becomes uncontrollable. And there's one more thing, Gwyn has a secret hunch. I hope the other two are too dim to notice, at the moment I don't think they are aware of the terrible implications of it. Under their stepping feet, the ground, little by little, but surely, is becoming a downhill slope for them, and they want to be sure that it will be a downhill slope for them, and they want to be sure that it will be a downhill slope for them. It is rumored that somewhere in these passages is a cave through which Ophiuchus followed his descent into Hades. Ishvan's voice comes to my ears. It seemed unlikely, but this is Zoldia, the city of death, where no one knows for sure what kind of strange things are going on. Or, indeed, it may not be surprising that in Zlydia, where the king of Hades, Dole, is worshipped and death is the main industry, there is a mysterious way through which the land of Hades is connected to the earth. But, at any rate, he told himself, the road might go up again in a little while, and he continued on his way. But, as if to make a mockery of his unreliable hope, the road kept going downhill. The slope was very gentle, and following a dark path with no clear view for a long time apparently brings about an inexplicable paralysis and a kind of half-awake, languid oblivion in the mind of the person going. Gwyn prayed that this paralysis would prevent them, and especially Mina, from noticing the descent. Marius, a man of many words, has fallen silent. The darkness seems to have acquired an almost material weight, a clear and soothing presence. It is not a piercing terror, as in the unquenchable horror of a nightmare one has had, as if the memory of one's mother's womb before birth had suddenly come back to life, but instead it has slowly turned into a jet-black wadding, oppressing, blackmailing and shrinking the intruder from all sides, it is a gloomy and horrible fear that seems to want to assimilate, digest, and leave no trace in the darkness. As they walk in silence, it seems to them that they have already lost all their senses, especially their hearing, and they are desperately tempted to close their ears in the hope of hearing some horrible noise, however horrible it may be. But the darkness is stubbornly silent, unwilling to give them any attention, unwilling to reveal itself, watching with bated breath as he passes by. I looked around nervously to see if it was the attacker again, but there was no sign of him, and then I realized that it was nothing but my own ragged breathing. He soon realizes that it was nothing but his own ragged breathing. Time, place, and existence have lost their meaning, and only the primordial darkness flutters, congeals, and I wish I could have been there. How long, once again, after silently groping along the gently downhill path? Arg! Suddenly, Mina's piercing scream made the other two jump in surprise. What's the matter, Mina? Something's coming. Marius comes up to him, breaking the silence. But. Oh, oh, no. No, 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 no. Please, get me out of here, get me out, get me out. No more darkness. If we go down this road we'll only end up in the land of the dolls. Oh, no, 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 please. If you won't let me out, just kill me, kill me. It was followed by a high-pitched, incomprehensible scream. It's here, at last. Gwyn clenched her fists tightly. Mina, Mina. Calm down, what's wrong with you? We're almost there, we're almost out of here, hang in there. Stay with me, stay with me. The whistling scream of Mina's mouth drowns out Marius' encouraging voice. Marius. Gwyn puts her hand on Marius' shoulder. Maybe not. You've done well, but you're only a woman. 
Her heart is weak and fragile. To walk through this maze of darkness with the fear that you may never leave is a terrible test for even the boldest warrior. Oh, no. Mina, Mina, come on. Don't you recognize me? Marius shouted, but soon. Oh, Gwyn. Help me, Mina. Mina, not paying any attention to the strings that held them together, suddenly tried to run in the dark. Marius was caught by the cord and fell down. He was so strong that he could not have been a woman. Mina. Gwyn's hands clasped Mina's waist. Then there was a dull thud, and suddenly Mina's scream was muffled. Gu, Gwyn. Did you kill him? Marius shouts in a trembling voice. No. Gwyn said shortly. It will be easier for Mina if I pass out until we can get out of here. But it's... it's no use. I'll carry him, and you keep an eye on things. So, but... Gwyn cut the cord around Mina's waist and reconnected him directly with Marius, leaving the candle standing on the ground. In the meantime, he left the candle on the ground. He set Mina down beside it. Wait a minute. The candle's about to burn out. Let's light a new one, Gwyn said and bent down to look for a cover. And, hiya, Marius made a sharp sound. Suddenly, a gust of wind blew into the empty subway and blew out the candle in Gwyn's lap. Immediately, the area is enveloped in the darkness of the unborn for the third time. Gwyn, something's wrong. Gwyn's voice had become so faint that she could not be heard. Stay close to me, Marius. Always be ready to draw your sword and support Mina. Aha. Uh -huh. But, what the hell? Shoo, something's getting closer. Gwyn left the candle untouched and stood against the wall in the darkness with Marius, who held the limp Mina in one hand, sheltered by his strong back. One hand grasped the hilt of the great sword tightly, and the yellow beast's eyes are narrowed like threads, hiding their dangerous gleam. They waited, holding their breath. There was something, a faint presence, a presence that would have been impossible to perceive if it had not been for people with senses as acute as those of Gwyn and Marius, that was slowly approaching. Slowly, very slowly, as if something heavy were being dragged. Faint, faint rustling of a cloth or something. And, eventually, a pale blue halo of light. It is a cold pale circle, as if it were a light with no heat at all, floating in the darkness like a drop of milky jelly. Gwyn. Marius's hand squeezed Gwyn's shoulder. Gwyn didn't even look back. His fist clutched the hilt of his great sword in the darkness, his eyes were wide and piercing. Gwyn's rope-like muscles, which had been touched by Marius's hand, were taut and tense, as if they were about to snap. The short, stiff hairs on the back of Gwyn's neck stand on edge, and Marius touches his arm. Just when he thought that Gwyn was frightened, Marius suddenly felt a panic as if cold water had been thrown on his whole body. I wish I could have been there when he came round the corner. Oh. Gwyn and Marius gasped as their bodies plunged into the soaking wet walls of the rock, rubbing themselves against them as if they wished they could turn into rock. A strange trance, as if they had been tied up, seized them and turned their whole body into a water of fear and disbelief, unable to believe what they saw. Their brains are numbed, and their eyes are frozen with astonishment. Their hair stands on end, and fear flows slowly back from the tips of their limbs, as if it were creeping slowly up to their hearts. Their tongues turn to moss, and their limbs seem to be slowly melting away. Their screams caught in their throats and their moans were frozen in eternity. Pale, sinister, soggy and jelly-like, in a strange ring of heatless light, like a jellyfish or something faintly white in the water, I wish I could stand still in that light. Slowly, slowly, with a pattering sound, dragging their feet, they approached the rocky cliffs on which they were clinging. It was the one and only Kanoi, infinitely old and already decayed in all his flesh. A tall, obviously male mummy, the cloth wrapped around its body has long since been worn away and most of it torn, and the ancient, aged flesh, muscle and bone hidden beneath it is bared for the insects to devour. Two dark eye sockets are open, staring into the darkness. On his bald, all hairless head is a band of copper, for Talgol's wide, very elaborately engraved, wrapped in a very shiny manner. 
His bony, shriveled hands are folded at his chest, and above his chiseled sternum hangs a large copper ornament, apparently composed of intricate runes, suspended from his neck by a thick chain. At the bottom of his rib cage, something like red fire glittered. They were startled, but the next moment they were still frozen in astonishment. A rustling sound came from between the torn pieces of cloth. The red fire-like substance turned out to be nothing more than a live mouse nesting in the mummy's chest. No matter from where or how you look at it, there is no way that this hideous and horrible object can live and move. But the reality is that the legs, battered and bruised, with their bones and old ligaments exposed, are slowly and languidly lifted and lowered to the ground in turn. And the squeaking of the rats in their ears. With a swoosh, Marius swallowed down the sour in his mouth. Both of their bodies twitched simultaneously. What would happen if this awful, awful, awful wish were to find out about us and try to get us? Will a sword wielded by a living hand have any effect on that horrible, worm-bitten, wretched wreck of a body that seems to defy human dignity? No, even if it did work, that huge mass of rags would turn round with its strange, slow, nauseating movements and look at them with downcast eyes and then stretch out its bony hands and try to come towards them in a dazed manner. The mere thought of this is enough to tear their courage from them. Even the bravest man, who is not the least bit afraid to face any crisis with his heart on his sleeve, when confronted with such a loathsome aversion, can only barely hold back his body's instinctive reaction to run away from it before his hair stands on end and his will to fight is gone. It would have been the best I could do. Marius could not bear it and tried to let out a feeble scream of terror. At once Gwyn's hand went round his mouth and clamped down, stifling his scream. The horrible creature did not notice or pay any attention to the warm flesh and blood clinging to the hollow of the rock, holding its breath. Slowly, slowly, with no change in its sluggish gait, it approached them, clumsily, like a wooden doll that had been mistakenly given a false life, and, without looking back into their numb eyes, it continued on its way. They smelled a strange nasal scent of myrrh, and at the same time they smelled the stench of rats, the dust of infinite years, and a kind of nauseating, unforgettable, sweet, rotten flowery stench, which can only be described as the stench of death itself. A pale, wispy halo approached them, almost skimming the edge of their garments. In the numbness, the feeling of being unable to wake up from a nightmare, Marius faintly realized that this light did not come from the lamp or candle that the mummy was holding, and that it did not serve as a guide. It was not even hot like the everlasting light of the world. It seemed to be the rotting flesh of the mummy itself that gave off the light, and there was a dim coldness in the blue light, like phosphorescence. No longer could I look closely into the mummy's hollow eye sockets and even see the disgusting little white worms nestled within them. These maggoty worms, when they looked closely at the mummies, were crawling in myriads among their ligaments and muscular remnants, and among their cracked bones, and they made their whole bodies tremble with horror. They heard the rustling of the torn cloth against each other. The little heads of the rats peeped out of the little windows in their ribs, and their little red fiery eyes stared at them with inhuman hatred. But the mummy did not even look back. I'm going to. Flop, flop, flop. While the mummies passed in front of the hollow in the rock where they were hiding, with the inexpressible sound of their footsteps dragging the soft carrion that had not changed a bit, in a state of paralysis that seemed like an eternity, the two heroes just kept looking into the open sockets of the living, death, that froze their bodies. They were paralyzed. Yeah. It was not until he was sure that the blue light was fading away that Marius finally wriggled his tongue, which was now stuck to his jaw and squeezed out a muffled voice. Yeah. Janice, Janice, have mercy, have mercy. He lifted his trembling hand and tried to cut the Janice sign. But the numbness of his body, as if the paralysis had not yet completely passed, prevented him from moving it as he wished. Marius suddenly jumped up and down with an inarticulate cry. He had completely forgotten about Mina, the dancer whom he was holding in one arm. Mina's fainting body slipped down to the ground as Marius withdrew his hand. Marius groaned and weakly repeated the Janus sign with a wagging finger. It was the only thing that could keep him sane, the only thing that could keep him from losing his mind. Gwyn, what the hell, 
bats. But Marius' resilience was such that he volunteered to be Gwyn's partner and biographer. When he had said this, after several spiteful swallows, Marius was apparently able to speak. Don't ask me. Gwyn groans. I wouldn't be unhappy at all if I'd never seen or heard of such a living mummy. The headband you were wearing seemed to belong to a guild of the highest order of mages. Also, the runes on that chest pendant are. Hmm, that's disgusting. Gwyn muttered. You've been staring at that monster while you've been shivering. I'm beginning to think you might be a man I could trust, poet. The rune that represents poet originally meant one who sees. Marius was not surprised, he had already almost forgotten how horrified and frightened he had been. But. All right, I won't light the fire, so grab my belt from behind. I can see a little better at night. Gwyn told me, grumbling. I have to go. Oh. If you stray too far, you'll lose them. Ew. Marius jumped up this time. What the hell, no way. I'll tail that mummy. Gwyn is quite calm. It's the first clue to the real mystery that Zerudia has revealed. There's no way to miss it. If we follow it, we may find something. No kidding. His opposition was somewhat feeble. Marius languidly cut the sign of Janus. I don't want to see that again, not while I'm alive. First of all, Mina's going to be, and how am I going to be able to carry an unconscious Mina and chase him? Marius suddenly became aware of something. He crouched down and fumbled about furiously. Gwyn Mina is not here. He makes a muffled sound. At the sound of this, Gwyn bends down and gropes his way to a point well away from Marius' feet. Chi, I noticed it and called it. No. No. Gwyn's voice was heavy. I have taken a very tight hold of myself so that I may not easily come back to life. First of all, even if he did come back to life and escaped, he would not have had the presence of mind to be able to eliminate all the footsteps and signs, and I would not have been able to overhear such signs by any ordinary means. Gwyn violently controlled Marius with his hand. They listened for a while in a tense, hushed silence. Suddenly Marius drew in a breath and became quiet again. Somewhere in the aisle, not too far away, there was a faint noise. Thud, the sound of a heavy, soft sack of flour, or a lump of meat, being slowly dragged along, and then suddenly released, as if it had fallen to the ground. The dragging sound was completely different in nature from the mummy's footsteps, and there was no way to disguise it. And, soon, as they are frozen in their ears, they hear a new horrible sound. The sound of tearing, crushing, or smashing something. Sound as of sipping at a liquid, or as of biting and chewing crunchy flesh with pointed teeth. Crunching, crunching, crunching sound. Satisfying grunting sound, as if slurping up something again. With an inarticulate scream, Marius' shoulders were caught in a vice-like hand. He would have passed out and died before he regained consciousness. He wouldn't have suffered much. Gwyn whispered in a hushed voice. Marius shuddered in the darkness, groaned violently and covered his ears with his hands to prevent himself from hearing the horrible noise that was still coming. The noise became more and more distant and eventually disappeared. All that remains is the horrible oppressive feeling of darkness and silence. Gwyn shook her head as if to shake something off her head, then reached out for Marius' hand and grabbed his belt, using the lump of cord to tie him and her together tightly. With the sword now unsheathed in his hand, he turned and walked away. Marius did not disobey. He was dazed and helpless, as if he had been stunned by a continual shock. When Gwyn moved to the right, he moved to the right, when she stopped, he stopped. His eyes were blank in the darkness. Gwyn left him to it and followed the path the mummy had taken at a very fast pace. In fact, the mummy's steps were very slow, and after it had passed, there was a slimy, pale streak, like the crawl of a disgusting slug or leech, which only Gwyn's special sense of smell and sight could have revealed. It was not very difficult to trace them, for they were covered with slimy, faintly pale streaks, like the crawling of a nasty slug or leech. Soon they saw in their path a halo of pale phosphorescence, and within it a hideous, boozing monster. Gwyn slowed down, took his sword in his hand, and, hiding himself against the wall, 
looked about five tads behind the mummy. The mummy continues to move forward with the same jerky gait as a fake doll. With each unsteady step, as if its unseeing eyes could only see the command to go forward, the countless disgusting white maggots that clogged its body made a horrible buzzing sound. Suddenly Gwyn noticed that the ground beneath his feet, as he ran blindly in the darkness under the mummy's spell, had turned into something strangely soft and oozing with water when he stepped on it, as if it were a swamp. At last Gwyn's steps become more deliberate, while Marius, who grasps his belt and walks on Gwyn's leash, walks mechanically, as if in a daze, paying no attention to the changes in his step, nor to the pale, glowing mummies that sway in front of him, like the shape of a nightmare itself. They walked mechanically as if in a daze. How long did it take me to follow the mummy blindly? The mummy's steps came to a halt as if it had been ordered to stop. Gwyn stops dead in her tracks and leans back against the wall. The front of the mummy is white again. Is this the exit to the maze? Gwyn tensed and held Marius by the back of his hand as he bumped into his back. Then he stretched out his head to see what was going on. I gasped. There is. The ceiling and the four walls are much higher and wider than the surrounding area, like a square. In the middle of it there appeared to be a strange altar-like structure. On closer inspection, it is not so, it is just a whitish flat rock protruding from the ground, just like an altar. At each end of the rock altar were two pointed rocks, like candlesticks, with four candles lit on them, just like candlesticks. Only one part of the building was illuminated by the light. By the light, I could see from the ceiling and walls of the high rock, countless stalactites of strange and somewhat disgusting shapes, hanging and protruding like a horrible rug. It was a limestone cave. And on that altar, on that natural platform, a figure was standing there. He holds out his hands and waves them slowly as if inviting something to come. Her eyes are closed, her lips are chanting ominous words, her bare chest is heaving. Her long silver hair, which had been wrapped around her like a kumu, has been combed back, and she is naked, except for a few strands of it which are trailing down to her feet. His skin was as white as the surrounding stalactites, as the belly of a frog, as lustrous and deadly white, and though his figure was well-proportioned and beautiful, there was something inexplicably horrible about it, something like the stench of decay, something lewd and unbearably evil. It was Tanya, the daughter of death. When she flashed the pointed claws of her hands and beckoned with a flick of her fingers, the mummy who stood before her trembled and shuddered, and stepped forward jerkily, as if in futile defiance of her fate. When she flung her palms downward several times, the mummy fell awkwardly flat. Gwyn noticed that Tanya was in a kind of hypnotic state. Her eyes remained closed. Her white breasts rippled as if she were dying, and then, slowly, from her mouth came a croaking voice not like the one she had heard before, but as if she were an infinitely old woman. al you who are buried in darkness, you who are prevented from sleeping forever and ever, you who are called to me, you who are the people of the past. Yes. Nah. It was not until a little later that there came from the mummy's mouth a horrible, difficult, scabrous wagging of the tongue. I am called by. Thou, who art come. I. M. al the wise man who came back from Hades to follow me. As if she hadn't heard him, Tanya repeated herself. I have a question to ask thee. al We. Are. Not. To follow you. The mummy repeated it stubbornly. I'm. Seeking. Sleep again. Answer my question, al -Kather. Answer me, al -Kather and the sleep of Hades will be yours again. al my question is about the Stone of Iris. She was about to say something when Tanya's voice suddenly broke. Her naked body went stiff and rigid. Something had disturbed her trance. A faint cry escaped from Tanya's mouth, and her body fell down like an overturned statue. For a moment she lay motionless as if dead. Eventually, his chest began to rise and fall slowly, his arms and legs twitched, and finally his eyes fluttered open and fluttered several times. Suddenly, the daughter of death regains all her energy and rises slowly to her feet. As she raised herself, as if in agony, her mouth was full of obscenities that even the worst whore could not utter. 
Who the hell is it that's been messing with my mind? I'm about to end up in a hellhole of leeches from which I'll never return. Ha, ha. Tanya opened her eyes, cast a cold glance at the prostrate mummy, and then looked past it to Gwyn, and behind her at the dazed, blank-eyed Marius. His eyes suddenly narrowed, as if he were somewhat softened, or trying to appear so. Oh, it's you, the leopard-headed warrior. If you'd just told me, I could have shown you some hospitality, but you just walked in here. After that, he suddenly stopped talking and started laughing. So you not only managed to escape the dungeons of the fat Alroth, but you also managed to make it through the maze of Dole to the basement of Tanya's temple. By relying on Tanya. Well, what a welcome guest, did you come all the way here to Tanya to get the Stone of Iris? Then I could have roused this disgusting mummy from her thousands of years of slumber and not risked my last remaining soul. Come on, Gwyn, where's the Iris Stone? About that, Tanya. Gwyn proceeded calmly. There was a strange sense of weakness, as if something had suddenly slipped out of the air around him. It was no different from the ominous, foreboding, foul-smelling, horrible things that were already in the air, but there was already that definitive, soul-perpetuating chill of death in the air. The mummy, crouched between the two confronting them, its body folded up like an awkward doll, did not move a muscle as if it had already used up all the false life that had been breathed into it earlier. It had turned into a mere object. The cloth on its chest fluttered, but this was only the movement of a mouse nesting in its chest. As much as I would like to offer you a deal. If I could give you the Stone of Iris in exchange for what I want out of Zerudia, I would be very grateful. But there's no point in spying on the Daughter of Death, so I'll tell you. I don't know what the Stone of Iris is. No. 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 Tanya's reaction was swift. That's why you tried to deceive me. Look, Gwyn, the staff of Iris in my room shone this morning to announce the coming of the Stone of Iris. And then you came through the Great Gate. I knew at once you were the messenger of the Stone of Iris. I know you. You can't lie to me. That's what I don't understand. Gwyn shrugged her shoulders and stepped out. If you like, you may examine me and my companion. The fact that we were both led to Zerudia in the first place could hardly have been a coincidence. Perhaps, unbeknownst to us, we have become pawns of fate, shaping the course of events surrounding the Stone of Iris. That's what I want to find out, and that's why I've come to you, out of prison, to tell you everything and to ask for the wisdom of the Daughter of Death. Well, despite your leopard head, you're quite eloquent, Gwyn. Tanya, naked and unashamed, raised her hands and braided her silver hair as she spoke. You know, when I tried to save that woman in Alrotha's palace, oh. What do you mean? She's not here. Well, wasn't she eaten up in the maze by all the wish-fulfillers who live there? It seems you've hit the nail on the head. Ha, ha. I'm sure that the little girl who went crazy refusing Tanya's kiss of death, regained consciousness just before she was eaten alive by something unearthly and regretted that she should have chosen Tanya's kiss instead of this unpleasant death. Because my kiss is death and not death, life and not life. A fierce, devilish smile twisted Tanya's face, as if she were a demon with her mouth split open to the ears. A strange red tongue flickered out from between her faded lips. She lifted her hands and fastened her hair, and over her nakedness she drew a thin white toga which she had thrown under the platform. So you've come to be Tanya's guest. Of course I did, because I've always wanted to be a guest. So you should have followed me from the beginning and not listened to Alroth. I tell you, I don't really have the iris stone and I only know that it's a gem. Gwyn reminded him. For a moment, Tanya looked at Gwyn with a puzzled look. Then. Jewels. Yes, yes. Well, it's a gem, but it's a gem. He smiled ominously and leaned in close to Gwyn. Gwyn ducked. It was a perfectly instinctive action. As soon as Tanya's white body came close to him, he felt as if he had been flattened by a slug or a leech. Tanya is unconcerned, peering at Gwyn with a suspicious look in her eyes. You may hate me like that, but once you've had my embrace and my kiss, you'll never be able to do without it. 
I don't know how many times I've given Al Kathar a thousand times, how many times I've ignited his old and forgotten desires and made him open his mouth. But now I'm like this, devoured by rats. Anyway, you want to go to the Temple of Tanya, don't you? It's just up here. We just have to go up the stairs. He does not look at the mummy, but blows out the candle and stands before it with only one in his hand. Gwyn glanced at Marius and saw that the young man was completely dazed, with a dazed face, as if he had gone mad, and that he had not even heard Tanya's words. He cut the cord, put away his sword, took Marius by the arm and followed the daughter of death down the dark stairs. Thus they became guests in the Temple of Tanya. Chapter 4 The Wrath of the Dead Hey! Gwyn! It was not until they had settled into a large room that Gwyn and Marius were finally able to be alone together. All the time, a number of maidservants followed them, saying that they were under the orders of Tanya, and that they had to change their clothes and bathe, and they never seemed to go away. What do you think, this? Marius waved his hand vaguely in the air. The building to which they were invited, which they called the Temple of Tanya, was a large and spacious house, with a somewhat horrible atmosphere. How much space it occupied, how many columns stood in every room, and how strangely dark all the rooms were, as if they were tombs or coffin chambers. The building was made of white marble from roof to floor, from one side to the other. It is situated in the north of the town, near the mountains, with high ceilings and few lights, so that the interior is cold and dark. There was very little furniture in the room to which they were invited, except for two couches with white furs thrown over them in the corner. It was, after all, not the warmth of a man's home, but the breathlessness of a temple or a horrible sanctuary. The air was filled with the persistent smell of the nasal concoction. Gwyn was relieved. At last you are speaking to me, Marius. I was beginning to worry that you'd gone mad. Nonsense. Ophius went all the way to Hades to meet the king of the dead. A poet is never mad. Although, Marius lowered his voice. I knew that if I kept on thinking about everything I saw and thinking about how impossible it was, I might really go mad. For the time being, I've kept a lid on my mind, and I've adjusted myself so that I can see everything I see and think about everything else later. In other words, so far I've deliberately made myself into a wooden doll. Hmm, you're very clever. Though I suppose a warrior wouldn't need it anyway, Gwyn said. Apparently, now that we're alone, I've decided that it's time to move on and get my head back in the game. You're a strange one. Gwyn was a little impressed. Marius looked a little proud. So, this temple of Tanya. What do you think, Gwyn? What do you think? Anyway, I wouldn't want to stay longer than a few minutes at Tarzan's if I could help it. Have you seen Tanya's maidservants, Gwyn? They all have earthy faces and the eyes of the dead. Yes. Just like the mummies we saw in the underworld. Besides, they're all unusually afraid of Tanya. The way he cowers when he prostrates himself, the way he rushes to do his business when Tanya calls him. What in the world is the daughter of death? Gwyn. And that, that mummy who was brought back to life. I don't know what I'm supposed to know. Gwyn shrugs her shoulders. But it was not, as we thought at first, a mummy coming to life and walking around, but a dead man awakened by Tanya's magic, after all. Not only was he right to follow the mummy, but he was also very lucky. Did you hear what Tanya said to the mummy? al -Kaithar. Hmm, al was an old king of Zerudia a master mummy-maker, I think. Indeed, he wore an ornament of the highest order. Tanya had summoned him to ask him a question. The stone of Iris, he said. Marius whispered to him. Hmm. Do you know what that means, Marius? I mean. Gwyn whispered into his ear as he cradled Marius' head in the large room. Even Tanya doesn't know everything about the Iris stone, or maybe it's me she wants to ask, but in any case, the iris stone, this mysterious thing, is the key to everything. And if Tanya is the one who has the iris stone, then she is the one. And if Tanya doesn't know everything about the iris stone, then it's up to us to be clever about it. 
She mocked me, saying that Mina lived in a maze but was eaten by the wishful thinkers. Marius is now frowning. I don't know who the monster is, but I think it's the monster woman herself. When I saw that disgusting smile on her face, it made my hair stand on end. That might be about it. Gwyn, for now. But, at any rate, if that is the case, we can't show our hand too casually. Find out as much as you can about what Tanya knows and what she doesn't know, and what the iris stone is and what Tanya is planning to do with it. As he was about to say this, Gwyn suddenly fell silent and ran away from Marius. Marius looked about him. The next moment he was even more startled when, pushing aside the heavy curtain, two of Tanya's maids appeared without a sound. Lady Tanya has invited you both to dine with her, one of them said in a strange, languid way. They've got the eyes of a dead fish, Marius thought, trying to look as unimpressed as before. Maybe it's just his imagination, but even their breath is so raw, like that of a dead fish, that he wants to turn his head away. I'll accept your invitation, Gwyn replied gravely, looking at Marius as if to say, don't get wet. Tanya's maidservant dressed them and showed them around. Before they knew it, the sun had set. They had been invited to a great feast at the court of Alroth, then thrown into prison, from which they had escaped and wandered through a maze of darkness, while another day had passed. Everywhere in the building there was a pale, cold glow, instead of a light. It seemed to be the light of phosphorus, the same as that of the living mummy, Alcather. And in the midst of the temple, which rose like a white jellyfish in the light, fluttered the pale, mute maids of Tanya, with their white draperies, drifting about as if they had long since lost all hope and life itself. No one makes a sound, and the whole temple is shrouded in a strange silence. It makes one feel as if the temple itself were merely an above-ground part of that dreadful labyrinth. Tanya was waiting for them in a secluded room. She, too, had bathed and changed her clothes, her hair was tied up in a strange and complicated way, she wore a long white sash embroidered with a silver thread with runes on it, and a silver medallion hung around her neck. He wore a silver medallion around his neck, similar to the one worn by the mummy of Alcather. It was a room facing the garden. In the middle of the large room there was a large marble table on which various kinds of food were served. There was also a silver cup into which red-hot wine was poured. Around the table were fur-covered divans and waiting maidens, not unlike those in the underworld palace. Tanya raised herself languidly from the couch, welcomed them and offered them a silver cup. When they had taken it, she did not ask them to sit down at the table at once, but led them into the garden. This is the temple of the daughter of death in Zerudia. He grasped the silver cup in his long, thin fingers and said, From here, Zerudia is the most beautiful city of death. They slipped on their knitted sandals and walked out onto the balcony between the columns. The garden was lined with Japanese cedar trees, silhouetted against the dusk sky like sinister black sentinels of death, waiting for life. In silence, the three of us turned our eyes to the landscape that stretched out beyond the Japanese cedar and the shorter plants. It was a strange and horrible, but certainly a strange and fascinating, not to say beautiful, landscape. Against the background of the dark black sky, all that stretches out in all directions are stone grave markers. The Temple of Tanya stands in the midst of the Sea of Tombs, like a huge tomb. The tombs of Zerudia are marked with runes on slender or square stone markers, and here and there there are images of guardian gods and guardian animals. Here and there there are treetops of Japanese cedar, and far beyond them the city of Zludia and its black underworld palace can be seen. Behind it are the mountains that protect Zoldia from the rest of the world. There were candlelights flickering in the wind in the treetops of the cedar trees and in the candlesticks on the graves. But the windows of the houses, which at this hour would have been lighted at once, and would have revealed the town as if studded with beautiful jewels, remained quite dark, and it was a depressing and ghostly sight to see the mysterious silence of ruin, as if the town were already dying. It was a depressing, ghostly scene. In the night scene of the unlit city, only the main shrine of the underworld palace is lit up with lights in all the windows and torches shining all over the roofs. 
It must have been a pathetic and desolate scene, as lonely and haunting as the wind blowing through the skulls. In the hands of a master painter, it could have been a mural, an allegory of death itself. A cold wind blew on the nape of the neck of the two guests, who were standing in silence, lost in some kind of desolate and vague feeling. Tanya, who was standing with her arms crossed over her chest, watching them, said dreamily, I'm going to do it. What do you think? Don't think it's beautiful, I like the view. Cloudy mornings, rainy and stormy afternoons, cedar fluttering in the wind are all beautiful, but there's nothing like the twilight and the night in Zlordia. Look, Tanya raised her hand and pointed to a section of the cemetery. Suddenly a number of lights appeared, and, as if Tanya had silently commanded them, a number of somber cries of lamentation and monotonous incantations arose. A funeral. Gwyn mutters and gulps down his silver cup of wine. The dead who are buried at night are happy. Because it is said that the distance between Hades and this world is much closer at night than during the day. Tanya whispered. What could be more desirable than a glittering and sumptuous death, with a splendid funeral procession to mourn it, and the assurance of a grave after death, where people will always remember it? Life is incessant, life is dirty and noisy and ranting. But death is no more, no more, and it is serenity and rest itself. Then why do we want to live? Gwyn muttered to himself. Because they are stupid and blind. Even Alroth, the king of death, seems to have a fear of death. Alroth, etc. Tanya looks at him contemptuously. It doesn't control death, it doesn't even know it. Sleep is the little death. And death is the great sleep. There is only one god who rules in Zlordia, the god of death and sleep. Death is rest and tranquility itself, you said. Gwyn pointed out. Not necessarily, I suppose. Look at al Kaithr, the man you forced to come back from thousands of years of sleep. It was a necessary thing to do. Tanya smiled again, this time with a weird, archaic smile. And al Kaithr had every right to do that to me. Even after al Kaithr had mummified himself with his own hands, I held him again and again, and kissed his bony jaw, only I did. al Kaithr, the legendary king of the mummies, must have lived hundreds or thousands of years ago. Have you been alive that long, Tanya? Tanya's eyes flashed like a cat's in the dark. Marius could feel a great wave of fear and panic among the maids of honor behind the three men. But Tanya laughed and sipped from the silver cup, which was unusually red and thick. What does time mean to me? She said. There was a time when I was indeed in a mortal body and lived in fear of death and fear of old age. But since I was loved by al Kaith and made one with death by his hand, I have become death itself, the beloved daughter of death, the life of death, the one who lives by death. I am the one who truly knows death and controls it. So you are Tanya, al Kaithr's favorite princess, the Tanya who was mummified by al Kaithr's divine art, and who walked around unaware of her own death. So you are not alive. Although some people think so, Tanya said casually. So what on earth is life? Is it moving around? breathing, talking, eating, drinking. I can do all of those things and I do. And if you call me dead, what is the difference between me and the living? To be alive, Maria said before Gwyn could choose a word. To be alive is to have a body of flame, blood beating hot, warm to the touch, to love and to care for others, to soothe and to kindle the heart. You're a dead man after all, witch. So snakes are not alive, lizards. What about the fishes, the flowers? Tanya replied flatly. Your conception of life is so omissionary and so arbitrary. The eyes of thousands of years have clearly seen that there is life in the wind, in the stars, and in the night sky, and if that is the case, there is no way that the form of life is unique to man. If that is the case, shouldn't death itself be considered life in a different form? The corpse of a man does not remain intact. The flesh falls off, the hair falls out, the eyeball loosens and flows out, the bone is not resolved, it is finally turned into ashes and scattered in the air, and the air comes back to life again to be eaten. If it is life that is ever-changing, what is death but the more vivid half of life? 
And no one knows this better than I do. That's why I want to discover the secrets of life and death. Witchcraft is just a trick to get invisible power or to remove depression from the eyes. I want to know the true source of life and death. I want to know the true source of life and death, and there is no one more worthy of this than Tanya, daughter of death, who lives in death and dies in life. What is the stone of Iris? Gwyn cut in sharply. Marius was startled. There was no way Tanya was going to answer. But, as it turned out, she did. It's. Tanya looked at Gwyn with half-lidded eyes, as if in meditation, and answered without hesitation. It is the key that unlocks the secrets of life, Gwyn. It's the philosopher's stone that all men have sought since time immemorial, the vital door between life and death. Listen, Gwyn, I'm about to tell you a terrible secret. One, because I believed you when you said you didn't know about the Stone of Iris, and two, because it seems to me that you, without knowing it, have given me some startling clue about the Stone of Iris. Otherwise, there is no reason why the Iris staff should have shone so brightly. I. Suddenly, Tanya stopped speaking and turned her dark, glowing gaze towards the streets. Let's go in and talk, Gwyn. It seems the time has come for you to tell me everything and then join forces with me. You too, keep watch around the chamber. Let no foolish mortal stand in our way. The last words were addressed to the maids of the daughter of death. They disappeared like ghosts blown about by the wind. Tanya, who had returned to her room, paced about, not even taking her place at the table, but continued to speak. What is life, Gwyn, I ask you again? And death, no, death, I think I know a little about. And about the dead lives who live in death just as I do. People die, Gwyn. But the gods don't die, and neither do the dead. Why do people glorify the dead, fear them, and see them as dirty and sacred? Is it not because the dead and the gods are the same, in that they are no longer mortal? It all depends on which one you consider the beginning. The fetus is in darkness, silence and solitude. It doesn't eat, it doesn't drink, it doesn't move. He's as good as dead. Then he is born. A delusion of anguish and ambition and endless dissatisfaction, and death. They return to the darkness and silence of the past, but, Gwyn, if you think about it, isn't death the natural state of all living things? When an insect hatches from an egg, becomes a chrysalis, and then emerges as a butterfly, the body of the chrysalis dies. For us, life is not just a pupa. If death is, in fact, true birth and true life, then the foolish thing we now call life is nothing but a false, incomplete and crippled pupa. Tanya looked at Gwyn with a fascinated expression. If this be so, why should we not take the trouble to make this chrysalis a butterfly, and then let it nest directly from the darkness of the egg into a butterfly, death being inevitable because of life? Isn't that the same as being in the same league as the gods? Hey, Gwyn. Do you know this story? Iris is the goddess of the moon. The sister of the sun god Lua, the pale queen of the night, Janus, the lord of life and death, gave Lua the sun, day and life and Iris the night, moon and death from her own two sides. And Lua took for his wife Ilana, the wielder of war and will. One night, however, Lua pursued Iris, and as he was dying on the edge of the mountain as usual, Iris's horse threw him off, and Iris was caught in Lua's hands. They were mingled together, brother and sister, life and death, day and night. And Iris gave birth to her brother Lur's child. A creature of twilight, neither life nor death. And so, it's the stone of Iris, Gwyn. I don't know what it looks like, I don't know what it is. All I know is that it is a stone that is full of life, that is full of life. Organic inorganic matter, immortal life, and a lifeless stone, yet a living being. I want to get it. I have to have it. When Iris threw herself into the flames in horror at her own sinfulness, the crippled child she was carrying broke up into many pieces, scattered over the earth, and became what it was, and since it never moved or died, 
it must have been at the bottom of the mud or in the lake. And it has been living a life between life and death ever since. Alroth only wants to hear that it is a rare jewel. But I, I have inherited half of al Kathar's knowledge. If I take it and examine it then all the secrets of life and death will be revealed to me. Then I will have the greatest secret in the world and the whole world will be in my hands. Tanya's voice was like a flute, full of triumph. Gwyn looked at her slowly, with yellowish eyes. Strangely enough, there was a light in his eyes that was almost pitying. You have spent thousands of years of your life wishing that you were a witch. Gwyn said gravely, Now I believe it. You are alive. Because you say you're dead and yet you're obsessed with the idea of ruling this false world of yours. If you are dead, why do you not rest in death? al is dead. He wants nothing more than sleep and silence. Which, you say it's all a lie, but you dream of bringing life and the living under your spell. Wretched woman, wretched. You did not come to life in death. You are a dead man who died but could not die, a wandering, a cursed soul. You are life itself. It's no wonder people fear your kiss, that they can share your fate. For it is the same as yours, to be locked up in an eternal chrysalis that cannot die, that cannot be turned. A mortal condemnation is not a curse. Only then is there life, and you, who cannot die or live, are a miserable, abandoned monster, which, well, then. The immortal woman's face paled quickly at Gwyn's unexpected remark. Her pale eyes blazed with fury, and she pounded the table, shuffled her feet and glared at Gwyn's leopard head. Then what about you, leopard man? Do you, with your appearance and your heart and soul, still think you are the best of men? You know nothing of the parents who gave you birth, the country where you were brought up, or the friends you made. When you entered the gates of Zoldia, the wand of Iris shone forth to tell you where the stone of Iris was. Is that not a sign that you, none other than you, are the incarnation of that which Iris and Lure have brought forth, that which is not life, that which is immortal, that which is death itself? How, Gwyn? I'm sure you're not the only one who'd like to see me, but I'm sure you're not the only one who'd like to see me, and I'm sure you're not the only one who'd like to see me. Tanya glared triumphantly at Gwyn, whose voice seemed to ring out in the dark, spacious hall. Gwyn staggered. For some unknown reason, Tanya already knows the secret of Gwyn's birth and appearance, and that Gwyn is looking for it. Tanya's words seemed to pierce Gwyn's body like an invisible spear. It was as if Tanya's words had pierced Gwyn's body like an invisible spear, piercing through her innermost, unceasing fear. Who am I? Who am I? that I am really a human being, that I am a living being. Gwyn's eyes showed a rare agitation and dismay, and she seemed to be bound to Tanya. Marius was astonished and looked at him with wide eyes. This was the first time he had seen Gwyn like this. Gwyn's fear and agitation, which was impossible, spilled over to Marius like an infant seeing his mother upset, and frightened him too. How, how can I say anything? What about you? Are you not the monster born between the life that is not life and the death that is not death, the life that is not life and the death that is not death? It's, Gwyn said weakly. Tanya seemed to have changed completely. The dark wisdom of a demoness who had wandered through life with delusion for thousands of years gushed from her eyes like a white flame. What can I say to you? What proof do you have that you're not a monster? Then let me pierce your breast with my sword. If that doesn't kill you, that proves you're an undead, unhuman being, but if you insist on living, will you come with me to Hades? Can you stand in front of the doll and still keep your form as a living being? Tanya continued to press Gwyn, who seemed stunned. But, then, suddenly, there was a clatter of footsteps in the normally silent corridor. Tanya's brow furrowed. What's going on? As he turned away in anger, two of Tanya's maids came to him. I beg your pardon. For once he did not even notice Tanya's angry, reprimanding eyes as he came trotting in. In a muffled voice, she said, I say. Lord Tanya. The palace of the underworld. The underworld palace is on fire. What? 
Tanya's hand stopped in mid-air as she raised it to rebuke the maidservants and send them away. What do you mean? It's treason, sir. The executioner of Alroth has committed treason. Oh. It was Gwyn who shouted. He immediately pushed Tanya away and ran straight into the garden again. Tanya and Marius followed with agile movements. Then he bumps into Gwyn, who is standing there, also staring out at the night scene beyond the cluster of graves. The night sky. But it was no longer dark and gloomy. The color of a fire burning orange. It was a gigantic bonfire in the south, unknown to us at the time, with sparks of fire, and the black palace of the underworld loomed over the houses. Ah! Suddenly Tanya's scream rang out. Marius, half lost in thought, stares at the flames streaking the night sky, but then he comes to his senses. With the agility of a tiger, Gwyn came at Tanya and almost grabbed her by the neck. Say, witch! Gwyn barked. His face, lit by the flames, was truly that of a leopard. Tell me. There must be a way out of this temple that leads directly to the underworld palace. Ah. Tanya struggles feebly. She looks up at Gwyn in disbelief. What kind of a man are you, to lay a hand on me, on this daughter of death? Aren't you afraid of Tanya's kiss of death? In any case, I am a monster who may or may not be born of my mother and return to the earth. Gwyn grabbed Tanya's slender neck carelessly and shook it. Even now I can't decide what's alive and what's dead. Do you want to live the next thousands of years with a broken neck, even if you're immortal? If you don't want that, then take me to the underworld palace. I'll. 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 Loosen your hand. Tanya gasped and ran her cold, sticky, dead fingers over Gwyn's hand. But why did you go to the underworld palace? and I was just about to go and see what was going on anyway, but why did you, you wanted to get out of Zerudia so badly? I don't care how many thousands of times you, Alroth and the underworld return to the ashes, but in the underworld I have a friend. Gwyn is short. Come on, hurry up. All right, let me go. I'm not going to be frightened. It's not as if I feel any more affection for Alroth than I do for the maggots on a corpse. Anyway. Tanya stood up from Gwyn's hands and looked at her with a lecherous sideways glance as she made up her clothes. I see. I knew there was something wrong with you, but it must have been someone who helped you escape from prison. The Executioner's Rebellion, is that not your idea of a good time? I don't know. If I did, I'd just be happy to leave Zerudia behind. Tanya thought for a moment. So be it. Well, it doesn't matter. Let me show you around, Gwyn. I'll watch Alroth die and I'll give him a hand too. Let's just tie our hands, Gwyn, but I'll tell you something. Even if Alroth dies and the underworld falls to ashes, don't think it will destroy Zlordia. Zerudia is the city of dolls, the kingdom of death, which will never cease to exist until death, the dead, and all who care for them are gone. I don't care what you say. Hurry up. Tanya didn't want to go against anything anymore. Without a care in the world, he led Gwyn and Marius down the corridor, past the panic-stricken maids. He turns down the corridor several times as if he were sprinting, and when he reaches the entrance to a dark, screened-off room at the end of the corridor, he slips easily into it. He is immediately followed by Gwyn and Marius. Behind the curtain, there was darkness. And the ceiling is so high that the wind is blowing through it, and from the height of it, burning, terrible, huge eyes are looking down. Tanya touched a spot on the wall, and a pale light came on, illuminating the room. Immediately Marius shouted and almost fell down. The glittering eyes, ten tad in diameter, and the small mouth, twenty tad in diameter, were the neck-high colossus of the doll god, a beast, man, or demon, growing directly from the floor. Come on, Tanya said fearlessly, and immediately slipped into the mouth of the doll. The statue of the god's head, which they followed, straddling its huge, jagged teeth, seemed to have been gouged out of the ground, and as they entered there was a cool, sooty wind blowing. In the midst of this, Tanya went on and on, a pale fire of light in her hand. Gwyn and Marius follow behind. Be careful, Marius. Gwyn grabbed Marius by the arm and whispered in his ear. 
If this is the entrance to the underground passage then there is something fishy, some kind of deception. No matter how far we go, this road doesn't go down to the basement. It's okay. Marius whispered back briefly. Tanya was already running ahead of him. The maze of darkness, however, unlike the previous one, was neither silent nor silent. It was alive again, and as they ran on, a strange murmur and shuddering went on all around them in the darkness, and in the darkness many, many pairs of glowing, sinister red eyes gazed at them, and there was something crawling as if it wanted to crawl, and something winged, and something strange and scaly ran past them in a panic, as if there were a great commotion beneath the earth. Marius, more than once, saw out of the darkness, passing for a moment through the circle of Tanya's light, a creature that dwells in the darkness, with a form that should be impossible and a shape that is beyond language. Tanya was mumbling something incessantly as she ran. It seemed to be a spell to ward off evil. Even Tanya, the master of Zerudia, was not entirely safe in the maze. They turned to the right, they turned to the left, they went down the path, they went up the stairs. On one occasion they had to run at full speed through the earth, which under their tread suddenly turned to a squishy, cold, visceral feeling, and which threatened to seize the blasphemer as he ran through it. But Tanya knew at least every inch of this ineffable maze of darkness. Soon, Tanya stopped in one place and called out a strange rune to the wall, and at the sound of it the black wall slowly parted to the left and right. A bright light blinded their eyes. It was but the dim light of a candle in a candlestick, and yet, to eyes accustomed to darkness, it exploded with a dazzle as if they had suddenly stepped into the midst of the sun. They ran out, their eyes blazing. When their eyes finally adjusted, they found themselves in the basement of the underworld palace, in the middle of the level where the mummies were displayed. When he saw a figure before him, holding out his sword as if he had been waiting for them, Gwyn dreaded to look. But on closer inspection he saw that it was nothing more than a mummy, covered in cobwebs and with glazed eyes, standing guard over the entrance. In the vast, silent room, nearly thirty mummies of warriors surrounded the two nude swordsmen, who stood eternally still with their swords in hand on the central, crisscrossed floor, their mouths open and their hands raised in silent applause. The door on the other side of the hall is left open. Tanya is followed by Gwyn and Marius, who walk through it into the corridor without a care in the world for the mummies. There is no one to be seen, but all the doors were wide open. When Gwyn looked in, he saw that in the room where they had been playing Baca, one of the mummies had fallen on its side, with its hand outstretched to pick up a piece, and the crowd had fallen into a chessboard, as if it had been thrown down by a violent hand. The mummies in every room have been ransacked. The tranquility of the dead for thousands of years was disturbed. It seems that greedy hands ransacked the chambers, pulled down the cloths, poked at the mummies, smashed the chambers and pulled them up. From the mummies of the kings the crowns, the dusty scepter, the purple, heavy cloaks of golden thread, were stripped, and from the breasts of the cowering beauties even the rubies and emeralds, which had already lost their light, were plucked. In the corridors there were the marks of many a footfall, and at the entrance to one of the rooms a peasant had been cut down and left for dead. Tanya gave it an unfeeling look, but then suddenly listened. From somewhere she could hear a disturbance, the screams of people, the screams of women. Up. Shortly, Gwyn said. The three of them ran for the stairs and climbed up the gourd-covered ladder. I could hear the crackling fire, the cries of the women, the screams of their despair and the black smoke from the corner of my eye. Upstairs, there were mutilated corpses everywhere, and the rich carpet was a pool of blood. When we went to the hall where the feast had been held for Gwyn and the others, it was as if, in the middle of an endless feast, dozens of bloodthirsty beasts of prey had suddenly been flung into the midst of the intoxicated guests. The noblemen are dead and lishless, with their heads in a heap of food. The jars of wine have fallen down, and wine is dripping into the pool of blood. A woman's head falls headfirst into the frying furnace, cut in the middle, and the smell of burning flesh and blood mixes with the stench of burning flesh. The mummies stood mockingly on the top of the sudden pile of the dead, the beautiful woman smiling, the old king gravely beckoning. Here, too, there is no human figure. 
It's a garden, Gwyn said, running ahead of Tanya. He ran into a stone-built courtyard, not leading outside, but inside a building designed to entertain the nobles at a feast. Marius was choked by the acrid smoke pouring from somewhere. The courtyard was in a horrible state of confusion, with fire, screams and carnage. There they were, a merry band of murderers. They caught up with the fleeing men, cutting them down for fun, and gathered in the courtyard. They had thrown off their black cloaks. There was never any mistaking them for their pursuers. With swords in their hands, plucking jewels from corpses, laughing and stabbing fat noblemen to death like insects, while they drank from their jars, the thieves had the look of the world's toughest and most brutal men, their faces lit up by the flames of life, and they and their the noblemen of Zerudia who were at their mercy were as different from each other as a wild pack of hungry wolves from a wretched dying pig. They swung their swords as if they were playing an amusing game, slashing at each other's throats and smashing each other's heads and making them spray with blood. That's it. I'll make you fall asleep as you wish. You've come to Slordia to die. Then why do you run around so reluctantly? If you jumped on the sword yourself, you could easily find your way to the other side. Laughing, they cut down noblemen, women and peasants mercilessly snatching off their bosoms and the balls of their ears, and throwing them into great sacks, and going through the purses of the nobles. One of them saw Gwyn. Oh, no. Silenus has wandered out of Hades. He will rant and rave, drunk with wine, fire and slaughter, and rush at Gwyn. It's funny, I'm sick and tired of beating the living crap out of these carrion. Silenus, I'm your opponent. He dodged a shouting attacker and flung his sword away, when his bloodshot-eyed companion noticed him. Oh, me too. Immediately, three or four people surround Gwyn. But then. Oh, Gwyn. Through them came the figure of Istvan, wearing a torso and holding a bloody sword in his hand. Guys, come on. These are the iris stones I was telling you about. He waved his sword and approached Gwyn and tapped him on the shoulder. What do you say, Gwyn? We're only a couple of hundred men, and we'd kill the whole city of Zerudia if we let them. What kind of people are these, running around screaming, crushing fruit with stones? Isn't that what people become when they give up hope for life? Don't try anything, Ishtvin. Gwyn, calm down. I thought you were after the Stone of Iris. What the hell is this? What, you idiot, one of the mummies who was almost killed by our people told us that the iris stone is not a jewel, it's just a piece of junk. Istvan laughed and laughed. They say it's priceless for mummification, but as jewelry it's cheaper than Oberon's blood. And now that I've been falsely accused of letting you escape, there's a great deal of excitement. Well, I'm going to take everything I can find in all of Zerudia, just to make up for missing out on the iris stone. Two hundred men against the whole army of Zludia? Nonsense. That's a good laugh. When Alroth learned of the rebellion, he tried to get the executioners, who were not his friends, to intervene. But they tried to cut him down on the other side. Those of them who had any sense of life at all had long ago realized how much better it would be with us than with the living dead of Zlordia. Besides, Zerudia is so secure in the knowledge that no country will ever threaten it that it has no soldiers to protect it except the executioners. Just a bunch of noblemen waiting to die, a bunch of whores, a bunch of monks, a bunch of artisans working with dead people, you and I could have conquered this country with just you and me, Gwyn. If we don't stop this senseless killing, this country will. That's when Gwyn said, Gwyn. Marius' sharp voice interrupted him. What, Marius? Tanya's not here. Gwyn looked around quickly. Wherever she had run off to, the white-coated daughter of death was nowhere to be seen. Tanya is that nasty dead girl. I wish I could have cut her with my sword and seen if she really was as dead as they say in Zerudia. Istvan chuckled. Bad man. Murderer. Marius whispers to himself. He can't decide between his dislike of Tanya and his opposition to Istvan. Then he turns to her with a puzzled look. It wouldn't hurt my heart one bit to kill all these wicked city dwellers with my guardian moth. Istvan said lazily. They rant and rave about wanting to die, 
but when you put a sword to their head, they squeal and beg for their lives. It's like cutting up a rotten fish. What? What's the matter, Ailes? A brutal-looking bandit with a beard came running in, gave Gwyn a slightly creepy look, and immediately turned to Ishtvin. I found the King of Pigs, the leader, the right death palace, I caught up with him in front of the door, but the door was turned into a dungeon, so he ran away easily. We're all trying to open the door, but it won't open. All right, all right. I'm coming. How about this, Ailes? For fun, we kill the pig king and makes Lordia our city. Gwyn laughed out loud as she watched Ailes run off with a shout of joy. It was the young Ishvin who was the leader of this band of thieves. What do you say, Gwyn, don't you want to see me beat up Alroth? Ishvin says with a grin. I don't have anything against Alroth, but... Gwyn said, but then changed her mind and nodded. Marius poked Gwyn on the arm. Alroth has entered the right death palace. We must not miss this opportunity to discover the mysteries of the right death palace. He whispers and follows Ishvin into the building. From the direction of the left palace of the dead, flames and smoke with an inexplicable and unpleasant smell are coming down the stream, as if the wind has changed direction. Probably, mummies and mummification medicines have been burnt and burnt to produce this smell. I wonder what happened to Tanya, Marius whispered. Without turning his head. She's lived for thousands of years. In that time, she's been through dozens of rebellions and wars, so why should I worry about her? Gwyn says nothing. Marius shook his head. Marius shook his head, as if to say that he was not worried, but that he was preoccupied with other concerns, rather ominous ones. Here and there bandits are wreaking havoc, killing and rioting. The knights of Zlordia are stained with blood. In a city that had sold death, death, wilder and bloodier than ever, has been cut open, and the inhabitants flee helplessly as it rages, its sword swinging mercilessly over their heads. The sky of Zerudia was burning brightly. Dozens of thieves were huddled in front of a large, heavy obsidian door. He has been banging on the door with his sword and machete, and trying to pry it open, but it seems that the door will not budge even by force. Oh, my lord. The bearded men looked bloodily at Istvan of Valachia, who had come with Gwyn and Marius. That bastard meatbag king, he jumped in over there. In my opinion, this palace of the right dead must be the treasure house of Zerudia. This king must have squeezed every last penny out of those would-be deadbeats. What we've found so far is too little. I'm sure he has much, much more gold hidden somewhere. Their faces, they say, are glittering with greed and hope, and the light of the bonfire shows that not even the stagnant air of Zlydia, which sucks the life and vigor out of the hearts of men, could deprive them of their vigor. The door won't open. Somebody must have a key. It's not there, chief. I've tried everything, but it doesn't work, so now Lucas and Drosty are going for the hammer. Be careful. Their taboos suggest that there's a lot of secrets hidden in this palace of the right dead. Ishvin raised his eyebrows and stared at the great black door. It was silent, as if it knew nothing of the catastrophe that had befallen the palace of the underworld, or of the horrible secrets that lay hidden behind it. Ha, huh, what a nasty place. Ishvin murmured to himself, forcibly dispelling the pressure of the ominous silence. I've brought the hammer, chief. The thieves opened the way with a bang. They came carrying a huge hammer, which they placed in front of the door. As soon as the huge hammer began to bang on the right door with great force, a tremendous noise rang through the building. As soon as the hammer has struck the right door, a tremendous noise is heard all over the building, and when it has struck twice or thrice, fragments of stone are scattered about, and a white crack appears in the strong door. That's it. One more push. The thieves were no strangers to barbarism. They huddle in front of the door, shouting and shouting to their friends who are wielding hammers. Get him, Drosty. Get it over with, Lucas. That's good. Good job. Gone, 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 the sound of destruction rang out, breaking the silence of the underworld palace. The thieves were not so auspicious as to fear desecrating the city of death. It's a hell of a lot of people. Gwyn mutters in his mouth. 
Marius forgot his dislike of Ishtvin, and gazed with fascination at the unrelenting cruelty of these ruffians. The sight of these wild, merry, brutal outlaws struck him with an inexpressibly strong and vicious fascination, for he was sickened by the lethargy and decadence of Zerudia, even if only for a few days. Oh, it's gonna be bad, it's gonna be bad. Everybody stay back. At last, as the hammer struck again and again on the same spot, even the strongest guard was about to be broken down. Cracks now ran in all directions, and the hammer drove into the door as it struck. Then, with a final, ear-shattering roar, the door separating the right death palace from the main shrine slowly slid inwards. There was now a black hole in the ground. As the tremendous dust of stone dust gradually settled, the bandits, and Gwyn, smelled a nauseating stench, a mixture of pungent odor and myrrh. It's open. Ishvan rasps. Step into it. It's the treasure house of Zerudia. When he saw Gwyn grinning at him, his face twisted into a grin like that of a child who has been caught in mischief, and he stuck out his tongue at him, and then, sword in hand, he stepped into the doorway. Gwyn follows. He was about to hold Marius back when he tried to enter, but seeing the determination in Marius's face, he stood before him, keeping his eyes fixed on his right and left. At first, they saw a darkness, a deep, heavy darkness that made them think that they were twins with Zerudia. In the darkness, there are some faint, white masses floating in the air. What the? Oh my god! One of the thieves, who stretched out his hand in fear, shouted, Cheeks, mummies! No matter how far you go, you'll always find mummies, here. Hey, turn on the light, turn on the light. It's Ikari. Someone has gone out and brought a light. A light is held up, and the right side of the mysterious palace of the dead is illuminated by the light of blasphemy. No one was there. It seems that, at least near the entrance, those who were inside the right death palace heard the hammer being wielded and fled in panic. What? The bandit who was the first to step in shone his light here and there, and shouted in disappointment. You're no better than the left dead palace. It's not surprising that the man was like that. Indeed, the scene before us, illuminated by a number of lights, looks not dissimilar to the interior of the left palace of the dead, where I was once guided to see the mummies. It is divided into blocks here and there, into which are piled up huge water tanks, mysterious machines that seem to reach to the ceiling, and strange things that we do not know what they are used for. All around, as if they were the only legitimate inhabitants of Zerudia, Mummies stand in their thousands, watching over the blasphemers with downcast eyes. Find him, find him, the pig king is hiding in here somewhere. Grab him and make him tell us where the gold is. For a moment, the bandits were disheartened to learn that it was not the treasure house, but then Ishvan gave them a good scolding. Unintentionally, Gwyn laughed. How could this impudent red mercenary be known to be not only a mercenary but also capable of leading an army? Oh! Immediately, the bandits scattered in all directions. The same reckless and uncontrolled destruction which had been wrought in all other places, was here and there heard to begin again. Gwyn noticed that Ishtvan had arrived at his side. You're not going, chieftain, he said teasingly. But this time the leader of the bandits stood there with his brow furrowed and his arms crossed over his chest, looking strangely embarrassed. Thanks, I don't like it. And spit on him. What is it? This, the right dead palace. I don't like the smell of the air here, I don't like the fact that there's no one here to praise. Something clicks in my gut. You know my instincts are always right in these situations, Gwyn. Yeah. Because he's an Ishtvin. Ishvin turned his sword into a staff. I don't like it. There's something here. I'd rather just pull everyone out of this right dead palace and let that pig go. Why the war? If it's just one man, but when you're the leader, that's how you attract people. If you don't get more gold here, they'll be screaming. Besides, we're already hooked on this town's throat. If we don't smash their heads in. Hmm. Gwyn laughed and the mercenary looked at him disapprovingly. What? No, I'm beginning to think that it wasn't true that you were made to be a king, you seem to have a surprising talent for winning people over. Don't make fun of me. 
I'm just saying, over the three corners of the doll, here. Ishvan's voice was suddenly drowned out by a soul-cutting scream from the far right. What is it? What's the matter, Ailes? With a shout, and with the vigor of a lord, he regains his sword and rushes in the direction from which the shriek came. Gwyn and Marius follow. Gah! Help me! A monster, a monster! You're a monster! Ishvan turned on the light. And then. And the red mercenary, unperturbed, cried out and ran away. What, 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 is, this, thing? Gaha! Ishvan's screams were interspersed with the desperate cries of the thief ales. Help me, help me, help me. Janice, Janice. It's a monster. The monster has eaten ales. The ruffian bandits, crazed with fear and loathing, began to scramble and stumble to escape from the monster which had appeared from the darkness in the depths of the palace of the right dead. Halt, halt. Fight. You are Valachian bandits. Your women and children. It was only when he heard Ishvan ranting and raving that he finally came to his senses and gritted his teeth. It's only one or two of them. Bravely, they raised their swords in the air and thrust forward. The monster turns its throbbing eyes towards you, well, I'm not sure if I'd call them eyes. Against the backdrop of the darkness and the recesses of the palace of the right death, it is. I wish I could have been there. What a trick of God, or perhaps of the devil. It could have been as tall as three tads, and it stood tall above the heads of the bandits. Or it might have been a man too. But if it had been a human being, what a horrible, disgusting desecration, what a satanic caricature of the dignity of humanity. It was, if I may say so, an object made up of countless parts of the human body, which a gigantic infant had fashioned into a human figure for the fun of it. It has a head. It also has a body and two legs with which it staggers. But the rest. There was a pair of eyes at the knees, looking up at me with a throbbing look. There were no eyes or mouths on the head, where they should have been, but instead there was a pair of open eyes around the ears and shoulders. Numerous hands sprouted from the sides of the body and from one side, and several more small, childlike feet and hands hung at the base of the feet. On the side of the neck and under the armpit grew a child's head, crying out. Only the right half of the head is covered with a stream of long woman's hair, and a huge mouth gapes in the middle of the body. From its mouth hangs something like a red string. At the end of the string, dragged on the floor as if it were a watermelon, a strange and ugly thing. It was Alrotha's head. The corpse of the king of Zerudia, with his cloudy eyes wide open, had been devoured by this monster in the throat, and had become nothing but a disgusting, strange, bloody ball. In the monster's second pair of hands it held a severed arm. As the monster stepped forward slowly and awkwardly, the ball of Alrotha's head was dragged across the floor, leaving a slippery scrape on the floor, its skin and flesh bursting and abraded. One of the eyeballs was dragged by a nerve like a white thread and flowed out onto the floor. It was so grotesque, so horrible, so monstrous that no nightmare could have conceived of it, that it could never be seen again. Ishvin and his bandit stared at it speechlessly, unable to gather up the courage to wield their swords and cut at it. Someone began to laugh loudly in a deafening voice, and it went on for a long time. He had gone mad with fear. Coo! Ishvan gasped. Oh, shit! Oh, no, 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 no. Immediately he drew back one hand and threw his sword at the monster as if it were a spear. A skilled throwing sword goes flying with a roar, and with a sudden thrust it pierces the monster's breast, or perhaps the face of the woman who grew on it. The monster's feet stop, and the thieves regain their strength with a shout. But the next moment it was a scream. The monster, with his sword plastered to his chest, was speeding towards the bandits. When he saw that an angry hand had reached out and seized one of the thieves, his body was torn from side to side with a scream. The brave bandits, now terrified by the vengeance of their comrades, throw their swords at the monster, which has thrown out the blood-spattered wreckage and snatched another victim. But without dodging the waving sword, the monster slammed his body against the wall and did not stop even when his head was crushed to pieces. The sword is cutting the monster's body everywhere, but he does not seem to have felt any pain at all. 
Of course, not even a drop of blood flowed out. Way out. The sword won't work on this one. Immortal. An immortal monster. It's the doll devil. As soon as someone screamed, the bandits all fell apart. And look. Pull, pull. We're at a disadvantage here. Lure him to the light and take him. Ishvin immediately shouted and ran into the entrance of the right death palace. As the bandits fled in disarray, the monster pursued them with a clear and vicious intent to kill, and two more became its prey. The floor beneath his feet was now slick with blood, and here and there were pulled and torn corpses. Marius looked back at Gwyn, his teeth chattering. Gwyn, leaning against the wall to keep out of sight of the monster, was watching it with calm eyes. Gwyn. You're not going, are you, out? If we stay here, if it's still. Marius suddenly woke up from a dream. Gwyn, oh, Gwyn, what is that, what is that? Gwyn shook his head. His eyes glowed with a fierce light, so fierce that Marius had to step back. I can't know, only I can feel. That, that should not have happened. Gwyn barked. What should not be? Marius is panting. But what the hell, what the hell is that thing, that thing? I'll tell you what it is I want to do. Suddenly, out of the darkness, there came a voice with a strange laugh. Marius screams and jumps. Gwyn turns to protect him. In the darkness, where a moment before there had been no sign of anyone, there was a white, blurred figure. And as soon as it had become clear to them, it reached out to them like a mocking hand. And there stood Tanya. You said you'd tell me what it was, daughter of death. Marius shouted. He no longer had the heart to be horrified and amazed. What's that? What's that? What is it, that cursed thing? That, my boy, is the hope of Zlordia. The pride of Zlordia, the secret of Zlordia, and the glory of Zlordia. Tanya's voice was filled with painful taunts. It is the only life that Zerudia could have created, the only life that could have been created with all the power of Zerudia to set death free. What, what are you talking about? If you don't tell me what you mean, I won't understand. Marius. Gwyn tapped Marius on the shoulder. His eyes were still fixed on Tanya with a piercing, angry, terrible light, and he was looking through her at something beyond. I know everything now. Zerudia's ambitions, his evil plans. The left death palace is for mummies, for death. And the right death palace. Yes, Tanya said matter-of-factly. The palace of the righteous dead is a palace in which I wish I had been born. But it is not a life born of man's love for man and woman and his long and righteous desire for offspring. It is a scheme to create life out of nothing by human hands, an imaginative interference in a realm not open to human knowledge, a conspiracy as evil as any in the world. They say it's not open to human knowledge, but who are they, and what are the gods that are open to them? Tanya said with a strange and terrible laugh. It's not omniscient, it's just a little smarter than we are, and it can see further. What is the difference between God and me? You say God is immortal and we die. Then I'm immortal. Then I should be in the ranks of the gods, why shouldn't I rule over life as well as death? So Zerudia not only wanted to sell death, but to free life as well. Gwyn barked in a muffled voice. Tell me, woman. Is that why you were trying to get the Stone of Iris? Yes. In the Palace of the Right Death, scientists and mages from all over the world work day and night to create life from my hands. But while we can give the dead a second chance at life, and even wake the mummies, we can't create life out of nothing. By the way, Gwyn, Zerudia once had the Stone of Iris. It was thousands of years ago, when al Keter was still king of Zludia. It was al Kaether who first wished to possess the most fundamental secrets of life and death, and to be the closest thing on earth to the gods. One day, a mage from Kitai brought him a stone he called the Stone of Iris. It seemed to him to be nothing more than a trivial stone. Besides, even al Kaether was not sure what effect it would have on him. And what do you think he did? He dipped the woman he loved in the water, killed her, mummified her, and buried the iris stone in her heart instead of the heart he had taken out of her. Tanya's face contorted as if she were in some terrible pain. 
Her eyes were mad with a hatred that had burned unquenchable for thousands of years. Ha! Ah, what a terrible thing to have done. Thanks to you, she was cut off from life and from death, and became only the daughter of death who continues to exist. What was the woman's crime? Ha, ah, indeed, to have spent these long, long thousands of years tormenting that brute is to have relieved myself of the pain of not being able to die. It must have been a very long afterlife for al -Kiter. Aside from that, since I am free from death in this way, life should also be free. That's why the scientists of the Wright Death Palace have been working day and night. But the result was, that. That's what we managed to create by sifting through the corpses sent to Zerudia every day and connecting them with the ones that were still alive. But that's the limit. It's still alive thanks to the power of magic, but the body, the part of the body that uses corpses is dead, and the part that uses living bodies is somehow alive, but they don't mix with each other at all. No matter how much you pour into that body, there is no way that blood can flow through it or that it can start its own activity. However, that doesn't mean it's just a corpse. It has had the brains of many living people transplanted into it, so it can think, or rather, feel in a very primitive way, and it can be malicious, and it can move. But what has it done for me? It was an abject failure. In the end, all it amounted to was a living brain and heart in a bag made out of a corpse. I'm not looking for a patchwork, I'm looking for a life truly created from nothing with my own hands. That's why I gave up on that monster and seduced Alroth to take the Stone of Iris and control the secret of life. What you did was unforgivable. Gwyn groaned. You played with life, you mocked at death, you tried to mock the gods. For thousands of years you have had to live for the ambition of al -Kaithr, but still you are but a mortal woman, a woman who has failed to die and to live. You have no right to the throne of the gods. There is no such thing in the world, whether Agrippa or Gracious, as long as they are alive. The mysteries of life belong to the gods. That monster is nothing but your sin. Shut up, Tanya shouted. What do you know? How can you, a half-human, half-beast monster, know the mad agony of thousands of years, when you have lost sight of both life and death, when you have had to live in the prison of the body? But that did not give you the right to play with the life and death of another mortal, Gwyn said. His eyes suddenly lost their disturbing brownish glow and took on a strange, vague understanding, and his voice took on a heavy, almost solemn, crack. Your torment will be over. Give me your head, woman. I wonder if your body will remain intact and this sword cuts off its head and body, or if you can take the stone of Iris out of its body, so that you may have the piece of death that was to come to you thousands of years ago. That's what you want, isn't it? Tanya. I can end your suffering. Gwyn held his sword in his hand and approached with a broad step. And. Tanya's eyes widened, and a cry like a whistle came from her mouth. But then, as Tanya slowly slipped away from Gwyn's pursuers, she continued to fall back. Immediately, with a loud and crazy laugh, the white figure ran into the depths of the palace of the right dead. Doll! Marius snapped. After all, you're a dead man, and you're still afraid of dying. Even in that state, you still want to live like the living, Gwyn. Don't ask me. Gwyn's voice was full of anguish. All I know is that I believe I'm alive and I want to live and I don't want to die. But, he let out a bitter laugh. And if, indeed, in the face of death, I had to know that this body is as immortal as Tanya's, I might only be afraid of being made to see it clearly. Anyway, come on, Marius. If you leave her like that, everything will go back to the way it was. She'll never stop creating more of her kind with the Tanya kiss, or creating monsters like that one who should never have existed. I think he went this way, but I can't see him anymore. I wonder if there's a hidden door at the back. Marius was the first to stand up and followed Tanya in the direction she had disappeared. That's strange. It's a dead end, there's no indication that this wall is a dead end, but, wow. As he was about to say this, Marius's body suddenly looked as if it had been snatched away by some invisible hand. No. 
At his feet, the abyss suddenly opened its black mouth. Marius. When Gwyn's hand reached out and grabbed his arm, Marius' body fell headlong downwards, and with it, Gwyn's, who had nowhere to hold his hand. Way out. If Gwyn had not managed to regain her position in the fall, first coming down on both legs and then catching Marius' body as it swapped places in the air, they would both have been badly injured. Marius, are you all right? Ah, something about. Gwyn. Marius gasped, but there was no time to catch his breath. Oh, there's Tanya. As soon as Gwyn whispered in a hushed voice, he started to run, and I had to rush to follow him so as not to lose him. Three times it was a maze of darkness. But it seemed as if the whole maze shared the same heart and fate as the underworld palace itself, and even its death and agony, and changed its aspect three times, until now the whole maze seemed to be one huge dying creature, writhing and writhing. At every turn, a wave of anxiety and trepidation swept over them as they ran through the maze, trying to break through and holding themselves together with trepidation. A little way ahead of them, in that strange maze of life, runs Tanya, pale and shadowy. The daughter of death, whose body had been stripped of all the toga that had been in her way, was naked and glistening white. Her silver hair waved like a strange white seaweed, and followed her in a tangle. Tanya turned to see Gwyn and Marius following her, and then, as if in mockery, she stopped, raised her arms, turned her face and brushed her hair away. In the meantime, Gwyn gradually closed the distance between them. As he stretched out his arms to catch her, Tanya suddenly disappeared. Just when you think you've got it all figured out, it's there, in the maze of the distance, beckoning to you and laughing at you in a crazy way. You monster. You're trying to cover me up. Gwyn bellowed. Tanya not only stands still, but holds out her hands and laughs, even making a gesture of lewd invitation. Again Gwyn approaches, almost within reach of the sword. But again, just as she is about to draw her sword, the witch is far away, baring her teeth and laughing. Damn. Gwyn gritted his teeth. But. Careful. Gwyn. It could be a trap. There's something, wrong with you. Marius, who had at last caught up with Gwyn, cried out in a gasping voice. At that moment, the figure of the witch, which had always glowed pale in the distance, vanished and the whole place was covered with true darkness. You're blinding me. That's not fair. Gwyn roars and, gingerly, lights the candle in her hiding place. Gwyn and Marius look at each other in shock as the light from the candle shines all around them. Where am I? Gwyn says in a gasp. Marius chokes up. Lost, the maze is. Oh, my god. You're a witch. Ho 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 ho. Suddenly a high-pitched, maniacal laugh rang out. Do you realize, leopard man? Anyone who thinks he can lay a hand on this dead girl, a beast, will be lost in the maze of darkness forever, running left and right, dodging, starving, exhausted, and still in a frenzy from which he will never emerge. You think you know everything, but you, leopard, will never get out of this maze made by the spirits of the earth. You may be immortal, but the poet with the woman's lashes you love so much is not. You may be immortal, but the poet with the eyelashes like the woman you love is not. You may be mad with hunger and tear her corpse to pieces, but still you cannot get out, and you may live forever like Tanya in the darkness. That's what the daughter of death will do to you. Ho ho ho. In two thousand years I'll come back and look through this maze to see if you really are an immortal with the life of Iris. Until then, all the doors in this maze are closed. There. If you run to the nearest door now, you'll be there in time. But do you know how to get to the door? Look, is it to the right or to the left? Or left? Ho ho ho. Poor leopard-headed Gwyn. Ho ho ho. And again, the high-pitched, deafening laughter echoed through the labyrinth, creating a din and a clamor. You. Gwyn gnashes his teeth. You monster. You coward. Show yourself, where are you, Tanya? Come out. Do you want to see me? Here, I'm here. 
At the same time, a pale ring of fire appeared on the wall just in front of Gwyn, and Tanya was standing there. Gwyn stretched out his hand to grasp it. At once her fingers struck a solid stone wall. As if the wall were a squishy jelly through which she could see through, Tanya reached out her hand provocatively, looking terrifyingly real in the wall, but as soon as Gwyn and the others touched it, it revealed itself to be no more than a solid stone wall, keeping Tanya inside it. You're blinding me. Tanya, come out. No. Tanya is glamorous. I'm Tanya the Immortal. I'm not in your hands. I'm going to live forever. Young, beautiful and strong. What is the use of living in a body without warm blood, without joy, without love, without rest? Marius shouted. Do you still want to live? Yes. But I still want to live. Thousands of years have passed, but thousands more, tens of thousands more, in mummies or not, I want to stay that way. That's why I want the secret of life. I want to be a queen and reign over this world. Stupid. Marius tried to shout back. His eyes suddenly widened in astonishment. His mouth opened wide and he tried to shout something. Looking at her face, Tanya sensed that something was wrong. She tried to turn around in panic. Suddenly some fingers grabbed her hair and pulled her by the hair. It's, who? Tanya twisted her head in a sneer, turned and saw something grab her silver hair. And then a horrible scream burst from her mouth. Gaha. There, on the other side of the wall that separated her from Gwyn and the others, standing with their hands outstretched in the same pale phosphorescent light. The mummy of al -Kaether. It's ghastly, sluggish eye sockets stare down at Tanya, its twin arms, crawling with maggots inside them, stretch out slowly and tightly around the bloodless but plump torso and bare breasts of the daughter of death. His bony upper jaw clacked as he sought the horrible, mer-scented kiss of the bright red lips of his own favorite princess of thousands of years ago. No. Oh no. From Tanya's lips came such an outpouring of soul-cutting screams that Marius thought he would never hear them again, and the maze was horrified. What are you doing, you bloody old mummy? Take your hands off me. Don't you dare. From Tanya's mouth came a torrent of foul and obscene curses and epithets that made one want to cover one's ears. As she did so, Tanya writhed furiously, pale as a leopard, and tried to wrench the mummy's hand away. But the arm of the old king holds the body of the immortal sorceress like a vice, and this strange and vicious inhabitant of Hades, whose ribcage is covered with rats, is slowly lifting up the body of Tanya. Aeowa. At last a muffled cry broke out from Tanya's throat. Oh! His eyes are white with fear, his face is contorted with anguish, and little by little his body is losing its power of resistance. The mummy of al held her body tightly in his arms and tucked her under his arm. The two voiceless warriors could see the maggots spilling from the mummy's body. The mummy, holding on with iron strength to the dead girl, who was no longer able to utter even a muffled sound, began to walk forward little by little with that strange, loping gait. Marius lets out an inarticulate cry. Behold! With every step the mummy took, her feet sank deeper and deeper into the ground, and gradually her body sank lower and lower into the depths of the earth. Voicelessly, Marius clung to Gwyn, gazing into the eyes frozen in Tanya's horrible, eternal agony. The mummy is now almost chest deep in the ground with Tanya's lower body. His right hand came up lazily. The mummy pointed to the right, and turned his blind eyes upon them, and took another step or two. Tanya's wide-open mouth fell into the hands of some unseen wish, and then the white frozen eyes disappeared from their sight forever. The mummy, al is no longer visible except from the chest up. The mummy of al destroyed to the last drop, a nest of maggots and rats, but still retaining the dignity of a great king and a wizard, kept on plodding along, its face disappearing, its head engulfed. The mummy of al returned to Hades, the eternal darkness of the god Dole, with Tanya in her arms. The pale stone wall no longer bore any traces of the apparition. Gwyn and Marius stood staring at the wall, stunned and deflated. The candle was about to burn out with a sizzling sound. Gwyn was the first to come to his senses. 
To the right, Marius. Alcathr has shown us the way out of the maze. He cried out and, without turning round, ran into the right way and went on. Marius follows in a daze. Soon the road began to climb, and at last, at the end of the snow, there was a door, to his delight. Gwyn hit the door with her body and fell out with it. A dazzling fire soon surrounded him. Gu, Gwyn. Where have you been? I'm having a hard time with this monster. Suddenly Ishvan's cowering voice struck Gwyn's ear. Quickly regaining his bearings, he saw the synthetic human monster, surrounded by dozens of bandits, flailing around a corpse, and a roaring fire. This was the courtyard of the underworld palace, which was about to be burned to the ground. There is a heap of dead bodies all around. Ishvan stands back, breathing hard on his shoulders. His handsome black face and his full armor are stained with blood. Oh, no matter how hard I cut and poke him, he won't die. Oh, my God, Gwyn. Ishvan's face was distorted, he was a child of his age, on the verge of panic, and he acted unreliable. The bandits were already in a state of high spirits. The messenger who purifies all and transports the dead to Hades, I wish I could be there. As soon as Gwyn had barked, he suddenly overtook Ishvin and the bandits and rushed at the monster. With his head down and all his weight on the ground, he strikes with the force of a great bull, and the body of the huge monster is blown backwards. There, in the midst of the burning, eternal fire of the underworld palace. For a moment the monster stood in the fire with both feet propped up and looked as if it was going to come flying at us again. Gwyn drew back, but then the fire engulfed the monster's body. Only once did a strange sound, neither a voice nor a moan, emanate from the huge mouth on the monster's body. In the next moment, in the midst of the raging fire, the huge, hideous black silhouette of the Buddha became a dancing, joyous figure. At last, with a glorious spray of gold and crimson fire high in the night sky, the unhappy and horrible figure fell into the flames. The fires of destruction that raged through the night sky now exposed the left palace of the dead and the right palace of the dead to the light of midday, and the mummies that fled through them and the mummies that did not move turned one after another into huge torches that set the fires ablaze in a frenzied, screaming feast. The screams, the crackling fires, the screams, the roar of falling buildings. As Gwyn turned away from the great bonfire that scorched the sky and looked at the sky on the other side, he saw another hand of fire, smaller but more triumphant, rising from the direction of the Temple of Tanya, just as he had turned away from the funeral fire of that unfortunate and pitiful synthetic man who had been forced into being without his will. From the direction of the Temple of Tanya. Epilogue. Are you sure you don't want to stay in Zerudia, Gwyn? Ishtvan said. His face was flushed and glowing, as if he had not yet awakened from the intoxication of the wild feast of the past few days. No. I'm going north. Gwyn's reply was short and decisive. Why not? It's fun. Now that all those evil monsters are dead, we're going to make this place our home, a land of thieves and assassins. We've got a great location, we've got the fires of purification going, it's going to be great. King Ishtvan of Slordia. Don't you think it's nice? Well, okay, if you want to go. Do what you want. I'm sure we'll meet again somewhere. Gwyn said simply. Ishvin was like a sulking child. It's funny. I'm going to use this place as a base for my rampage. No more petty mercenary life. They're all so pleasant, and even the leopard head doesn't bother anyone here. Come on, let's go, Gwyn. If the sun gets too high, we won't make it over the mountain in time. Marius pulls Gwyn by the arm, lest he should be persuaded. Ishvin turns away in a huff, and Gwyn and Marius mount their horses. Goodbye, Selinos. That was a hell of a fight. I wouldn't want to make an enemy of you. If you're in trouble, the bandits of Zerudia are on your side. The thieves call out to him. When Marius finally left the ruins, where black smoke still rose from everywhere and the pile of dead bodies had not yet been cleared, he let out a deep breath, as if he were finally at peace. Oh dear. I finally realized that being your biographer is a terrible thing. I'll be dead before I finished your biography. 
Even if I had nine lives, it wouldn't be enough. Oh, he is so happy to finally be able to talk to you after so long that he starts to talk as if he is on fire. Gwyn listened to this and was secretly absorbed in his own private thoughts. In his heart was a heavy lump, a question that would haunt him for the rest of his life. Am I but a creature of iris, a kind of pseudo-life? I have a body that bleeds when cut, a life that starves when I don't eat, a life that kills when I don't drink. I know what it is to love and to hate. I am alive. I've never doubted that, even though I'm a freak, even though I don't know where I came from. But, am I immortal or not? Unanswerable doubts gnaw at his strong chest like rats at a mummy's breast, gnawing at it from the inside out. At that moment, however, they were stopped by the sound of the hoofs of a horseman coming up behind them. What is it, Ishvin? What's the matter? Gwyn says with a disgusted look on her face. Ishvin had already prepared for his journey. Wasn't he the king of Zerudia? When I think about it, Ishvin is too good to be the king of such a small town. He said briskly. And I realize that I haven't met the Lady of Light yet. My throne should be waiting for her. Come on, let's go, buddy. Oh, no. Ignored, Marius leaped indignantly into the saddle box. Ishvin the Valachian and Marius the poet threaten each other with flickers of fire. Gwyn bursts into laughter. Oh, my god. You want me to travel with the god of trouble, Tia. Well, then, let's go.